Good morning, and welcome to Midtown Center. I'm David Benson, President and Interim CEO of Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae designed this building to foster innovation and collaboration. They are built into almost every aspect of the architecture and design. Now that's one reason Chris Brummer and I thought this would be a great place to host day two of DC FinTech Week. The other reason is that Fannie Mae believes innovation and technology are crucial for tackling America's most important housing challenges. In today's housing economy, affordable housing options are hard to find. Affordable apartments and homes are in short supply. And our country has a lot more work to do in knocking down barriers to home ownership faced by black households and other underserved populations. We believe innovation and technology are essential to progress on all of these challenges. And that's why Fannie Mae is continuously exploring how innovation and technology can make sustainable financing more accessible, how they can make housing more fair and more equitable, and how they can make housing finance safer, sounder, and stronger. I'm proud that a number of Fannie Mae leaders are participating in today's panels to share their insights, but I'm even more proud that we're able to be a convening place for this amazing collection of world experts. For myself, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but on behalf of Fannie Mae, let me share my best wishes for a successful day. I want to thank our co-hosts, Georgetown's Institute of International Economic Law, and the Institute for Financial Markets. I also want to thank everyone else who is participating or attending, including representatives from the U.S. Treasury, FHFA, the FBI, the Federal Reserve, the SEC, international experts from the IMF, venture capitalists, diplomats, technologists, academics, policymakers, and finance leaders. Your work to democratize the dialogue about fintech and finance is vital. Finally, let me thank Chris Brummer and the Georgetown University Law Center. As we all know, Chris is the creator of this event. Chris, thank you for everything. Once again, have a great event. Welcome the host of DC FinTech Week 2022, Chris Brummer. Every, every year we try to change up DC FinTech Week. We want to make it special, different venues, different audiences over the course of the day. Uh, we're going to have an amazing cast of international leaders coming from the European Union, coming from the Fed, coming from the FHFA, and there will be uh, a very delightful mix of people from technologists to venture capitalists to crypto engineers to housing specialists and civil rights activists. And we're gonna mix them all together and uh, hopefully nothing will blow up. Uh, you know, but, but seriously, thank you so much for, for, for coming. Um, and I, I just wanted to spend the first couple of minutes giving a, a shout out to a couple of people who made this um, possible. Um, as people saw from uh, yesterday and from the happy hour and all the other happy hours that I probably don't even know about that have been happening and will be happening over the next couple of days in the city, uh, it really does take a village to have this kind of conversation. Um, Camilla Sullivan here has, has just been um, uh, instrumental to, to getting this work done um, over at the Georgetown Institute of uh, Financial Markets, I'm oh, sorry, it's, it's, it's been two days, so it's, you know, I have to get my coffee finished. Uh, but Zainab Ahmed uh, from my team over at IIL has been instrumental working weekends, nights. Literally last night I was emailing Camilla, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning. You have uh, Mariana Mariano, uh, another one of our critical people 
uh, from Georgetown's uh, end who's been working tirelessly. Uh, Kristen has been working, just doing amazing work, putting up with very annoying questions and probably answering too many of my questions more than once. Um, I did want to have a special thanks to Fannie Mae for really rolling out the red carpet. Uh, every year, we have worked over at Georgetown with major um, institutional players in the city, uh, from the uh, IMF uh, to the Bank for International Settlements over in uh, Switzerland. Uh, we have teamed up with programming with the Treasury Department, with the CFTC, um, really uh, many agencies uh, and institutions. And it's all been for a very simple goal. How can we get different kinds of people from different ways of life to talk about and to democratize information about what's happening in our financial system um, and to make it accessible uh, to everyone? And uh, it's this year in particular, we've, we've uh, been very gratified by the reception, uh, the enormous interest by the press. Um, and for those of you in TV land uh, who may be watching, thank you very much. Uh, and, and we think that's at a critical, pivotal moment, uh, both for the housing industry and for the economy writ, writ large. There are lots of challenges, challenges that you'll hear a lot about, uh, from inflation uh, to uh, home prices to uh, uh, falling asset prices in stock and other markets. And the question is, where does technology play a role, either in terms of increasing access to housing? Where does it play a role in introducing instability? Where does technology, uh, where can technology play a helpful role in helping people uh, climb the economic ladder? Those are the kinds of questions that we ask every year um, over at DC FinTech Week. Uh, and every year we get different answers, in part reflecting different points of the economic cycle. Um, just as a quick preview for uh, how the day will unfold, uh, we're gonna start off with a couple of experts dealing with really cutting edge issues that will increasingly have um, an impact on housing markets and on general questions of access to capital and access to housing. Uh, we'll start off with a general conversation on the economy, certain kinds of um, interdisciplinary uh, uh, dialogues dealing with what exactly does fintech and housing, what, what do they have in common and what does the economy mean for both of those sectors? Are there differences? Are there things that they share in common? We'll then be moving on to cutting edge applications, things like decent, decentralized identity. In other words, how can we figure out new kinds of tools that allow people to open up credit boxes, to be able to uh, integrate themselves into the ec uh, economic system using technologies that are um, uh, uh, quickly uh, going from being experimental into being uh, mainstream. We'll have a slew of policymakers who are also uh, going to be speaking with you today. Uh, we will have uh, Director Sandra Thomas, Thompson, who's going to be talking about uh, housing and technology. Uh, we're going to be talking with uh, uh, Ranking Member Patrick McHenry, who has a deep and long-standing interest in finance and housing. Uh, we will be talking to a guy named Michael Barr, who just became the Vice Chair of the Fed and um, the most important banking regulator uh, in the United States and, and, and arguably uh, the most important banking regulator in the world. Um, and all along, we'll be trying to keep in touch with innovators. Uh, we're very delighted uh, that Patrick Collison uh, will be uh, coming as, our, uh, as the co-founder of Stripe, and uh, fellow Irish citizen, Mayreed McGuinness, who just happens to be in charge of all financial <laughs> regulation in the European Union. So we're gonna have some, some VIPs coming through uh, who are gonna be generating both news, interest, sharing their thoughts, and uh, I wish you all uh, just the best of day two of FinTech Week, where you get to have an up-close personal experience with really world leaders. Thanks so much for joining us. I guess now we're gonna call our next panel, our very first superstar uh, panel to the stage, uh, with Gary Duvall. Gary can come on up and introduce some of his other fellow panelists, who's now a partner at Kenton Mooton and also Thank you, sir.
All right, waiting for my fellow panelists to come. This is quite a beauty pageant. I'm clearly not the most beautiful, <laughs> but it's OK. Um, so I'm Gary DeWall. Uh, I'm proud to be a trustee of IFM, which is one of the uh, sponsors of this event. Uh, again, like Chris, I'd like to thank uh, Fannie Mae, um, uh, Georgetown Law School, obviously. The internet, the, it's called the, Inter uh, the Institute of International uh, Economics. Um, and, um, and my panelists. Uh, so immediately I've got um, Gordon Liao, uh, who's the lead emerging fintech, I'm sorry, he's the chief inaugural economist of Circle. Uh, next to Gordon is, is, is um, Douglas Duncan, chief economist, senior vice president of Fannie Mae. Uh, and then last but not least, all the way down there is Cindy Lee, uh, chief inaugural economist, I'm sorry, she's the lead emerging fintech Fed Reserve, San Francisco, uh, uh, particularly Gordon and Cindy both came from San Francisco, so that's great. So we're going to hop right into this event. Um, uh, and by the way, also thank IFM for this is their fifth year of co-sponsoring this event, so very excited about that. Um, we're going to jump right into this with some macro issues. Um, let's, start on the, let's, look, let's start looking at uh, crypto as, as a macro subject. Uh, the recent FSOC report basically criticized uh, crypto, saying it's only out there for speculative purposes. Gordon, I know you're doing a new paper. You're thinking about this. What's your view of that topic? I think that is quite a misleading view of even crypto today. Um, if you think about payment stablecoin, for instance, if, which is what Circle issues uh, USDC, the primary use case is for payment transactions. And if you look at you know, the challenges that we face today uh, in, in the economy for instant payment, there is a immense need for faster, better, more programmable payment. Uh, the view that you know, even for payment stable coins are being used for speculative activities, while that may be true, but let's think about the benchmark here. Any traditional payment system, over the vast majority of payment transactions occurring are for financial purposes. For Fedwire, which process over one quadrillion dollars a year in volume, only 2% of it is actually GDP. For FX market, $6 trillion a day of transaction volume, roughly only 2% of that is transactions supporting trades in goods and services. So the right benchmark is not 100% uh, of payment activities going through crypto having to be non-speculative. It's not even 50%. Rather reaching something like 2% of activities being non-speculative, which I think we are getting there. We're not there yet. But if you look at the amount of transactions are used for cross-border purposes, uh, and the amount of transactions are being used for uh, Web3 payments and uh, emerging commerce on the Web3 uh, platforms, I think we're getting there really, really quickly. And let's remember the the, the opportunities here for really making an impact in financial inclusion. Um, for instance, FX remittance costs on average is around 6% according to the World Bank globally. In some corridors, it's a high, as high as in the teens percentage wise. Now, if we can shave out even just a couple of percentage points from um, these remittance costs, that could do quite a bit of good to those hundreds of millions of migrant workers, not only in the US, but globally. Now, I think also what the FSOC report misses is the incredible amount of opportunity to actually reduce risk in the financial system by unbundling payments from banking and by making credit intermediation services more market-based. Today, we're talking about housing. And as you know, you know, mortgage is such a big, important part of supporting the housing market, uh, but mortgages We've seen the trend, and maybe uh, Doug could speak to more to this, has already been more uh, commoditized, being more market-based driven, rather than strictly being um, bank-based. I think the usage of distributed ledgers, the usage of uh, tokenized cash, payment stable coins, the usage of blockchain, uh, would only fasten that process of separating out payments from banking, and even within banking, separating you now the credit component from the deposit rate service component. Let's give Cindy a few seconds to give her views on the subject. Sure. So uh, 
Uh, Gordon, I, um, you made the point of uh, you know, uh, stable coins and the DLT technologies potential in terms of uh, reducing cost and faster you know, settlement time, which I think is uh, probably the driver that has underlined a lot of payment sector innovation, including stable coins. Uh, but looking at this event, uh, you know, we are he heading this event in September of 2022, uh, and this has been a pretty testing year, uh, arguably, for many of the players in the fintech and crypto industry. So we uh, still need to look at, you know, financial stability issues and looking at, you know, the recent market turbulence and look at what those uh, new data points are uh, uh, given. Uh, uh, Obviously, there are a lot of uh, moving pieces, and there are a lot of uh, new data points for us to look at. When we look at the recent, for example, we talk about in, uh, when we pre uh, prepare for this call about the lunar terror collapse, right? So what is the right takeaway from this, and how do we look at vulnerability? Uh, some of these uh, failure of stablecoin projects, uh, they happen in the past. It's just the recent two years or three years of a rising interest and activities that really recenter, you know, attention of regulators and media into their behavior. So we now learn a little bit more about how stable coins can behave. I think that new understanding, new data points, you know, new renewed concerns on uh, potential vulnerability, that's underlining a lot of uh, ongoing policy debate and actually in the financial industry as well. Cynthia, well, I've got you here and we're talking about macro topics. I'm curious whether you have looked at correlations between cryptos generally and how they're behaving in this inflationary environment and this potential recessionary environment. I have indeed. And actually, uh, there have been a growing body of research by IMF economists and other economists that has well established uh, that the correlation between bitcoins and digital assets and uh, you know major stock market indices has been on the rise. So uh, going back to 2017, if you are looking at the correlation between Bitcoin price and uh, S&P 500, for example, that was pretty close to zero. Uh, today, it has uh, uh, you know really increased to the level of 0 0.5, 0 0.6 territory. So which put it very close with the traditional financial assets. So looking back at the previous recessions and period of financial distress, that's exactly how different asset classes, including commodities and bonds, have uh, behaved. So uh, it looks like digital assets, just based upon uh, you know, recent data, start to behave more like traditional risky assets in the financial markets. Yeah. All right. And, and, and Doug, I'm curious. Let's, let's, let's go down a little bit to micro. We might go back up to macro again. But let's talk about DLT and, and uh, crypto in the housing industry. What's, what's the impact? Well, and the potential impact, might I add. <laughs> well, um, the, um, I think that the essential question for households is, uh, starts with uh, industry discussion about title insurance. Uh, that's typically the place that most people go. They say there's a lot to be saved because of the fees in the title insurance space. Uh, that may be true over time, but uh, there's like three things that have to happen. One is you have to be able to perfect ownership, right? And so um, it, this is Doug's personal view. This is not Fannie Mae's view. Uh, I think you'd have to, in the title insurance space, you'd have to have the Supreme Court say, as of date certain, all prior claims are extinguished. Now you have perfected ownership of that of that title in that time period. Then you have to be able to track encumbrances. So for example, if you have a title, somebody can place a lien on that. You would have to track the placement of the lien and the extinguishment of that lien. Um, and then you'd have to monitor any complexities that go along with that. Now, that's, I've just picked on the title insurance space because that's typically the first place people go when they, when they um, uh, talk about that. Well, yeah, I should just stop right there. Yeah. Why, though, because you're introducing DLT to keep track of these things, do you have to wipe out the past? I mean, isn't, isn't the past a problem every time you grant new insurance or, or have a, a title transfer? Uh, potentially, uh, that, that's true. It would certainly make it easier, though, if you knew with certainty, you would reduce the, the, the risk related to that asset if you knew with certainty that you could track its entire uh, time. Sure, but, but you could also say, you know, as of this date, we know it's 100% correct, but you know, it's maybe built on a foundation that's weak. Right, yeah. I think it's about related, um, reducing the risk right. related, to, mm -hmm. related to that asset. Yeah. 
um, uh, I think for households in the mortgage space, I, let me give you a personal example. Uh, I, uh, it's a very complex process. Uh, uh, I closed a loan about a year ago, and at the closing table, there was an $8,400 error in the arithmetic uh, related to that. So, in your favor or against you? Against my <laughs> oh, okay. favor, yeah. And so we got that corrected. There was a, some tense moments at the closing table while that was, uh, while that was uh, corrected. For, uh, particularly for unbanked people or low-income people uh, who don't execute on those transactions frequently. I'm in the business, so I knew how to walk through that stack of paperwork, which is still this big. Uh, in order to get to that, I, I think that represents an opportunity for technology in the housing space uh, to, to reduce that packet of things that you have to read and understand. Um, it, it, thinking about the unbanked, uh, I think the, the most important thing for them is whatever currency uh, is used, whether there's a central digital currency, uh, central bank digital currency or whatever, it has to be legal tender. Because they typically, those unbanked folks and lower income folks typically have fewer assets, fewer savings, so the certainty around that is a real, uh, a real important issue. Second, low transaction costs. Gordon, Gordon talked about the transaction costs uh, of remittances. That seems to be a place that could be attacked successfully by uh, technology uh, and digitization. Um, Liquidity. Well, hold on a second. Let's just stop there. In our in our prep session, Gordon, you were mentioning that in fact transaction fees, uh, the argument around transaction fees may be somewhat misleading. That even today, the the, pay, the 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 check payment agencies are actually quite popular, despite the fact that people have viable alternatives. Maybe just that's a right. Second on that. So, even today, many users, I think seventy five percent of users of payday lenders, uh, actually do have bank accounts. The problem is. They prefer to use payday lending for the faster transaction, for the more immediacy. Mm -hmm. So part of what you know, Circle is trying to solve is the immediate payment, instantaneous payment. The other part is about programmability, which is you know, how can you provide services such as as, as simple as an escrow service, the simplest smart contract you could write in Solidity mm -hmm. um, that could serve the broader public for uses such as closing a home. I'm sorry, Don. No, that, okay. that's great. Go ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. That, that was one of the uh, things that the liquidity, which the payday lenders provide sort of instantaneously, yep. is one of those key things. The, we talk, you talked about stable coin and stable values. That's something I think that's very important to low income households who have less resources totally. So being able to retain the value of those, uh, very key to them. And then ease of understanding. It's not hard to understand what happens at, at a payday lender in that transaction. E easy to deal with, no uh, piles of paperwork. And Doug, you brought up a couple of good points about legal tender. You know, it is important for payment stablecoin to have immediate convertibility to fiat currency, which is, you know, for instance, USDC is convertible 24-7 uh, with a lot of liquidity to fiat, which I think is definitely important for that uh, seamless transaction to occur if you require to, say, pay fiat currency. Um, in addition, I think you, know, you brought up uh, the point about access. Um, it, there's, here's where uh, wallet-based systems could actually make huge improvements. For instance, 75% of USDC-enabled wallets hold less than $100, which is less than the minimum required amount for most banks. These are the areas I personally think there could be immense progress in terms of financial inclusion, in terms of supporting even housing. Yeah. Doug, I'm, I'm curious, because as I think about the subject conceptually, I think about this great distributed ledger where you can, you can ha use uh, interplay of smart contracts, where you can you know, potentially grant mortgages, um, you can collect through payments on, 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 on the ledger, your accounting is, 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 is easy to follow, um, you've got this immutable record. Why aren't those all pluses that 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 just make you know Fannie Mae or uh, uh, other agencies just not want to run out and somehow figure out how to get 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 the mortgage process on on blockchains? <laughs> the mortgage uh, industry is not known for innovation. 
I've heard that. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the e mortgage has been a concept uh, as long as I've been involved in the industry, which uh, I'm not going to say how many years that is, but it's a lot. Um, it just has never gotten traction all the way across the industry. Lots of relationship management issues, still significant parts of doing business in the mortgage industry. There's not, I don't believe, other than the regulatory um, compliance issues that have to be managed, there's not a conceptual reason that shouldn't happen. Um, but there are, I think there's north of 25 regulations that impact mortgage processes. And uh, coming out of, the, out of the 2007 to 9 crisis, we surveyed lenders and asked them, where are you investing in technology? And it was all in compliance. When in theory, from our perspective, it should be improving efficiency and passing on savings to consumers. At that time, it was regulatory compliance. We have another study coming out probably next week or so on what they're doing now uh, to, to try to understand. But is it, Cynthia, I see you're trying to say something, so go yeah, ahead, yeah, jump I in. A, I have a question because this is fascinating. So in terms of those compliance uh, you know, uh, challenges, uh, are those in, about data privacy? Are those about, uh, you know, uh, preserving trust within the um, mortgage uh, process, what, what are those? It, it's a whole range of things, and basically it, it has been uh, taking the compliance uh, measurement and verification from paper documents to uh, electronic documents. Uh, so uh, in terms of cost savings, not a whole lot of cost savings. In fact, in the, in the early period of changes, uh, uh, employees who were uh, applying technology to substitute for paper were actually making paper copies and storing them uh, in, in file cabinets. Uh, there's been progress on that, obviously, but uh, much, much to go. You know, and, and, and Gordon, you had, again, you had, you had mentioned, you know, one of the interesting aspects of, of, of blockchain distributed ledger, crypto, is that it's actually a mitigant against the, the, the too big to fail potential of, 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 of big banks. I mean, isn't that, again, part of the potential of the blockchain being a competition and not only driving you know, efficiency on blockchain, but driving efficiency at traditional banking institutions? Absolutely. We all seen what happened during the great financial crisis, which you know, obviously was led by banks that are too big to fail, that some of them did have to get bailed out. Um, and I think there is real opportunity here by unbundling banking. And part of that includes finding market-based approach that are built on blockchain, perhaps, to support important credit intermediation activities, such as mortgage. And I think with the transparency that it offers, with the uh, verifiability that blockchain offers, we could actually get to support mortgage um, if there's proper regulatory guardrails around it and clarity around it. And, and, and Cynthia, I'm curious, um, to the extent that there are potentials in this area, is it on permission blockchains, or is there a possibility it could be on permissionless blockchains? So I think, let's say plain vanilla, you know, public permissionless blockchains, we all know, you know, SRAN Solana as a base layer a token uh, that has supported a lot of DeFi projects, maybe some that Gordon you have uh, uh, referred to uh, in the DeFi world uh, that would introduce some of this uh, decentralized benefit. Uh, it has their own utilities. But to the extent that um, these projects will need to touch upon traditional financial system and traditional uh, financial institutions, so players like a mortgage lender and banks, I think the inevitable question is that how do you manage all sorts of risk? How do you be compliant? How do you manage you know, IT, cyber, all these challenges? So uh, to that extent, I think there is a, a clear advantage of uh, permissioned uh, uh, public blockchain or private blockchain to solve some of those challenges. But I see, Gordon, you have a reaction. Well, let me clarify. I think there is a differentiation between permission versus permissionless yeah. versus uh, getting KYC and getting compliant from a KYC and ML perspective. I think you could have uh, KYC and ML compliance in a permissionless blockchain. Uh, so look, for instance, um, Circle launched Varite, which is a decentralized identity uh, verification system 
that allows you to bring um, identity information to on-chain. If you look at uh, you know, companies that are doing data analytics, TRM labs of the world, they're doing immense amount of uh, tracing and tracking uh, with great amount of information for AML compliance. So I think the concept of you have to be permissioned to be able to be com um, compliant, I think that's a, it's not an equivalence. Those two are separate. Um, and you know, I come back to always asking this question rhetorically, which is, you know, what, what is the use of a Gmail if you can only email other people with Gmail accounts? Which is the same fundamental reason why I think a permissionless blockchain, but with proper um, guided rails, with proper KYC, could actually do quite a bit of uh, um, good in the world. Doug, what, how is, this, is Fannie Mae formally thinking about using blockchain technology? We've run a couple of experiments uh, on it to uh, just to prove out the concept. We looked at some securities uh, issues. Uh, the, at this point, it doesn't seem that the cost effectiveness is there yet, but the technologic capability exists. Uh, it's something that we'll continue to work on. Uh, we also have a working group that's looking at uh, central bank digital currency to try to understand how that might uh, impact the operations of the company, where in our processes uh, or in the product space that might ha have an impact. So, yeah, we're trying to, to participate in the, in the market development. And, and I'm curious, Gordon, from your perspective, um, and I know you have a, a personal interest in this, uh, central bank digital currency, is there a place for both central bank digital currency and privately issued stable coins going forward? Absolutely. I think there could be coexistence between the two. Uh, well, if you think about CBDC, what the, there are different types of considerations. I think retail CBDC. By the way, be... Cindy is smiling when, when you're when you're talking right now. So we're going to get to her. <laughs> <laughs> right, finish your point, right. then we're going to ask you yeah. why you're smiling. Why I think she's smiling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Retail CBDC would just be uh, too much of a lift for government to bet on multi-decade type of technology, which is why you know for private sector to innovate on constantly upgradable blockchain is probably more preferable. But yeah, if wholesale CBDC comes around, maybe there could be coexistence. But what is wholesale CBDC? A CBDC just means that uh, somebody, has direct li somebody has direct liability of the Federal Reserve, uh, in which case we already have that sort of system with Fed now, except it's only restricted banks. So if you can open up access to the Fed balance sheet by non-banks, perhaps coupled with Fed now, that would essentially resemble a wholesale CBDC that could actually support um, more private sector-led efforts, that, such as payment stable coins. Cindy, some thoughts? So the only point I'm going to make is that, uh, you know, again, we're in a place where innovations are happening uh, constantly, not just in the private sector, but also uh, by public sector players. So a lot matters. I mean, uh, Gordon, you mentioned previously about you know uh, innovations of uh, uh, public permissionless blockchain. Can that use be uh, for the purpose of uh, identity verification? I'm sure there will be, you know, a need for that. I'm sure there will be developers and builders who are thinking about some of these solutions. Which, uh, just for me as someone who has followed crypto not for too long, but I see that has been a very uh, interesting part of the uh, crypto. Uh, asset ecosystem. So uh, timing matters, a lot of moving pieces, uh, which will eventually change our view uh, on the, on the uh, desirability and uh, also how um, you know, we in, uh, really envision this ecosystem with the different solutions that coexist. And, and, I, and I know in your unofficial, non-personal capacity, can CBDCs and, and, and private issue stable coins coexist? For that, I have, I have a question mark. Uh, because, uh, so uh, I see a cross-border uh, being an uh, area where uh, stable coins probably have a lot of potential, but uh, cross-border is not you know, uh, an area where public sector players cannot provide solutions. All right, we have exactly one minute, so I'm going to give everybody about 20 seconds for some final thoughts. Gordon? Well, I think. In understanding this whole um, ecosystem of decentralized uh, finance, of blockchain, and how it could support housing, we really should consider the opportunities to reduce risk 
through a market-based approach in addition to the risks that are currently being considered. Okay, Doug? Agreed. Uh, I would add to that reduced costs. Uh, one of the essential uh, challenges for uh, low income and first time home buy buyers is the cost associated with the process. And so lots of potential to reduce costs. Cindy? A lot of potential, uh, as uh, uh, Doc just mentioned, but also one thing that resonated with me from yesterday's panel is that the first question should be, who are you trying to serve? Then uh, the next question will be, what is the right to, to solve the challenges that will help you know, the customer uh, reach their life goal or uh, ambition? Terrific. Well, thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Cindy. It's so nice to talk to non-lawyers once in a while. Everybody have a great day. And again, Chris, you've done a great job this year, as always. Thank you, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come one, come all uh, to one of the highlights of uh, the day. Uh, I am just absolutely delighted to welcome um, Director uh, Sandra Thompson to the uh, stage. She is the uh, director of the FHFA. I know we have some crypto people who may not necessarily be thinking about the FHFA, but she is an innovator in her own right and is uh, vital to this conversation. So welcome to the stage. <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, Director Thompson, thank Sandra. you. Sandra, Sandra, uh, you know, never want to get in trouble <laughs> with uh, that. Sandra, thank you so, so, so very much for, for, for joining us. Uh, I guess we're just going to kick it off with the question that uh, I'm sure many of us are thinking about, uh, both uh, homeowners as well as people in the press. What is your impression right now of the housing market? What's, 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 what's going on um, and, and what are your views? So we're facing some challenging headwinds right now. Uh, I think the mortgage market is experience, experiencing a lot of, of volatility, rising interest rates, rising home prices, although the home prices this year are slowly um, declining. They're, they're increasing, but not a, as, a high, at, as a higher rate. And you know, people are not able to afford as much in a home as they could six, seven months ago. We're also looking at um, just a lot of headwinds, inflation, we're looking at you know, the supply chain issues, we're looking at a huge deficit in the supply of residential mortgages, and so we're looking at some challenging times right now. Yeah, I mean, when you think about policy and, and, and policy making, um, you know, are, are, are there certain kinds of trends that you have sort of embedded in how you think about policy in terms of where the economy is going and, and, and really the risk and opportunities associated with the housing market? Sure. So, of course, um, in the mortgage market, you know, we've had lots of experience in determining and seeing what not to do. So we look at lots of different trends. We look at you know, interest rates. We look at home prices. We look at you know, home availability. We look at uh, supply. We look at unemployment. We look at just a number of different factors. And we keep our eye on those metrics. Certainly, you know, we had the experience in the Great Recession of dealing with, you know, lots of issues in the mortgage market. I mean, just the reverberation throughout the world was just so impactful. But I do think that we've learned some lessons uh, from there. And, and in terms of policy making, you know, a lot of changes took place after the Great Recession. You know, the ability to repay a lot of the products that were around in you know, 06, 07 are no longer um, around. People are you know, looking at their ability to repay. They're looking at full amortization. And it's just quite interesting. And I would say, though, that when the pandemic uh, took place in 20 and 21, it did provide um, some challenges, but it also provided some opportunities, especially as it relates to technology. Interestingly enough, when we look at the outstanding book for Fannie and Freddie in particular, you know, many people took advantage of the low interest rate environment to refinance. And so, you know, the home payment is the highest monthly payment most people have. And I think people in 2021 took advantage of the refinance opportunities to lower those payments. So the credit quality of our outstanding book is probably something that we're not as worried about given the interest rate 
in, in, given the interesting environment. Well, mm -hmm. well you know, uh, you had mentioned technology, and, and um, the FHFA has made a big policy announcement. You know, introducing a new office, uh, really devoted towards towards innovation. Um, and uh, you know, that that I think was a bit of a surprise. You don't usually sort of um, traditionally associate uh, you know technology and innovation expressly with uh, FHFA. I mean, what, what were the motivations behind the office? What, 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 what had prompted you to really focus and bear down on those issues? Sure, so technology is embedded in almost every single thing that we do. And we think about the mortgage industry is probably one of the industries that has not moved as quickly in adopting technology. When you think about the time to close, on average it's about 45 days. And when you look at the cost of closing, it's relatively high, I think it's about $9,500, dependent, of course, on lots of different factors. But you know, there are a number of places where we think technology can be useful to try to reduce the costs and also reduce the time, improve efficiency, and bring risk management to the process. And we just want to look at you know, where can we effectuate technology in a responsible way throughout the mortgage process. I mean, it shouldn't take that long, quite frankly. Well, you know, this is, you've raised now a couple of issues that I find really fascinating. So number one, um, you've identified and you've talked a little bit about the fact that maybe the technology in the space, in the housing market, in the mortgage market, hasn't necessarily kept up to speed or whatever, I assume whatever innovation that there has been, it, maybe it hasn't uh, uh, delivered maybe in ways that, that we would have hoped. You know. Why do you think, just conceptually, um, you know, it's taken a while to put those two things together and for people to sort of, A, recognize technology as, as a potential uh, pain point and solution, and then also, you know, it, it, you know for the FHFA itself, you know, it's, it's taken a while to actually, you know, create it. It took, it took your leadership, you know, to create that office. I mean, wh why do you think it's, 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 it's taken quite so long to, to get there? Well, the mortgage process itself is quite long and there are a number of stakeholders from start to finish and depends on where you finish so you've got you know underwriters and loan officers and realtors and appraisers and closers and title companies and even after the loan is closed and it's securitized you've got investors you got to do disclosures you've just got lots of data but there are lots of participants in the mortgage process and so you know you can come up with a technology, but are those participants going to adopt the technology and then have it utilized on a widespread basis? And so we've been looking at um, ways to work with Fannie and Freddie to look at like, every part of the mortgage process. And I'll give you an example, and this was something that came up during the pandemic. You know, um, at the onset, nobody wanted to go into people's homes. And as a person who refinanced myself, I didn't want to let the appraiser in my house. And so, you know, there was just all this fear and these uh, unknown factors that really have to do with just the mortgage process and how, you know, people focused and data focused it is. And so when you think about, you know, this low interest rate environment, it was really, um, through the use of technology that we were able to keep the mortgage market moving. We introduced desktop appraisal, the desktop appraisal process. We introduced, you know, a couple even years before that, day one certainty on appraised values. And we also introduced um, a number of asset income verification models that would take information from third parties and then verify it against what you or what the borrower placed on the application. So it was a really good time to incorporate technology in a way that expedited the process and also provided some good risk management because you've got third party validation in many cases. So, you know, why I love personally talking about housing and technology is next to money, housing is the one thing that everybody knows about, right? Like you either have money or you don't have money. Like even if you don't have money, you know what money is. You know, right. if you either have a house or, or you don't. And even if you don't, you know what it is. And, it, and it's a very tangible sort of tactile thing. And, and when you get into to the question of technology and innovation, you know, it, 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 it provides very clear kind of questions about use cases. But you know, I, I think that when FHFA gets involved in the conversation of, of innovation, 
it's, it's a little bit different from you know conversations that we've been having with the SEC or with Chairman Benham yesterday or even uh, the acting comptroller uh, yesterday. And, and, you know, the, and in part of it is, is because of your mandate, of the FHA's mandate. Much more so than other financial regulatory agencies, there is a, <clears throat> a kind of financial inclusion mandate, or at least aspiration, that's embedded in the core of the agency. Um, and you don't necessarily have that in, in some of the other uh, regulators, just in terms of their, their, their mandate. I mean, does that inform how you think about technology? Um, does that create certain kinds of advantages um, in terms or different perspectives uh, or disadvantages in terms of how you, you think about what technology can, can, can do? So that really informs uh, my, our thinking in terms of policy formation. And then a subset of that would be the utilization of technology in that policy formation. For example, one of the things that we think is, is very impactful, and both Fannie and Freddie are doing this, and I think even FHA, uh, incorporating positive rental payments into the underwriting process. And it's interesting because I'm not sure why it took this long to do that. You know, yeah. under a uh, mortgage payment is certainly, um, you know, based on your ability and willingness to repay. So people have been paying their rent for years and they're paying them on time. And so that regular payment, routination, routinization of that payment is not taken into consideration because it's not a debt, it's an expense. And in every household that at least I know, and there may be exceptions to this statement, but the mortgage payment and or the rental payment is the largest monthly payment that most people make. And so, you know, why shouldn't we incorporate positive rental payments um, to help assess a borrower's or potential borrower's ability or willingness to repay. And so the regulatory agencies, and I'll also include FHA, you know, have th thought about this. Um, Fannie Mae certainly has made it a priority, as well as Freddie Mac. And also Freddie Mac, actually, in the multifamily business line, they're um, asking borrowers to opt in to, you know, this positive rental payments for renters and the multifamily pro properties that they finance. And so we think that, you know, utilization of technology is huge in this area. You know, 12 months rental payment, you know, can technology be used to look at, you know, bank statements to make sure that the information is there? But just looking at um, ways to provide more inclusive uh, policies, because when we do policy formulation, we have to figure out what is the impact of the policies that we are putting in place. Are we impacting, you know, low to moderate income individuals and households? Are we in impacting communities of color? And if so, how? And so we take all of those factors into consideration. And if technology can kind of level the playing field, then I'm all for it. Uh, you know, that is that's that's really interesting. And and and. Uh, uh, you know, those examples are, are, are great. And they're great examples, you know, when you think about positive rental payment history. I mean, like, if you can, you know, think about whether or not someone's been paying their debt for their loan, why not, you know, take into consideration what people have been paying for, for their apartment, for, their, for, for uh, you know, nobody wants to lose their dwelling. Right. Um, uh, uh, but, but even there, as, as that kind of example, you know, that example is in itself a kind of a big data example. You know, like mm -hmm. how do you harvest, you know, the information, um, that information, and, and create a technology system that then can channel it to those very productive and inclusive purposes. Um, it, it, you know, but just getting that kind of project off the ground, as you said, it, why did it take so long? Like, is there is there something? because of the, of the mandate of the FHFA or the position of the FHFA? Because there are other agencies that have a toe or so into these kinds of questions. But is there something special that positions the FHFA to do those kinds of things where, where others are a little bit slower? Um, well, you know, we have just been um, come out of like 14 years ago, there was a huge meltdown in the <laughs> mortgage right. industry. Yeah. And I think it's taken about 14 years to rebuild public confidence in the mortgage space. I mean, when you look at what happened before, I think, you know, from my perspective, and I certainly I worked at the FDIC for 23 years, we had to deal a lot with public confidence, and we, we really take that very seriously. 
confidence, especially um, when you're talking about people's money and their bank accounts yeah. or their homes, I mean, it is really hard to get, but it's easy to lose. And I think we've done a pretty good job in the past 14 years rebuilding confidence in the mortgage or the housing finance system. And so when we take on these initiatives, whether they include technology or not, we have to be really mindful about making sure that they work well, that we understand the impact, that we understand who's impacted, we understand different communities, we've got to take investors and other stakeholders into consideration. So there are just a lot of touch points that we do before we implement any policy initiative. And so we're very thoughtful, we're very intentional, but we're also um, very, I think, transparent. And we've been really making a move to try to be more transparent, especially in the area of data, because data will really render some informed decision. If it's data-driven, fact-based, then some of the statements that we make, we can point to like the Fannie Mae study on closing costs or the Freddie Mac study on uh, appraisal bias. And so, you know, here's the statement, but here's the data. And we do take our time to make sure that the things that we say and the things that we do are fact-based and data-driven. And so I just think that um, making sure that we're using the right approach, that we're understanding the impact on all stakeholders before we make a policy decision, whether it's technology-based or not, we just think that that is so important because we are really trying to keep the confidence that I think we've built over the past 14 years. Yeah, um, and, 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 and thank you. That was in and of itself extremely interesting and you know, having that context of, you know, even being able to innovate requiring um, a, a enough trust uh, and, and, and to build the trust necessary to, to innovate. Um, are, are, what, what areas, when you think about innovation and, and, and like you've, you've mentioned you know, now a little bit of, of data, is that where you really wanna uh, uh, lean in or are there other areas that are exciting or interesting or that you're curious about um, where you know, uh, technology may be useful in sort of attacking some of the pain points um, in sort of creaky systems or opening up more opportunities for access to housing? Yeah, so we're, I do want to lean into data because I think that uh, making sure that we're making decisions based on the data that we have, and we have quite a bit, I think is really important. And then sharing that data and trying to figure out ways to deal with you know the privacy issues because the, at the loan level it's very borrower specific. And so just trying to figure out ways to uh, use data, to provide data, to share data, so that people can really understand the basis of our decisions. So that is one area I want to lean into. I also want to lean into this cost associated with, you know, cost to close. And when you think about it, especially for like a small balance loan, and these are like some policy issues that probably um, could be addressed someplace else, but I think that um, you're looking at the cost to close for small balance loans, and many times the small balance loans are owned by people who can least afford to pay these high costs. Like it shouldn't cost somebody ten thousand dollars to close, you know, a two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollar loan when they're trying to reduce their monthly payment. And so the people that you know can least afford it are paying the most for closing costs. And so just leaning into you know what is the process? You know, are there places where technology can be used? If there are places, you know, what can be done? How much is it going to cost? Making sure that there is risk management so that we understand what the risks are and that we have risk mitigants because what's the point in introducing something that's extremely risky? Um, so we are looking at every single um, place in the process to figure out where technology can be adopted, but then you've got, you know, if you figure out the technology, is everybody going to use it? Are there things that need to be standardized? I mean, it is, there are just so many decisions that can be, that need to be made. Well, one of the sort of series of decisions that are trying to be made here in, in, in Washington uh, it involves blockchains and the application of blockchains. Yesterday was uh, a, a, a enormous focus on uh, cryptocurrencies because many of the other of your of your fellow regulators are trying to grapple with you know um, um, how they want to engage it, the good, the bad, um, the opportunity, the risk. 
Um, from your standpoint, um, do you have any sense as to what blockchain technology uh, could mean for the housing space? Any interesting areas where, where, where that could be uh, helpful? Well, we, we, do, we have some ideas, but one of the things that we did since you know, we just announced the office is we issued a request for input, and we asked that very question. I mean, we're not the experts, and so we've asked people, you know, what are places in the mortgage process that you know, technology can be useful to cut costs or cut time or improve efficiency? And we are you know, really looking for input from, from the people that care about this so that we can try to adopt and make some of those policy changes. You know, we asked the enterprises to submit some equitable housing finance plans and then parts of those plans, and, and they're public. You know, there's reference made to certain aspects of the process. You know, we're looking at, um, you know, the title process, you know, e-closings, uh, e-notifications, uh, e-registration, and just kind of around the edges. But in order to make the big impact that we'd like to see, you know, I think we're going to need to get more information from the people that do this every day. Uh, yeah, I, I just find that like a really interesting, which is why I was, uh, I was saying mischievous enough to try to do this here. You know, which was, which was, you know, getting these communities of people who don't necessarily talk very much together, right? You know, you have the, like the blockchain people, you know, doing, you know, creating their infrastructure, and then you have the housing people. Uh, you know, with their in infrastructure, trying to upgrade their infrastructure, but they're not—they're not even geographically located in the same spaces in the same area, and you know, uh, trying to find a way to kind of convene or or to even push for, from the FHFA for great incentives. I don't know ways to really engage that process. Um, a little bit off off course, but okay. um, um, uh, have you seen? Just one last little follow up on blockchain because I. I hear a lot from, from, from one set of my friends, and, you know, my crypto friends, and then yep. nothing from the housing space. Do, I mean, do you hear, what, regardless as to whether or not it's blockchain or any other technology, you know, when new technologies come to the fore in the housing space, are there, you know, like, what's that even like? I mean, you know, so, you know, when, when you look at the industry, you know, and there's, there's something new and shiny coming around, you know, like, like are, are people, do you get the sense that people, tend to be more competitive and say, okay, I, I got to get a hold of that and get that before everyone else, or is it a little bit more like, qu'est-ce que c'est? I, mean, I think in the mortgage space, I mean, I was just happy to be able to upload my documents, you know, <laughs> during a refi. Um, so that's a change because it, it's so, you know, <laughs> people, there's like 30 different touch points between, you know, but by the time you fill out that form, you know, electronically now, which was, you know, that was <laughs> a great revelation. Yeah, yeah. And so just like little things, and they make a difference and the mortgage industry generally is very reticent to adopt technology. I mean, you're talking about a huge asset with you know, significant value and making sure that all the paperwork is right in case something goes wrong is really important. So I do understand that. I totally agree with it. But it's got to be better. I mean, we're still like 20 years behind. In fact, you know, the, um, I should shouldn't say it. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, say I'm it. No. Say it, director. No. Say no. it. Oh, you can do it. Oh, okay. I won't. Where are our drinks? <laughs> uh, you can definitely say it. Uh, you know, but, but, but you know, I, I find it, I find it mm -hmm. fascinating, right? You know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a securities law guy, right? You know, and, and I, I've had the privilege of, of being on the Fannie board, but it's really, really interesting. You know, I can remember when I think at one point in time the SEC said that you know, certain kinds of disclosures could like be put on Twitter or something. It was like a revolution, and like, tw Twitter was already like a decade old or something, and, and everyone said, well, everyone's using it anyway. But you know, those incremental changes, however which way, you know, when you buy a home, when that young family moves in, I can remember first time, you know, we, we bought a house, and you just look at all these documents, and you're like, I, I've never seen that many documents before, you know, and, 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 and think about how long it takes to close that process, and it's kind of like a weird regressive tax, um, you know, like how, how much change people feel like, and that's just the front end, it's not even counting the back end. Uh, no, that's okay. true, and so a lot of the um, millennials, I can't remember if it's X, Y, Z, or whatever the new letter is, you know, they're... Can't be X, can't be X, okay. we're angels. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But people are starting to buy homes now. I mean, I think that some of the trauma that people experienced in 2008, nine is, is kind of um, a thing of, not necessarily a thing of the past, but people are 
again, they do have confidence and they're ready to buy. But if you're thinking about a millennial or an ex, mm -hmm. you know, you can sit on, at, you can sit right here and access your bank account. You can, you know, get a loan for your car and probably have the car delivered to you before this conference is over. And so. These are, this is the group of people that's the next generation of people that are going to be buying houses. The process that we have now is not going to work very long for them because the attention spans are, I mean, people are used to the immediacy of decisioning and the immediacy of things happening. And so we have to be more responsive and make the process easier to understand, easier and faster to deliver. Uh, decisions and faster to, you know, get to closing and less costly. I'm a professor, but you really get millennials. Let me tell you that. Yeah. Uh, it's like <laughs> we need this now. Um, so, you know, to turn to another uh, really important issue and one that you've already mentioned, and and that is the challenge of appraisal sure. bias. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is prevalent uh, or far too often, um, and it can and it really does impact the ability for so many people uh, of color to be able to mm -hmm. climb you know, to take that first rung uh, up the ladder to building uh, economic wealth. I mean, what are your ideas there? Do you have a sense as to how technology may or, you know, be able to at least uh, uh, be a tool in helping to address yeah, that challenge? absolutely. So we serve on um, the appraisal task force that's chaired by Secretary Fudge and I think all of the agencies that you mentioned yesterday who are here, um, Acting Comptroller Sue, the OCC, all the financial regulators serve on that committee and appraisal bias is something that we've been looking at and this goes to my point on data so freddie mac uh, published a study i think nine months to a year ago and they looked at some of the appraisal records that they had and they noted that the um, cost of the home and the appraised value was lower in communities of color than it were than the cost and appraised value was in communities that were um, not communities of color. And so data, you know, when you make this statement and you can talk about it, because this is something that comes up all the time in people's conversations. You read, you know, articles in, you know, USA Today or any other paper that talks about, you know, the whitewashing where people have to remove you know, specific, you know, pictures and just change their homes around and the appraised value changes based on what your house looks like. And there was even a story a couple of weeks ago about a couple in Maryland yeah, professors. Right. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah. And maybe I think it was a professor and a doctor, but you know, they had to take all their pictures down. Yeah. And the appraised value when they were in the house with the pictures was significantly higher, it was significantly lower than it was when they um, took those pictures down. But the data will show the information in a way that allows you to make that statement and say, and somebody can say, oh yeah, well that was just a one-off or that was this, or that was that. And they're able to say, hey, this is what the data show. Yeah. And you can address the issue fact-based, data-driven, and then try to come up with some policies to create it. And I'll tell you, we had previously been looking at appraised values that were higher um, than the cost, I mean like way higher you know, because of the issues that we experienced, um, you know, 14 years ago, and we hadn't thought to think about the um, appraised values lower than the sales price, and so now the data is showing that this is a real issue and it needs to be addressed. Yeah, my, my dream for anybody, you know, the innovators in the internet's world out there is that, you know, having one day a, kind of even a handheld device or an app, right, for the appraiser, so when, when they're entering their data or something to, or, or to survey, you know, what the course of that, of those appraisals are, you know, to see if they're out of whack, you know, it's something, but it, it seems like that is, it's such a detrimental issue towards building generational wealth, yeah. you know, it doesn't just impact the family, but it impacts that family's um, heirs, uh, and, and it's, no, it's, it's, exactly it's, big, right. it's a big problem. So, um, you know, the other big problem or challenge right now that, that, that the entire U.S. government is facing as our sort of last sort of leadoff is, is uh, the challenge of uh, not just inflation, but the deceleration of the economy, you know, um, and that has an important impact on what agencies think about in terms of their priorities and their ability to be ambitious um, in all kinds of different uh, ways. You know, when you think about those 
those challenges mm -hmm. that will be you know with us at least for the medium term you know how do you view technology against the backdrop not just of, mm -hmm. of access but also this deceleration and macroeconomic um, uh, volatility so I think you know making sure that we're monitoring you know very important metrics you know we've got you know a little over seven trillion in mortgage-backed securities outstanding and we care about all of the things that you know impact that book of business and we are always looking at ways to get information to use technology to make uh, observations on what's happening in a particular area across the country and in certain pockets within our country. And I think technology has allowed us to do that and just to have access to information more quickly and in a more robust way than that which existed years ago. And so we're always looking for ways to um, assess the macroeconomic environment, and also trying to take certain segments of the macroeconomic metrics that we're looking at and break them down and see how they impact our book. Director Sandra, Director Sandra, uh, thank you so very much. Sure. Thank you so, so very much. We know that you're very busy. This has been a wonderful conversation, and thanks for visiting thank us for on uh, DC Fintech Week. So uh, we will use this then uh, to introduce our next panel. Um, and, and we're just going to uh, jump right to it. Um, sorry, I, as I'm keeping my organization uh, straight. Um, actually, no, we're taking a short break, <laughs> which, is, which clearly I need, and some more coffee. So uh, we'll start back up at 10.15. See you. There's no doubt that technology is giving us new ways to close the housing gap. Even though there are millions of people out there who are making the functional equivalent of a monthly mortgage payment in their rent, it's actually not showing up in their credit history, and that's just a, a huge gap. Desktop Underwriter, also known as DU, is our automated underwriting tool. We've automated 12 months of history in DU. We use our technology to identify those borrower payments uh, made by check or by electronic means, but then or PayPal. And then we, we look for the 12-month uh, payment history or pattern within the borrower's bank account statement, which is really a great example of how Fannie Mae's leveraging digital technology to really help more renters get a reasonably approved for a mortgage. We're initially focused on the black home ownership journey. So this was a way for us to leverage data to see those folks and give them access where they're going to be successful in home ownership and actually grow the pie. And that's really what we're trying to do. You don't close the gap without growing the pie. When we looked at the challenge, we approached it in, in three parts. We applied machine learning capabilities to build out the algorithms to enable us to identify the consumer uh, rent payments. Then we also worked with our FinTech partners to consistently pull in that 12 months of data. And then lastly, we educated the lenders and the loan officers. I think there's still a lot that needs to happen, not just with Fannie Mae, but frankly across the ecosystem to turn this into something scalable that is part of the machine. But it takes everybody in the chain to want to solve that problem and, and look for ways to really tackle the things that have stood in the way of home ownership for a long time. to our next panel. You know, you heard a little bit from Director Thompson about uh, blockchain technology, and we'll have a discussion about tokenization, not just of mortgages, but the tokenization of everything and what it could mean for uh, the economy and for finance. So I am delighted to welcome our next panel right now. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. So let me start by introducing uh, my Steve panel today. 
So I'm going to start with uh, Karen Newman, who's the head of structured finance at Redwood Trust. Then we have Nick Carter, who's the co-founder of Castle Island Ventures. We have Rebecca Reddick, who is the general counsel for Ave Companies. And last but not least, we have Jose Fernandez de Ponte, who is the SVP, general manager of blockchain, crypto, digital currencies at PayPal. Mm. So, uh, and I am Ramon Richards. So I am thrilled to be here with you all today. Uh, the day is off to a good start, and we're gonna jump right into our panel. So Nick, we're gonna start with you. So we have um, in our audience people with various understandings of blockchain and tokenization. Uh, can you share a little bit about um, what is tokenization? Um, what does it mean to tokenize? Thanks, Ramon, and thanks uh, for Chris for the invitation. Um, yeah, so tokenization, um, you know, in the crypto slash blockchain context, uh, has a different definition from sort of the tokenization that you might be used to in, in uh, fintech and uh, sort of the data security space. Um, so in sort of the blockchain world, it's um, inserting a claim to a sort of non-native asset, and uh, a native asset would be, you know, some crypto asset like uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum. A non-native asset could be anything, right? Um, uh, I would say the most popular tokenized thing on blockchains is simply dollars, right? Uh, people don't often consider stable coins uh, to be part of that sort of tokenization rubric, but uh, there's $150 billion of them on blockchains, and all they are is a claim on a uh, commercial bank liability, basically. Um, it's just that they settle on the blockchain. So you've seen everything under the sun be tokenized with varying degrees of success in the history of blockchains. And there was kind of a first wave of tokenization in 2017, 18. Uh, didn't work so well, arguably. And uh, now we have maybe a more successful second wave. Uh, but you know, so you have, I think the thing that people got excited about was tokenizing securities and putting them on chain uh, to take advantage of kind of the you know, nice settlement assurances you get with blockchains, the possible fractionalization. Uh, in theory, uh, you know, the liquidity unlock hypothesis, I, I don't necessarily believe that. Uh, but the idea that maybe you get more liquidity because it's on a blockchain and sort of they're inherently liquid, again, I'm very skeptical of that. Um, and then you have tokenized non-securities like art, collectibles, uh, NFTs um, are now, you know, representing other third-party assets, merchandise, physical things. Uh, so really everything you can imagine has been tokenized. The problem with uh, the sort of securities tokenization is just there isn't a great infrastructure, uh, especially from a regulatory perspective, to circulate and trade securities in the blockchain context. Great. Thank you, Nick. Jose, I want to turn to you. And as we think about um, kind of major considerations and innovation that we have to think through when it comes to adopting a tokenization strategy from the purchase it on at PayPal. Um, can you share your thoughts? Absolutely. Uh, as Nick was saying, there is a concept of tokenization in the crypto and blockchain space, but tokenization has been around for quite a while. And actually, on the payments side, tokenization has been active way before uh, crypto. As an abstraction, when you're tokenizing, what you're doing is you're getting a piece of sensitive data, and you're transforming that into a piece of non-sensitive data. You're getting credit card information, and you're transforming that into a random string of numbers that you can share and, and, and you can store. In payments, uh, what we learn is that if you try to figure out what is hard and what is not hard, the technology is not hard. It was, but it's established, it's tried, it's, te it's tested, it works. What it took a while for tokenization to pick up in, in payments was, I would say, probably two things. The first one is the use case. So why, would you, why should you use tokenization? What is the killer app for tokenization and payments? And originally, it had nothing to do with blockchain. It had to do with something for the payment nerds in the room called PCI DSS, which is the payment card industry data security standard, which, may, which sets the requirements for merchants to store confidential information about consumers. So the reason that tokenization picked up in payments was because merchants had to comply with that data security aspect, and they didn't want to store personal information. So that's where you got to uh, what you have now and when you use Apple Pay to tokenize your car and your device. All that started with that use case that, mm -hmm. drove, that drove adoption. Once that you have the use case, 
The second thing that you need is, is the ecosystem. As we say, the technology is not hard, but to do that transaction, to use that device at a point of sale in a physical store, you need to work with the phone manufacturers. You need the point of sale terminal to be able to connect with the credit card tokenization system. You need the payment processor to be able to translate that token back into a credit card number that gets sent to your uh, payment instrument provider. All of that took a while. And I think there are many analogies that we are seeing now on, in the blockchain space. And we are seeing definitely that in the DeFi space about how the different parts of the equation get, get together. I'm definitely not an, an expert in the housing market, and I don't know which are the pieces of the ecosystem that we need to adopt, but I would imagine that that's going to be one of the uh, milestones to, to overcome going forward. Hey, Jose, one, one quick follow-up to our top uh, question. When you say it took a while, what was the ballpark time frame? Uh, I would say that since the first experiments in tokenization till what we have today, that is broad adoption that most of us don't realize in our day-to-day -day because it's abstracted right. from the consumer, mm. I would say probably five to seven years. Okay, very good. And you mentioned housing in your answer, and uh, it's a good opportunity, Kara, to turn to you. When we talk about tokenization, what could that mean for the housing sector? What type of things could be tokenized? Uh, thanks for the question, and thanks to Chris for the invitation to come and talk with you all today. Um, I'll pick up on a couple of points that Nick actually mentioned when he was giving an overview of tokenization. Um, as a practitioner of capital markets, um, I found that creativity and technology are hallmarks of innovation inside the capital markets as parties seek to construct products that are attractive to investors um, and find new ways to distribute risk through the system. Uh, and for decades, technologies like tranching of risk have been used inside capital markets to create uh, attractive risk profiles and match yield needs on the investor's uh, side. And what tokenization, meaning wrapping a QCIP or a population of loans with smart contract technology to allow it to be traded on the blockchain can do, as Nick mentioned, is through fractionalization offer even more bespoke exposure to risk. So I'll give you a tangible example, because um, the conversation can get a little bit esoteric sometimes. So. What if rather than buying an entire population of mortgage loans or an entire QCIP, you were able to buy just a narrow slice of risk or inside that pool of loans, a specific geographic footprint? Mm. What tokenization allows you to do um, through fractionalization, as Dick mentioned, is to create that even more bespoke exposure to risk. And it's not just the asset, it's also the pricing. So tailoring the risk to the investor's desired risk profile might in future allow you to tailor pricing more closely to match that risk. So rather than paying for embedded credit enhancement or other investor protections inside a security, you're able to tailor the price more closely to the risk. Got it, makes a lot of sense. So drilling down a little bit into housing, when we think about, um, the closing process. Can you share maybe your thoughts on where you think tokenization could play in uh, speeding up the closing process? Uh, well, thank you for that question, because it's helpful to kind of ground the discussion about tokenization in reality, I think. It can tend to skew um, a, bit, uh, a bit esoteric, particularly for people like me that um, like the intellectual thought process of figure out ways to integrate tokenization. So the, the company that I work for, Red Road Trust, is involved in both the front end and the back end of the mortgage loan life cycle. Um, so I'll just quickly cover um, both, of those, uh, both of those use cases in turn. So Redwood uh, works with originators to, uh, to buy newly originated loans. And in our experience, uh, the process of buying a loan or of originating a loan can take um, around 30 days, more or less, depending on the particular facts of a particular loan. And in those 30 days, the, the majority of them, possibly 21, are taken up by um, the processing and underwriting phase uh, of the loan. And I'm conscious that we're here in Fannie's offices talking with an audience that's probably very familiar with all of the logistical challenges of originating loans. So I'll, I'll just, I'll focus rather than on the granular challenges uh, of the origination process, um, just on a future use case of what tokenization might mean. So if at the point of origination, a digital asset was created on the blockchain uh, so that an originator could ingest information to fill out the credit profile 
um, and the credit package for the borrower and receive all of the supporting documentations like bank statements and tax information directly from the source, add that to the blockchain so that not only it's immediately apparent to the borrower and to the originator what items are missing, what's been improperly ingested and needs clarification, what needs further information uh, to get the documents that you need to move the loan forward in the process immediately have those stored in permanent digital form on the blockchain, allows underwriters to automatically process the information and allows a loan to potentially move, fast, move faster towards the closing process. Just by estimation, you know, it's possible that, that making that information available to all parties automatically on the blockchain could save maybe 10 to 15 days off of the process, which is a significant improvement in the, in the borrower's experience and in the whole loan's life cycle. And then just touching quickly on the secondary, um, on the secondary mortgage market, it takes in, in Redwood's estimation about 50 to 75 days to sell a loan uh, after we've purchased it. And the vast majority of that time, about 30 days, potentially more, is taken up in re-underwriting the loan's information. So, Reperforming that process that took the majority of time when the loan was originated. If the data to support the borrower's credit profile was available on blockchain so that everyone could calculate it immediately, it's possible you could save as much as 30 days off of the process. And why that matters is that recycling capital allows originators and aggregators like Redwood to more quickly invest that money back in new loans that are created. And even more importantly, for the owner of the loan that's looking to sell it, it allows the loan to move faster off of the financing facility. And in the mortgage business, as all businesses, time is money. So the faster you're able to move that loan to the next owner, the more you're able to save um, on the loan. And hopefully in the future, all those cost savings can be passed on to everybody, including the borrower. Great, thank you, Kara. So my next question, um, Rebecca, I'm gonna start with you, but Nick, I'd love for you to weigh in as well. Uh, there's been increased discussion, consideration about tokenized insurance. Mm -hmm. um, what, what does this mean? Um, I think it goes to, so thanks for the question, uh, and thanks for you all for being here and for Chris for organizing a great event. Um, tokenized insurance looks a lot like what Nick and Kara have been talking about, where you take various forms of insurance um, and can, can put them on the blockchain in a variety of different ways. Um, I think insurance is actually one of the most challenging aspects in the blockchain and crypto space, both to get it and also how it actually can work within various different applications on the blockchain. Um, there have been some what we call crypto native type of um, insurance solutions that look to pool and aggregate different types of users and their risks and find ways to backstop positions you may have in different applications that are blockchain based. So things like um, either on exchanges or what people would call lending protocols and the like. Uh, but I don't think the insurance industry has transformed into a super blockchain friendly. I know there are a lot of people who are working on it, um, but it's the same type of thing, whether you take insurance and you can then use it uh, as a tokenized asset in the blockchain space, um, but also thinking about how you can tokenize various type of assets and use it as insurance too. So I, those I think are two different pieces of the tokenized insurance piece. But Nick, do you have more to add? No, I, I'm fully with you. I mean, uh, the blockchain doesn't magically make your processes more efficient. Um, you know, and like with the exception of the crypto native insurance products, which are fairly popular, um, you know, insurance itself has most of the features of the entire life cycle are not happening on chain. Uh, you know, th these require sort of human oversight and discretion and, and intervention. So they're not really that amenable to being codified, uh, you know, and being expressed as code. Uh, so this is sort of a, a great example of, I would say, the, the pitfalls of tokenization in the blockchain context is if most of the processes are happening off chain, the tokenization doesn't get you very much. Uh, the cases where tokenizing some asset uh, inserting it onto the blockchain actually unlocks a lot of value and innovation is where you can compose these contracts. You can refer to them uh, and you can build other things on top of these assets and contracts. Yeah. And you know that's really the beauty of the blockchain. It's sort of like open banking on steroids, right? Um, but for sort of securities, more regulated activities, it's very hard to actually transact these things without being a regulated entity. And so that's why we haven't seen success 
with a lot of, uh, you know, let's say legacy or TradFi assets being inserted on, into the blockchain, if moving it around, uh, you know, entails, you know, being a regulated entity um, and, um, you know, putting, uh, you know, settlement in sort of a traditional model, then it, you lose all the benefits of the blockchain. So the stuff to me that's the most interesting in terms of tokenization is things that aren't treated as securities necessarily. It would be, you know, more like commodities or collectibles or, you know, assets, things like that. Yeah, can I add two things to Please. that point? So the way insurance has actually evolved in the crypto native or blockchain space doesn't look like insurance, but is sort of uh, has some of the historical aspects of various types of insurance um, and is meant to sort of link to an existing type of application. So the best example I can give, because I thought Kara giving real world examples was really helpful, is um, if you can participate in a type of staking mechanism that is also meant to, in the case of a shortfall event, backstop losses on a, on a type of protocol. That's a very crypto native insurance system. It's, it's done very well. It's been copied a number of times. Uh, and there's sort of a complementary piece of software to the original application that lets you do a variety of different things, as I said, exchanges, lending, things like that. But to give a practical example of the kinds of things Kara was talking about and what tokenization of real world assets looks like, there's a, um, a software developer named Centrifuge that has built out what they call RWA, or real, w, real World Asset Markets. And what they did is they have taken a real world asset market, they tokenize pretty esoteric assets like shipping receipts and the like. Uh, they put them in trusts and then they create tokens. Um, I don't know about the tranching of risk in those in particular, but I do think that there is a lot of thought that goes into that. Um, but what they did most recently is they built the real world asset market on top of a piece of software that our company built called the Ave Protocol, which allows you to supply and borrow crypto assets. And so what Centrifuge has done is it allows you to take these tokenized real world assets and use them as collateral to borrow against them. So you can borrow something like USDC, a tokenized dollar, or you can borrow more crypto native assets like ETH um, and the like. But that is what, you know, the beginning of what a real world application of these real world asset markets looks like. Great. So Jose, I want to start with you and, and would welcome others to share their thoughts. So as we um, consider what tokenization could mean in the housing industry, uh, could you share some of your experience from the payment space, uh, lessons learned, things that you all yep. have discovered that would be uh, helpful insight as we think about it? Happy to, and I'm, I'm learning many parallels uh, from the other applications on, on housing and insurance that, that I think that would apply in payments as well. So the first one that, that as an industry, I think that we learned the, the hard way is that a payment is more than a transaction. So when, when you're in a crypto context, the, the move of value from a wallet to a different wallet it's easy and straightforward. Again, the model is tried and tested in most of the most uh, usual protocols. You, you can have confidence that that is going to work. When it gets hairy is when you're trying to add all the wrappings that you need for an effective payment transaction to happen. How do you deal with chargebacks? And how do you deal with disputes? And what happens if there has, you need to issue a, a consumer refund? How do you deal with invoicing? How do you deal with how does the merchant who's accepting a crypto payment uh, integrate that with finance ERPs? Do you need to convince the CFO that they need a separate payment method and a separate payment stack? So the number of, of layers and products and adjacencies that you need to build on top of the core uh, blockchain uh, functionality is, is one of the places where you, get, you, you can make it happen or, or not. Another couple of things that might relate to the use cases that we're talking about and, and that also we learned the hard way is how do you deal with external data? Uh, in our environment, there are many external data sources that you use around payments. Some of them are crypto native about monitoring uh, criminal activity on the web and making sure that you're not working with uh, fraudulent actors. Uh, and there are others that have to do with off-chain data sources and sanctions lists and, and things like that. You're in an environment where you're tokenizing real estate assets. I would imagine that the value of that token will go up or down with a number of data uh, attributes that are coming from external sources, appraisals and titles and deeds and, and things that are what are called oracles. So sources of real world data that need to be fed into the chain for that. And when you're operating in a blockchain environment and you're dealing with a smart contract, for the smart contract, the oracle is the truth. Meaning that if somebody, if you are using appraisal data to assess the value of a tokenized uh, asset, and somebody hacks the appraiser and changes the value, the appraised value, the smart contract would take it as good. 
and that will uh, impact the, the value of the asset. So how do you work the plumbing to make sure that those things don't happen and there is data integrity when you're absorbing data from, from the outside is an important one. And the last one that I would probably say is think about interoperability and fungibility. Mm. Uh, Nick was likening stable coins before to tokenize bank liabilities. Uh, there is a ton of nuance there. I absolutely agree that stable coins are one of the killer apps of, of blockchains and that many of the and not all applications on blockchain will develop their own token. And, and there's going to be a common language and, and a few stable coins that do that. But when you discuss stable coins, there are at least, there are probably like 35 camps, but there are at least two camps. Uh, people who think of stable coins as a store value or e money in the European version of it, you're saying, hey, this, this has to be fully backed by fiat, an instrument, and $1 is $1, and you're going to always trade that back to $1, and, and it's widely available in exchanges, and you can go back to the issuer and, and redeem. That's, that's one side of it. There is another side of it that's saying, hey, why, why don't we just tokenize banking deposits? A lot of nuance there. So think of, of it in terms of, again, interoperability. Deposits are a, an enumerated activity. So it's very regulated what you can do and not do with a deposit. If all of a sudden you start to have tokenized deposits by 55 different banking institutions, what happens there? The, do they trade one dollar per, per dollar? Because then you're, you are, uh, what you have is tokenized commercial bank money, not tokenized cash, mm. which has commercial bank risk. So is, is a token from bank A worth the same thing as a token from bank B mm. or not? How do you deal with the international aspect of that? If I have a, a stable coin that is a tokenized deposit from a bank in Germany, is that going to be accepted in the US or not? Do I need to be KYC in Germany to do it? So there is a lot of nuance that has to be figured out. I think the tokenized deposits, by the way, are a fantastic instrument and probably very useful for, to moving a, to make interbank money movements more effective. In a, in a, most of the experiences that we have now are in permission environments, not in open blockchains. If you're thinking about open blockchains, that interoperability and fungibility aspect is important. And I would imagine that it will happen the same when we start tokenizing things that are that are different. If you think of someone like Aave, if I'm bringing collateral to an Aave contract, there is a difference on whether I'm having something that is tokenized cash versus a tokenized deposit, mm -hmm. versus a standard crypto, versus uh, a real estate tokenized assets. If somebody, if the smart contract needs to execute that collateral, and what I own is a token asset, how do I execute that? How do I get that real estate asset? Do I need to go back to the owner of the loan and liquidate it? So all, the, all that plumbing mm. uh, and that interoperability aspect is extremely relevant. Very good. So, so clearly, interoperability, the plumbing has to be in, put in place. How, how do you think about um, adoption, right? You know, we often talk about where blockchain fits in kind of the housing ecosystem. And, you know, we usually get to a point where, hey, to really make this work, you know, key stakeholders have to buy in. Uh, what were some of your experiences there from a payment perspective? Uh, for, a, for a long time, there has been a criticism, which I think is a valid criticism, for, about blockchains that were a solution looking for a problem. And, and I think that's valid. Uh, and there was some of the way of dismissing blockchains. You say, this is just a, a glorified distributed database. And in some cases, it, that is right. There are many good use cases for distributed databases, and they should be used. But I don't think that blockchain is, is a solution for everything. If you're thinking about adoption, I guess that what we try to do is think of a problem where a blockchain solution is the right tool for the job. And if you abstract back, basically is, can you reduce the cost of contracting between the parties? Because usually what happens, things get centralized because the cost of contracting is really high. And that's the reason that. I am employed by PayPal, and I have an annual contract, and I don't show up in, in the door every day, and I negotiate my wage for a day, so it work, because that, that would add too much uh, friction to, to the process. If you're able to reduce the cost of transacting, then things get decentralized. Think about that when you're thinking about core use cases. This is not about checking the boxes, and uh, many of us are, are doing proofs of concept and different things in, in the blockchain space. Free advice would be spend a ton of time on whether the problem you're trying to solve is amenable to be solved by, by blockchains, because in many cases it will not. Correct. Thank you. Uh, Nick, I wanted to come back to a comment you had made um, 
about tokenization and the need to be on the chain. Can you talk a little bit more about it? it, it the question I originally had was, hey, if you're going to apply tokenization, do you have to be on the chain? Uh, but could you just share some more insights there? Yeah, I, I think the benefits of, of uh, as I said before, the benefits of using a public blockchain come down to primarily settling bearer assets. Uh, I know some people don't like that technology uh, terminology, but um, it, you know, if the if the settlement is you know truly final, then you get the very nice qualities of blockchains, which I would say are sort of atomicity and composability. Um, if there is an element of so if there's a question mark as to the finality of the, the settlement, um, then you kind of lose a lot of the nice features of blockchains. Uh, and so this is sort of having digital bare asset settlement, this is a fairly novel thing. And I would say that's sort of the true innovation of blockchains um, in that you, know, you do have payment finality, uh, at least when you're uh, you know, settling a, a native asset. Um, and having that finality allows you to build up these uh, interlinking infrastructures, right? So, uh, in a permissionless way. So that would, I would really distinguish from sort of uh, how things work in, in the tr traditional world or in the banking sector, where you don't have this element of permissionless innovation. I can't go and build a piece of software that references, uh, you know, a commercial bank's database, right? I don't have the ability to peer into that right. or build on pull data from it. Uh, the block, you know, on public blockchains, things are sort of natively transparent, um, and so uh, anyone can really reference something built by someone else, and that's where you get all the great innovations. You know, you get these financial products that are built permissionlessly. You also get great risk. I mean, you know, that's where all the hacks come from. Just last night, actually, uh, Jose was talking about oracles. Last night, there was a hundred million dollar hack for a protocol called Mango based on Oracle manipulation, mm. in case you guys are wondering about sort of uh, the downside of using blockchains. Right. Um, <laughs> for, na for now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, ne they're negotiating with the hacker, actually, so maybe they'll get some of the money back. That's, that's kind of yeah, but, that's, but that goes to some of the transparency, and that's one of the points I wanted to pick up on from Nick and to think about the use cases, because with the transparency of blockchains, if you've engaged in a, in a transaction, you can show it easily, you can verify it, you don't have to go get your records from a bank, you don't have to go through all sort of the very high friction bureaucratic processes that you're used to. And so I think over time, certainly using your five to seven year time horizon that you gave, you know, in terms yep. of tokenizing payments, um, it's important to think that we can have on-chain credit scores on, you know, other types of uh, verification that we use in the housing market today to get things like mortgages um, or otherwise to transact in the traditional financial world. Uh, and we'll be able to build those out for use cases to allow for hopefully greater participation in the economy generally. And I think that tokenization of off-chain assets, Nick and I were talking right before that, will hopefully allow there to be greater participation in general, right? There, I don't think we've solved the banking the unbanked problem today. Uh, and I think there is still a lot of hope and promise that can come to the fruition. But one of the ways we can do it is by allowing people entry into this new type of economy through off-chain assets they may have if they don't have a bank account or they don't have property and things like that, but they may have other things of value that they can either put in a trust, lock in a vault, and get them tokenized and then use them in a broader way through this you know, new economy. Great. Yeah, I'll just qu quickly add to that. I think sure. you know, to sort of sum up the thought, you know, the more remote the asset is from the blockchain context, the harder it is to sort of use it productively uh, in the blockchain. Uh, and so if the assets you're using are native, um, or if they're treated as sort of fungible, uh, like a stable coin is, uh, you know, then it's easy to transact and build things on it. Uh, if the asset uh, is reliant on sort of a third party entity, uh, and there's a lot of trust involved there, um, and you know, this active maintenance of sort of the relationship between the asset and the blockchain, then it's harder to build things. Uh, obviously, there's sort of regulatory barriers if you're talking about literal securities. But even assets that aren't securities that sort of reside externally to the blockchain, it's just much harder to actually incorporate that into sort of the permissionless blockchain framework. And so that's the challenge here. Um, and there are interesting sort of new wave, interesting models to take property and try and tokenize it on the blockchain. We are actively investing in this stuff. Um, and we're seeing you know, a big DeFi protocol called Maker now they're investing $100 million, or $500 million maybe, in treasuries, sort of real world assets. So there is a demand for active real world asset yields that are real, as opposed to sort of the fake yields of crypto. 
right? You know, real yields based on real economic <laughs> activity. <laughs> <laughs> yields that have been alleged as fake. Um, but, um, but, you know, we're not there yet. And so we, there is a desire to take these sort of third party, you know, real world assets and sort them into the blockchain uh, still early, even though we've been talking about it for what feels like 10 years now. So, Kara, question for you. Um, when you kind of look at some of the lessons or insights that you have gained from tokenization of securitized assets, um, what are some insights you can share that would be applicable in the housing space? Uh, well, there's definitely lots of lessons learned, and it's, it's easy to get excited, um, especially talking on a panel like today, um, to hear Nick talk about some of the exciting things um, frameworks like Maker are doing and the new use cases for tokenization. Um, in, in my experience, uh, integrating tokenization and blockchain technology into a pretty established uh, system like the mortgage finance industry and the securitization business that is part of my day-to-day -day existence, um, my primary lesson is that taking an incremental approach um, and establishing proof of concept and generating buy-in from participants is helpful for several different ways. It's, it's easy to focus on the long-term goal and feel like there's a lot of steps to get there. And slowly approaching that long-term goal incrementally over, the, over a period of time allows you to not just show proof of concept, but to generate relationships with people that you'll need to ultimately get there. Um, so people see examples of how tokenization can actually improve their business um, or improve the existing system, and they want to be a part of this innovation. So for example, uh, last year, Redwood uh, in its securitization program was one of the first platforms to integrate blockchain technology into our structured finance reporting. So, what had taken about 60 days after a borrower makes a payment to show to investors, uh, we're now able to, uh, to make that information available essentially the next business day within 30 minutes of being received uh, by our blockchain host. So a borrower makes a payment the next day within 30 minutes of getting the file directly from the servicer. That information is available on chain um, to investors for visibility. So, just that, that proof of concept showing that information can be shared to expedite delivery of what we think is impactful information um, has actually generated a lot of conversations, including one like we're having today, where we can actually point to discrete things that we have been able to achieve and use that to leverage future success. Mm. That's great. So I, I like the idea of kind of starting with that, proving it out, prove out the concept. How do you think about scaling it from there and kind of building the necessary momentum or do you think it builds itself based on the success of a proof of concept? Um, I'd say it's actually both. Um, after we added blockchain to our securitization uh, platform, uh, a number of parties actually reached out to us saying that they would be great partners to help move us to the next step. Um, so while we continue to frame out in our mind tangible use cases to enhance our business um, and to, to continue the discussion with all of our, our counterparts, um, we not only are focused on the long term, but also socializing these concepts, um, talking with loan originators and participants elsewhere in the space, counterparties like investment banks to see how they might be able to use the expedited delivery of payment information in other ways that would benefit their business and ours, for example, in the warehouse financing space. So it's, it's the beginning of a long-term discussion that continues to evolve over time because the technology, as uh, Nick was saying, is just continuing to evolve. So we're kind of at the tip of the iceberg and it's, it's exciting to start the conversation um, and see how it evolves. Great. Uh, Rebecca, I want to turn back to you. So I know Ave is a key player in the DeFi, DeFi space. Yep. And um, when you look at the range of companies that are innovating in this space, uh, can you share some of the applications that you're seeing? Sure. Um, so as it relates to this panel, I sort of jumped the gun and talked about the centrifuge application, uh, and I think that's really important. And as Nick alluded to very early, there have been attempts uh, over the history of the, you know, as the blockchain spaces emerge to tokenize certainly mortgages, other types of property, uh, and the like. I think we're seeing some slight resurgence of that, but starting with different types of assets, although there are definitely still new projects who are looking to bring tokenized mortgages and tokenized 
housing um, and property and stuff like that black back onto the blockchain. I do think one of the things I sort of alluded to earlier, uh, and DeFi for people who aren't as familiar, um, refers to decentralized finance. So it is a way of taking familiar economic concepts and automating them through software. Um, so where you'll say something's a lending protocol and you're used to you know, what a loan looks like, it doesn't look like that when you automate it through software. Same with trading. Um, it's not peer-to-peer, -peer, it's all of this interaction through economic activities with software, so you're always interacting with the software. Um, but the building out of the DeFi system does bring all sorts of new financial primitives into it, and um, we haven't seen a lot of work on real-world assets until probably the last year, would you say, uh, to bring back the resurgence, but DeFi took off so strongly um, probably in the summer of 2020 uh, and uh, had a lot of interest and now there's even more institutional interest we're seeing in DeFi and one of the and we do a lot of educating of financial institutions on what decentralized finance means and how the software and technology works um, because we think that's really important for sort of broad scale adoption and legitimacy but uh, one of the things that institutions talk to us about a lot is tokenizing real world assets how do they bring them on chain and so I do think we will see uh, and I don't have a concrete example to give, you know, in terms of what anybody has done to date, but I do think that's where, a, and your examples are actually really interesting, especially with the proof of concept, but I do think that various financial institutions are experimenting a lot in the DeFi space and will be bringing real world assets onto um, this new economic system that we're building. Great. So Rebecca, I'm going to come back to you uh, to just build on the answer you just had. So. And, and I'd actually like each panelist to weigh in on this question. So as we think about the acceleration curve and we think about uh, the opportunities in this space, what are you predicting for the upcoming year? Uh, I know there's a lot of attention and focus as we talk about tokenization. Uh, and we're also kind of navigating um, an interesting economic time. Will that put a damper on what we expect next year? But love for you to share your thought and then others to weigh in as well. Sure, so I'll give a sort of brief answer on that. I think. As you alluded to, the economy in general is going to have a big shift. And while people used to think that crypto were not correlated assets to the economy, I think we've seen over time that there is some correlation, especially for some of the larger assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum and things like that. Uh, so I think that we'll see a constriction in the markets we already have, especially post some of the larger um, you know, crashes over the past summer. But the other thing I think we're gonna see over the next year, and this is wearing my other, the other part of my hat because I do all of our policy work too, but I think um, in the US, we are gonna see a lot of movement on the policy front as it comes to crypto and blockchain. And hopefully that will bring a lot of security and a lot of clarity, not only for actors in the space, but also for retail users and institutions to continue on with the innovation. So even if we see difficult times in the market, which I think we're all anticipating, I do think that with the regulation and policy coming down in the crypto space, we will see a lot more entrance and a lot more interest and a lot more innovation in building. Great, Jose? Uh, I agree. I think that there are a couple of things there. Obviously, we're in the middle of a, of a crypto winter. Obviously, the market is risk off, as most markets are uh, risk off uh, now, given global uncertainty. For folks who have been around uh, for a while, we have seen this movie before. So this is not the first crypto winter. It will not be the last uh, crypto winter. Same thing that well, a year and a half ago was not the last crypto summer. So the, the market is volatile, it's part of the nature of, of uh, very early stage markets, and we'll see that. I think that what, what, as an industry, many of us are focusing in, which I think is a good use of the time, is the technology is getting more resilient. So if you look at, there has been volatility, there have been bankruptcies. If you look at the operating metrics of the more established blockchains, the Bitcoin and Ethereum, the protocol continue to work. The hashing capacity and computing power of the network is uh, at historical maximums, and those networks did not skip a bit. So the, the, the fundamentals uh, are, have proven to be uh, resilient. There, are, there have been very significant innovations happening now as, as folks are spending time building as opposed to running around what was the, the, the crazy pricing environment of the last year and a half. The merging Ethereum is a very important aspect, both for sustainability of the network, but also for moving to proof of stake and addressing some of the energy consumption uh, concerns around, around proof of work protocols. So there is fundamental work done at the infrastructure level that is happening during this winter. 
And I want to emphasize what, what Rebecca was, was saying in terms of the policy and regulatory aspects. A big, big development over the last year, especially in the, in the US, is that there is a drive to say, hey, what's going to be the regulatory framework of, of the space? It's extremely important for the US to get ahead of that for a while. We have been a little bit running behind uh, Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the MICA as an effort to provide a, a harmonized framework for the European Union. It's a really, really good effort. It's taking longer. Um, I'm European by born, so I'm not surprised that it's, uh, <laughs> European Union developments take a while. Uh, but it's a really important framework. And it's really good to see that the US is, is catching up and developing a, a whole of government approach to regulatory clarity. And if you combine regulatory clarity with the enhancements in the, in the base technology, that's one of the things that I continue to be very optimistic about the space. Thank you. Nick? Yeah, there's two things I'll point out. So one is the general institutionalization of crypto markets, in particular DeFi. Um, and so there's institutionalization in the sense that large asset managers and financial institutions have finally started to dive into this. Uh, BNY Mellon just announced uh, custody for crypto, I think, two days ago. Uh, Fidelity's finally launching a spot product for Bitcoin after, um, as someone who is at Fidelity, I can tell you they've been working on that for seven, eight years now. Um, and uh, BlackRock is now finally launching products for crypto. So there's that institutional institutionalization. But more interesting to me is taking this anarchic, chaotic environment of DeFi and establishing actual boundaries and creating the ability for regulated entities to actually transact in this space uh, safely and in ways such that they can actually be compliant. Uh, and so Anave has been doing uh, you know, good work on this, I would say. Uh, but there is an acknowledgement now that DeFi doesn't necessarily mean permissionless. And I know a lot of crypto people wouldn't like me saying that, basically. <laughs> they think that the whole essence of crypto and DeFi is to be sensor resistant, to tr make transactions you're not meant to make, uh, to make transactions the state doesn't want you to do. But f for better or for worse, we're seeing this infrastructure put to work in uh, a way that it allows for permissioning and for knowing your counterparties and knowing what is the liquidity that you're interacting with. And the establishment of those contours will make the environment much more palatable for the insertion of real world assets. Uh, so that's one thing I'm excited about. The other thing is the tokenization of actual physical products. And so if you look at Nike, they've been doing really pioneering work. But it's very much in the you know, luxury space. So Nike, Adidas, DNG, Gucci. LVMH, all of these brands have now begun to insert um, like actual chips into their merchandise and tie that to NFTs. So basically, the merch becomes inherently linked to the record that lives on the blockchain. And this is exploding in popularity among the established brands. It gives you anti-counterfeiting, it gives you access to secondary markets, um, and it's kind of flown below the radar. Uh, so that is the tokenization of non-securities of physical products, that's actually a really exciting phenomenon for me. Provenance for handbags. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and Kara. Uh, so uh, I'm excited to go last because I will actually bring the conversation uh, back full circle to uh, the mortgage finance industry that we're all here to talk about. So I'll pick up on uh, a point that <laughs> Director Thompson made and that I made, uh, I made actually earlier that that technologies like blockchain and tokenization really have a, really offer an opportunity to improve uh, the loan origination process for borrowers and in the secondary market. And we saw in 2021 just pretty extreme volume in the mortgage industry and, and being tied to legacy processes that are manual and redundant and rely on things like paper and FedEx actually became a stumbling block to the ability for traditional uh, finance parties, so TradFi like myself, to actually transact with the efficiency that we wanted. It took longer to originate a loan. It was harder to buy and sell it given all of the uh, inefficiencies in the market. So. This, this, the fact that there is, I'm not breaking any news here, lower volume in the mortgage finance industry this year has given parties that are active in, in integrating this technology the opportunity to socialize, as Rebecca was saying, the, the use cases for technology and the benefits of technology panels like, uh, like the one Chris has put together yesterday and today help keep uh, the integration of technology front of mind on leaders across the industry. So 
it's been a great period of time to look at, at what challenges were faced when there was extreme volume and then take this pause to continue the education campaign and think about how that technology can help make the process more efficient when it picks up. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of our panel discussion. I want to thank my panelists, Kara, Nick, Rebecca, and Jose for the great conversation. Thank you all for sharing your expertise and insights. Uh, and with that being said, we're done. So we have a short break until 11.15. Thank you. All right, so we are now going to, to go to move to a really awesome, super cool session that I personally have been very excited about. It's a session on something that's a little bit hard. It's called decentralized identity. And it's one of those concrete use cases for uh, the area of blockchain that can actually do some real things, particularly when it comes to financial inclusion, but yet it's really, really, really tough and hard to understand. So I am really uh, just delighted to have some people who are going to help break it all down. I am a professor, so we're gonna be a little professorial. Uh, and we're gonna start off with uh, uh, Kim Hamilton, who is the Director of Identity Standards at Center, uh, to give a little bit of a primer over presentation, and then followed uh, by a, a wonderful panel to help talk about the presentation and hopefully make things a little bit, to demystify of sorts, decentralized identity um, for both housing experts and those of you really interested in those issues of inclusion and the like. So Kim, uh, come on and welcome to the stage. <laughs> Hi, so I'm here to talk about how decentralized identity works. There we go. Uh, just beneath the surface of many of the problems we've been discussing are identity challenges. How do we prevent fraudulent or sanctioned users from transacting? And how do we balance that with the need to reduce friction for legitimate users? How do we avoid doxing or leaking personal data for our users? We're here to talk about a new approach that offers improved outcomes for individuals. That includes convenience, privacy, and ultimately a path towards more equitable access. So decentralized identity, as Chris said, that doesn't sound quite right from a consumer perspective that describes an architecture or an approach. So we're going to pull a slide of hand and for this demo and uh, discussion call it self-managed identity, just as a start. And we'll show a demo basically to show the consumer experience. And we want to call out that this, this demo is pulled from components from DeFi deployments happening now. So uh, yesterday, Jeremy Allaire mentioned Verity and uh, Circle, MetaMask Institutional, and more are deploying some DeFi solutions based on decentralized identity standards. But what we're going to do is apply it to traditional finance scenarios. And so we're here to ask the question, how do we roll these approaches out more broadly? And we'll discuss that in the panel. Digital identity, put very simply, is an attempt to represent who we are online or in remote interactions, such as online banking. But the problem is that the rails or infrastructure that we need for trustworthy interactions online are missing, or more simply, the internet was built without an identity layer. Yet organizations and institutions we interact with online need to know who we are. So you can think of this as divided into two phases, onboarding, so we share a bunch of information, identity information about ourselves, and this is where organizations are asking, who are you? And then afterwards, we have authentication, are you who you claim to be? And that relies on knowing something or some um, other kinds of patterns, but traditionally, and. Uh, certainly in the early phases, we relied on usernames and passwords. And so that's where you see this uh, login, and um, you do this, or you did this in the original days for each organization or service provider you interact with. So we call it centralized because all of your identity data is centralized on this institution that you're interacting with. 
and you have to trust that each of them can safeguard your data and uh, not, not uh, manage to leak your usernames and passwords. But that turns out to be very risky, both for individuals and organizations. Password fatigue, as you know, is very real. So uh, uh, this is the you are here spot with federated identity. And you will be most familiar with it through single sign-on or login with XYZ. And in this model, this lets organizations trust someone else, an organization who's also acting as identity provider to manage this information. And this does offer convenience and security for both individuals and organizations. Organizations don't want to have to manage these password databases. But on the downside, identi these identity providers better get it right, because if they get hacked, then people are getting access to everything. But at the same time, we have mitigations, and that's getting better in terms of multi-factor authentication or biometrics or you know, something where you get a text saying, here's your code to confirm it's really you. Um, but there are still downsides, and the things that we want to call out are only basic reuse is possible in this model. So if you want to go sign up for similar services in the future, you're still providing all of that raw identity data. You're still filling out all the same forms. And the important thing here is that the incentives really pull towards platform lock-in. Um, all of these organizations you interact with, they want that data. And there's little incentive for them in general to let you leave and go somewhere else. So this ultimately leads towards fragmentation. But new, sides, uh, new downsides get introduced as well. So um, your identity data online has this whole lifespan that you aren't really aware of disconnected from you. New parties like data brokers get involved. and. Um, Basically, with single sign-on, these identity providers and other forms of tracking, they can paint a really complete picture of your online activities. And that's appealing to advertisers, of course. So uh, your personal data is vulnerable and very valuable to data brokers who can take your data, mark it up, resell it to others. And at any point along the way, hackers are very incentivized to try to find these sources of, of data and, and take it for themselves. So a digital identity report card, card from a financial consumer perspective doesn't look that great. Um, I'm going to focus on just a specific one here, which is that the assurance offered through these mechanisms is unidirectional. All of this identity data you provided allows organizations to decide to trust you, but you don't get to know who you're interacting with. You're not offered the same trust in return. So we're very vulnerable to phishing attacks, identity theft, and ultimately all these costs and inefficiencies get passed on to us. So self-managed identity, which you may know as decentralized identity or in earlier days, self-sovereign identity, is the alternative that we want to describe. It's based on open standards. In this model, instead of being organization or service provider centric, this is people centric. So people get, the, uh, get to custody their identity data and choose who they share it with. And the data is uh, contained in this wrapper that we call verifiable credentials. It's a W3C standard. So in this model, issuers issue credentials directly to people who can manage them in wallets of their choice. So this is all standards-based. And so they can choose which wallets they use. And then people go to interact with organizations who act as verifiers, and these verifiers can request the identity data that they need. People share it directly to the verifiers, and verifiers can independently verify that the credentials haven't been tampered with and that they're authentic, or in other words, issued by the issuer that was expected. So again, this is all enabled by open standards. And uh, in contrast to uh, what many people think about it, blockchain is not required. These standards are natively off-chain. So we're going to show a quick demo of um, Amanda, who's been a customer for 10 years at her local community bank, First Community Bank. And she's going to request a KYC 
credential from uh, First Community Bank. And uh, this demo is pulled from, from uh, Verity. So what happens is Amanda, sorry, one second, on the right-hand side um, is, is um, the First Community Bank. So Amanda's logged into First Community Bank and they say, okay, we've KYC'd you. Um, do you wanna take your KYC credential with you um, to, uh, to use elsewhere? And so on the left, we have Amanda with her her credential wallet, and we're gonna say for purposes of this demo that she's using it in her mobile device, but she could have it in a variety of form factors. It could be a browser plugin. So um, the, the first community bank shows this QR code, Amanda scans with her, uh, with her phone, and it asks, to, uh, it asks for her permission to um, request a credential. She clicks yes. And then we see that she gets the credential in her wallet. Now, what's important to note here is that this credential doesn't contain any raw personal data about Amanda. It doesn't contain her social security number, her mailing address. It just contains that First Community has performed KYC checks on Amanda, and then she has it in her wallet, and she can take it and share it with whom she chooses. Now, in the next step, she's gonna share her credential with a mortgage lender, and this is where we're asking you to suspend disbelief uh, for traditional finance use cases. So, again, these are based on Verity, which are being deployed right now in DeFi, um, for example, to, to allow DeFi pools to de-risk. Um, and so, we're showing this, and we mapped it to a traditional finance use case, and in the panel, we wanna discuss what, what does it take to make this happen. So same experience here. Amanda is now at, um, at Trust Mortgage, and they say, have you, they ask her, if you've been KYC'd already, we can take proof from it and say they trust First, uh, first Community to, to do that. So same uh, form factor, they ask her to scan a uh, QR code. Her wallet bundles up all this information and passes it along. Now, if the wallet has pre-selected the eligible credentials and um, has confirmed, and uh, she she gives her consent, and um, so now first commu uh, uh, sorry trust mortgage can prompt her to go through the next steps. So they take her word that uh, they take. First Nationals word that she, or First Communities word that she's been KYC'd, and she can go on to next steps. So in summary, First Community issued a KYC credential directly to Amanda's wallet. She takes it and she shares it with Trust Mortgage, and it didn't contain any raw personal data. Now, it's also important to note that that may not be realistic. In general, they may be looking for more information, that she's filed her taxes, um, uh, proof of, of uh, payment history, and so these standards support zero-knowledge proofs or data minimization methods so that Trust Mortgage can ask for exactly what they need. Now, Amanda's wallet handles all these details for her, so her wallet can uh, gather up the credentials they need, select the attributes, and share them in a verifiable way, but they'll also prompt Amanda before passing along any sensitive data. Uh, so as we mentioned, verifiable credentials, it's a flexible format. It can store KYC credentials, uh, credit uh, proof of reliable payment history. Um, it can be issued by government agencies like driver's license, social security number, your degree, or online course completion. Um, the important thing to note, though, is that this uh, verify, these verifiable rails that we're building allow informal credentials to be passed or new signals of trustworthiness that you've paid your, your utility bills on time. Um, and so that's one method that we're really excited about for opening up new um, opportunities. And this is enabled by public open standards. So just like the internet is based on interoperable standards, decentralized identity standards provide a user-centric solution for the internet's missing identity layer. And now I'll call on Justin to lead our panel.
Thank you, Kim. That was a fantastic presentation. Always a privilege to be up on the stage with you. Also joining me is Linda Jing, who is the Chief Regulatory Officer and General Counsel of the Crypto Council for Innovation. I'm biased. I think it's the best crypto uh, trade association out there, but I serve on their board, so I have to say that. And then Mike <laughs> Mosier, who's General Counsel of Expresso, which is a privacy-focused blockchain. I'm Justin Slaughter. I'm the Policy Director at Paradigm, and I am definitely the weakest link on this panel, so I will try my best to explain uh, the wisdom we have on this stage. So let's just kick it off to start with. Kim, great presentation. The one thing I'm still trying to grapple with is what is the definition of self-managed or decentralized identities? Well, how do you put it into an elevator pitch of 20 words? Right, um, I would say it very briefly as the ability for uh, individuals to manage and control their data, who they share it with. It doesn't necessarily mean that individuals have to directly um, own or custody their data. They can still use traditional methods that are used now, but it pits the individual back in control of their data, who they share it with, and reduces friction, privacy, and interoperability. So in many ways, it answers one of the fundamental problems of the internet, which is we have allowed these few giant firms to become dominant behemoths in this space. It you know restores the power to the user, it democratizes it. So, obvious following question, why is this important? Mike, why do you think this is important? Well, I think it's, it's very important um, for, for a number of reasons, but one of them that was foundational to me to, to joining Espresso Systems to build configurable privacy that would allow for this sort of verifiable credentials to be seamless with digital assets was coming out of being the, the director of FinCEN uh, and, and working with victims of crime and a mission to sort of counter exploitation a big issue was not just catching bad guys afterwards, it was <laughs> preventing uh, victims to begin with. Uh, and what Kim laid out is far more secure than what we have today. I mean, we were getting reports at FinCEN of 5,000 account takeovers a month, that some of that was up to $400 million worth of people's accounts being taken over. Um, what Kim's describing is a way that you're, you're preserving that privacy, but you're allowing for the verifiability so that, that financial institutions can manage risk. This gets to a key point that I know those of us who've been in the bowels of the government know, but many people don't. It's a question not of why are we trying all these new innovations, but the need is because the current system is so crazy, no one believes you when you tell them we have terrible protection for privacy, we have terrible standards of data. Um, <laughs> obvious question then, you know, why is it we tolerate this world? Like everyone here, right? Everyone else, I suspect, had to check in today with all the technology in front of us with a tiny piece of laminate plastic <laughs> given by government. Where if you lose this in a taxi, if you lose this in an airplane, you are unpersoned for days. Yeah. It's amazing to think about that we allow this. Yeah. Why is it that this doesn't get more attention from the government? It's just, is it hard? Is it too, too complex without the private sector charging ahead? Well, I think it, it has gotten uh, attention from the government, but it's taken a long time for both the technological innovation to have to catch up to the speed of transactions, which it's now at. Um, and, and actually, I would say FinCEN, is, as long ago as 2004, put out an FAQ about the customer identification program saying you don't have to have documentary evidence at a bank. It can be, a, it actually says a digital credential. Um, but there's a convergence of, one, the cryptography at the speed of transactions, which, which Kim's explained is there. But I think the other piece is that, um, you know, part of it is also aligning the prudential regulators with, with other core folks in the policy space that may have said, we really need to move this forward, um, and getting everybody on board, including, you know, as, as Kim said, there's a lot of entrenched private sector interest in sort of maintaining the status quo. So you said regulation. I've got to bring Linda to this point. Linda, how is it that we need to approach this? Because this is bigger than just any you know, number even of the myriad financial regulators, the alphabet soup. This would involve, it seems like, things as far afield as the FCC, potentially as uh, the FTC, the White House, everywhere. How is it the regulators need to approach this to ensure this industry is allowed to grow in a safe and responsible way for consumers and investors? So f firstly, we need to acknowledge that we are at a critical point in history. We are becoming a true digital economy, and that means it would only work if we have 
a digital identity that works. And how we construct digital identity today will affect how our digital economy and our market structure will look in the future for our children. And here is an, an opportunity for us to stop and examine, uh, and I would like to ask all of you, who has problems remembering their passwords? Like, raise your hands, please. Raise them honestly, come on. <laughs> I'll follow it up. How many of you have broken the sin of then writing down your passwords in your phone, which is the one thing you're not supposed to do? I certainly do it. Not in my current job, but yeah, I've done it before. I, yeah, I, I even, I have to say, uh, earlier today, I, I realized I'd forgotten to renew my DC bar membership <laughs> and to find that I was locked out of the website because a DC bar decided to uh, revoke me. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the point is, Right now, all, um, uh, all our digital identity processes are based on usernames and passwords, which are stored in internal databases by organizations that we have relationships with. And I would say that's the Web 2 environment. And now we're moving into the Web 3 environment where we, as the individual, should start being able to control our own digital assets. And this means that we need to start thinking about what are our digital values and how can they be enshrined in data rights or digital rights? And how should Congress think about what should be the legal rights that we as citizens and residents of the United States should have over our own data? So this is like a very fundamental rethink of um, data and personal data, but it's extremely important because our economy is going to be driven by data. So I'll, I'll stop there. Information is power. I mean, this is the thing, Kim. It does strike me that it'd be very easy to see one more level of data brokers. You mentioned SSOs. You mentioned all these systems that kind of built upon the previous system to once again centralize. How is it that standards need to get set in a way that ensures that doesn't happen this time? Right. I think that what's unique about these approaches is that every layer of the technical stack, um, which is just one part of this really important problem I want to call out, but um, each part is really built around the individual and their ability to custody their own data. So I think some great points were made yesterday about assumptions of technology and devices, say, you know, maybe assumptions that we made that you use it on the latest model of um, an iPhone is not reasonable for deployment in Africa. And so all of these, uh, all of these uh, knobs along the way are layered so that um, you can really build and adapt for um, your local communities. And so I think that what's important here is that benefits the user and their ability to um, have portability of their data, interoperability, um, but then also the ability to um, you know, choose which devices that they want to use. And I think the last thing on that is that, you know, so decentralized identity has been around for a while, sort of more at the fringes. And what's been great about Web3 uh, developments is that the connect with wallet kind of experience where you show up with your wallet and say, you know, the, the um, service provider doesn't need to know anything about you besides about your your wallet. Now that's an overly reductive um, uh, way to describe who we are, uh, just your, your wallet account. But what we're talking about really is the sort of technical details, the cryptography and that experience. Um, but it also points to how we need to work harder. So right now, if you lose your seed phrase uh, for that wallet, you lose all your crypto. And so how do we, we don't want to do that with identity data as well. So um, it also points to the ongoing challenges. Right. There's a need for a belt and suspenders system that allows people to do what we all do, which is make mistakes. Yeah. But you brought up the international element. I think that's pretty critical. I look at this kind of system and it strikes me that it's exactly opposite to what we are seeing from China, from other countries which would be de described, I think, as authoritarian, it in many ways defeats the ability of those systems, I would say, to export their centralized, non-democratic data system to the rest of the world. Mike, what do you think about this? 
Well, I think it's, I mean, I think it's an important part of the sort of resilience that people talk about in the Web3 space. And, and, and coming from FinCEN and before that OFAC and Department of Justice, um, where we were working with victims under authoritarian regimes and, cor and very corrupt regimes, I think it's important, uh, it is a distinguishing feature of the US that, that, that the Treasury Department authorized money uh, in the form of USDC to go to healthcare workers in Venezuela. And that does not work to send it under an authoritarian government to the cent through the central bank um, to the to the political dissidents, or in this case, not even political dissidents. They're healthcare workers. Um, that only works in a resilient space like this, um, where you can send it to a wallet that's been identified by tr by trusted parties. But it doesn't mean that it went to the bank that then is is basically confiscated. I think one lesson we've all learned over the last thirty to forty years of tech development is that. Power and centralization corrupts eventually. The best thing, rather than to assume the next level of centralized power will do better, is to prevent it from ever having that power in the first place. But let's turn to an obvious question. Part of the problem with any new tech is finding the right time for the government to step in and establish standards. You move too late, things are chaotic. It's too potentially past the moment where you get regulation. You move too soon, you kill off the innovation. Are we at the point where we need standards from the government on these issues, or do we need to keep waiting a bit longer? And I'll open that to the entire panel, but Linda, you're looking at me. Yeah, I would <laughs> love to take this question because, one, uh, we, I, I see three pillars that are important to, to adopt and, and implement. One is we need to empower the individual to be able to port his or her data to whom, you know, whomever um, he or she wishes. And so that empowerment, that data portability is extremely important. But so is having open standards that are interoperable. Um, you, you raised China earlier as a potential you know, alternative, but we need to look actually at ourselves here in the US. Um, currently, um, various DMVs um, in various states are working with Apple and Google to develop mobile driver licenses, which is very exciting. However, the standard that Apple and Google are developing um, is for a closed wallet, which means uh, only Apple and Google will get to see whatever um, transactions um, you make um, using your, your MDL. That and it's is, not like people can choose whether or not to use them if they want to be part of this economy in many ways, right? That's right. If, yeah, if I want to buy my beer, I, you know, my drink at the bar, I think I, I'm going to have to use Google or, or Apple. I don't think this is the kind of digital economy we want to build. And so I uh, think that we need, um, here in the States, also have to consider, you know, what are the potential antitrust and considerations um, towards the market we're building in? So, I will stop again before I keep going. But yeah, this is extremely, such an extremely important issue. And yes, I have um, some ideas on that as well. So we've seen great leadership from Anil John at Department of Homeland Security, Sharon Liu uh, starting when she was at US Department of Education in terms of how government can support interoperability um, through very uh, practical means of test suites. So we're saying these are open interoperable standards, prove it to us. Uh, develop the test suites that demonstrate that um, from a user perspective and build them. So I think those are things that I really like to see. Um, we're you know, building open standards. We want uh, kind of variation competition. At the same time, these are promoting convergence that we need from a, um, a consumer perspective. So to, you know, it's worth noting the Fed is itself working on this with Fed ID, to my knowledge. But that is very, uh, I think, in its infancy still. Obvious question, what is the role for the U.S. here versus the rest of the world in particular? This strikes me as something where it's going to be critical for the U.S. to lead, but in a way that brings Europe, the U.K., Japan along with them. Mm -hmm. And is this at a point, though, where other countries are as focused on it as the U.S.? I'm being looked at here. Um, well, you're the international expert. <laughs> yeah, well, I think everyone has different cultural values. If you, if you travel, you will see that um, national IDs, for example, is probably uh, taken as the norm in many European countries and certainly in, in Asian countries. But I don't think we would ever have a national ID that would be popular here in the US. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then how about 
identity solutions that I, as the individual, can control because it's about it's actually my relationships with my bank, with my university, with my employer, with my child's school, <laughs> you know, my utility. But all this, these are actually my relationships. It should be under my control, not under these respective organizations' control. Yeah, I just want to add to that that I think it's a, because you asked about the timing, it's now, uh, and I think this is from a government perspective as well. Like when we were, uh, when I was at FinCEN and we were working through the, the Paycheck Protection Plan and getting economic impact payments out, there, was, there were people losing the opportunity to get any of these economic impact payments because their KYC was not portable. <laughs> it turned out their community bank was not connected to the Fed system, and if you're not connected to the Fed network, you weren't going to get the payments, which means you go to a new bank, you start from scratch. It's a high-risk time, so it's actually slower to get your KYC. Um, and here's an opportunity to make it portable, but also far more resilient because instead of just your social security number, which we know have been compromised by the billions, um, here's all these sort of micro-credentials and other indicators, um, and it can be done in a way that instead of disclosing it yet again and creating a vulnerability, you're actually doing it in a zero-knowledge way um, and or selective disclosure that minimizes it. Like, there's such a chance to lead in the resilience of it, which is in a far more democratic and foundational to the U.S. And it's worth noting, not only does it take years for the government to move on something as complicated as this, but you're never going to know when you're going to need this. If we'd had this level of system built out in March 2020, yep. there would have been a much better response to CARES, to getting people the aid they need in a safe way that didn't involve leaks or loss of information. Yep. We're at time. This has been a great panel. Thank you, everyone, for your attention on this fascinating topic. I'm going to kick it over to a brief video interlude, and then we'll be back with a new panel. of home buyers, renters, from becoming homeowners. Not even knowing where to start, that's what stops them. HomeView is a consumer-centered learning educational platform used by first-time home buyers, second home buyers, third home buyers. It provides historically underserved consumers finally an opportunity to access the tools and resources that they can use with their trusted advisors to help them navigate what could otherwise be a very complicated and confusing process. We're really excited about the HomeView product. It's really easy to access. You need an internet connection, that's it. No application is required. You go to the site and you begin the process of getting the insights you need to increase your financial literacy and to put you in a position to move forward in the home ownership process. It's intuitive, seamless to use, and it provides education throughout the home buyer journey. This interesting intersection between digital literacy and financial literacy has unlocked so much opportunity. To address the educational needs, we have to leverage the digital capabilities that are available. And that's why we are investing heavily in our digital capabilities that create the type of solutions that will drive financial literacy. I don't know too many home buyers are gonna to go to the library to go figure out how to get financially smart and be better prepared to look for their first home, get the mortgage financing option that they need that best suits their family. What I love about HomeView is you can go where HomeView is or HomeView can go to you 24-7, 365, and what's even more powerful about it, it's built in terms that are consumable and consumer friendly. Not a lot of big jargon. If the black homeownership gap were to close today, that represents about 4.7 million more black renters that we would need to convert to become homeowners. We believe that technology is going to be an important enabler in helping to close the housing gap and to implement simple solutions that meet the needs of our consumers to drive uh, an increase in education and position of uh, consumers to participate in the home ownership process. We think it starts with technology. Uh, 
you know, when it, when it comes to financial literacy, uh, it's a discussion in the city, in the country, that has a lot of prominence, especially with what's happening in the economy. And for that, I am just delighted to have this next um, panel, particularly you know, for the reporters. There are lots of reporters who are also uh, visiting. You should pay a lot of attention to what's going on here, because the conversation about what is financial literacy, how it should be understood, what does digital literacy mean? Does that impact how we should think about financial literacy? I mean, these are the kinds of things that are driving policy, and it's the kind of, kinds of things that uh, our, our media community should also be very well aware of. So with that, uh, I am excited about uh, welcoming to stage uh, the uh, next group, along with Steve James, uh, the Vice President of Marketing over at Fannie Mae, who is passionate about these ideas, along with the other panelists. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, welcome to everyone in the room. Welcome to those of you who are watching this virtually uh, for this important panel on financial literacy. Let me begin by introducing our panelists. Uh, on the end, we have Kier Gomes, Chief Legal Officer at Broad Ridge Financial Solutions. Next to Kier, we have May Watson Groat, founder and CEO of Change Machine a nonprofit organization dedicated to building financial security for people in low-income communities. Uh, then we have Ben Miller, founder and CEO of Fundrise, a real estate investment platform that empowers the individual. And then finally, next to me, we have B. Doyle Mitchell, Jr., president and CEO of Industrial Bank, and current board member and former chairman of the National Bankers Association. Welcome to all of you. So Doyle, I think we can start with you. Uh, given your positions both at Industrial Bank and at the MBA, for, for those of you who don't know, the MBA's very purpose is to support and strengthen America's minority-owned and operated banks. So what does financial literacy mean for you and for the MBA? Well, it means everything, because the, primarily uh, the communities that we serve, uh, there is a gap. There's plenty of income, racial wealth gaps in this country. And, Education is, is definitely one of them, and it's, it's, it's sort of the lifeblood for a lot of our, our members at the MBA, and we take it very seriously. We need to educate our customers and our community on how to buy a home, how to save, how to invest, and so forth. How do you do some of that education on the ground? What does it look like? Uh, it looks like us going into a variety of organizations, into churches, into schools, um, into other nonprofits that uh, want to bring in an institution like ours to, to educate its members. And we go in we, with uh, a variety of programs. If it's a business related program, home ownership related program, uh, or just the ABCs. And we do it from, you know, with, in groups of young people, uh, seniors, and those are all in the middle. It's never, it's never too late for financial education, never. is it? Um, ben, I'll turn to you. Fundrise is a company built on online investing. So maybe I should ask you to describe what you do and then a little bit about your thoughts of financial literacy. So Fundrise uh, democratizes investing into real estate. Before we started Fundrise, individuals really couldn't invest in real estate. It was mostly institutions and um, super high net worth investors. So we sort of tore down those barriers. I mean, I, if you look about, at our business, it's essentially the mission is financial inclusion, right? Why should people be excluded from investing in, in um, real estate? It just doesn't make sense. We have 1.6 million users, so we, we, and we touch 50 million people a month, something like that. So we really have a lot of reach. And that, in order to do that, basically, you really have to be able to talk to people across multiple channels, multiple kinds of media, and that means you have to you have to make sure someone understands what they're what they're investing in before they do, and we've done that with a lot of different kinds of content. I mean, this has been there's been such a proliferation of content, TikTok, you know, Instagram, 
blogs, long form white papers. And so it's, it's the key is to, to meet people where they are and not expect them to come to you looking for financial education. So as, as you think about financial education, you talk about this you know, in, inclusion, inclusion, how does that relate? How does that relate to the inclusion that you're offering? So it's interesting, when we started Fundrise, we wanted to democratize investing, right? Include more people into this asset class. And in the beginning, right, a lot of institutions were actually skeptical. It's like interesting thing, like no one I think is actually against financial, financial inclusion in theory, but in practice, Institutions have a lot of status quo bias, are afraid of taking risk. You know, if they're going to lend on to somebody in order to perpetuate sort of more financial inclusion, they're taking the risk, but society's getting the benefit. So I had, I mean, one of the largest law firms in the country ask me, why would I bother with a little guy? Right? Like there was really a, a, a lot of um, concern or fear in in basically the idea of financial inclusion. It was it was something that it, you know, the banks that we started with, you know, this is 10 years ago, um, were, were, thought it was risky. And you know, now we have whatever, 20,000 apartment units, so it's, it, it, it's, we got past that. But in practice, there's really a big gap between how institutions basically manage risk and how they, how they actually also perpetuate status quo legacy problems. That's it, it, so important. Um, so May, let's turn to you. You're working to help those in low-income communities, and you're dealing with financial literacy through people who engage and coach them, right? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about Change Machine and how you view financial literacy? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation, too. Um, I founded uh, Change Machine 17 years ago, but only recently, in like the last five or six years, became a fintech organization. Um, providing professionalization services to practitioners, social service practitioners. So they can run the gamut of um, a wide range of nonprofit services, but then also government agencies and some um, for profits as well. Um, and so as a community of practice, we have 7,000 practitioners from across the country, um, from about 600 organizations. Um, and we are a nonprofit, and our mission and our vision is very much focused on closing the gender and racial wealth gap. Um, but as a social enterprise, we do that through commercial means. Um, and so it's all about uh, really a double bottom line for us, that we want to be able to um, be profitable as well. Yeah, so how do social workers use, or those that you're, you're um, having coach, those who need that coaching, how do they use the change machine? Mm -hmm. We have several different products inside of the community of practice. Um, first and foremost, it's a social networking um, component that allows practitioners from across the country to share best practices, um, celebrate their successes, uh, affect better strategies, and compare those notes with one another, and constantly get better at what they do. Um, there is also a component called Learn, which is about the skill building, the actual financial education helping them build their own skills, because it does meeting customers where they're at. That definitely starts with the practitioners as well. Um, and then we're also deploying a range of like coaching strategies, um, helping really elevate the work from um, like a literacy and educational context to more like an advocacy one. Um, and then it's also a content management system. So practitioners are um, taking lots of information from the communities that they serve, um, household budgets, how much debt people are in, what kind of savings plan they should be on, what is their passionately held, um, asset-driven, forward-thinking financial goal, and then mapping a trajectory between the two. Um, and then finally, there's also a recommendation engine. So we're also offering, um, we're bringing together inclusive products and services to offer them to the communities that the practitioners serve at the right time and the right place. Uh, that's re really interesting and a great, great overview of a lot of pieces of what yeah. you're doing. Um, so Kier, let me turn to you. You've spoken both personally and professionally about financial literacy. What does it mean to you? Sure. You know, first of all, I enjoy I, I agreed with what was said earlier about it being everything. I, I you you literally took that right out of my nose. We're on the same page. It is everything, and I mean that really when I think about two dimensions. The first is. I'm going to focus on a more personal level first, which is I think about my family members. You know, I think about not just my parents, my cousins, many of whom are, aren't particularly financially literate, 
uh, and the communities in which they, they live and, and work, and how important it is for them to understand all of the investment-related decisions that need to be made, understand how bank accounts work and how savings works and that sort of thing. And that's important, not just to my family, but also when I think about from a societal perspective, how important it is that we have an educated uh, community that understands how to invest, how to save, that sort of thing. And so when we talk about the idea of it being everything, it really is because it's not just important to us individually, but as a country, as a society, as a global citizen, you need the world's communities to be more educated around financial literacy. And so I think, I think it's super critical. I am also a disclosure lawyer, and I know we're gonna talk a little bit about the role that disclosure plays in financial literacy, and I'll just put a teaser in, which is most of my life's work, which is putting around, putting together disclosures for public companies and startups, et cetera, is useless if people don't understand what it is that they're being handed. And so for that personal reason, I think financial literacy is really important. So that's a, a really interesting intersection between disclosure and financial literacy. Um, how do you think about it even deeper for consumers that don't understand both? Well, again, looking at my family, I, so I used to work at the SEC, and one of the, and when I was in the chief counsel's office uh, at the SEC, I would get these calls from my dad. I don't know if he's watching, I'm sorry for putting you on blast. My dad would call and say, hey, Kira, I'm, I'm thinking about investing in this particular penny stock. I'm like, Dad, that's a really bad idea. By the way, never call me at work about that. Never. <laughs> but the point is, but the point is, it's an illustration of how people will make day-to-day -day decisions around which financial service provider I use, which investment I make, which bank account I open up, without adequate understanding of what, it is, what the, the implications of that decision, how to make the decision, the right tools, and so forth. And so, in my, in my mind, it's something that, that everyone that's a participant in the financial services industry, whether it be in the real estate context, the banking context, or, or focusing on particular communities, we, we all have a stake in increasing that level of literacy across the communities that we serve. Great. So Doyle, uh, turn to you. You mentioned the, the racial wealth gap, which is in, it's something that um, obviously there's many challenges that um, are perpetuating that. But where does financial literacy fit into helping? Well, I mean, you can't build wealth unless you have a certain amount of knowledge about investing in uh, savings. And before you get to investing, you need to know how to save. Uh, you should know how to buy a home. Um, if you don't have any idea how to buy a home, you might might uh, buy the wrong mortgage product that we saw a whole lot, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And uh, those things are very hard to come by or, or come back from. So um, um, in, in order to, you know, close the wealth gap, most Americans buy a home. You know, rates go up a few points and everybody thinks you can't buy a home anymore. Well, that's not true. Maybe you can't buy as much as you used to be able to buy, but, um, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to wait three, four more years before you start your way to start accumulating wealth through home ownership? I would say not. I would say, you know, maybe just buy something that's a, a little more affordable rather than, rather than wait. Yeah. So when do you think the best time is for that financial education and financial literacy? As soon as possible, as soon as you come out the womb. <laughs> you know, as, as soon as you can understand savings, and that's, that's, that's where, we, what, where we taught our, our children, start saving. You know, no matter what we give you, save some of it. And uh, to, today, they're, they're, they're probably better savers than me, maybe. Um, so it starts early, should start early, should start in the school, should start in the homes. So, so I'm hearing everything and early. Um, let's see, Kieran and Ben, I'm going to turn to both of you. A big challenge is that underserved households are less likely to own homes and even less likely to own financial assets. What does the need to own assets and diversify those assets mean for companies like yours that are portals to that investment, but also portals to the investment risk? You want me to go first? Okay. So uh, just 30 seconds on Broadridge to, to put my, content, my comments in context. So we're a financial services technology firm. We basically help banks and brokers as well as companies and mutual funds connect with investors. And so the example that I would give you, if you've ever gotten a proxy and you get it from Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley or whomever it is, many times that email, that communication came from us. When you return the proxy, we, you play a role in receiving it, processing it, and translating the, the information. And so from a business perspective, it's really important to us that people understand all of the things that we're talking about today. 
In terms of our what we're doing specifically and, and around the racial um, kind of asset divide, right, in front of, is one of the uh, partnerships that we have is with SIFMA, and it's uh, with respect to this uh, idea of the stock game, which is basically a program that they've created to educate uh, younger communities, to your point about r right out of the womb. Uh, we might aren't starting quite that early, but if you're an elementary school student uh, participating in these programs, what the stock game is really intended to do is educate you about how the stock market operates. And the idea is that if you start early and you educate people about stocks and bonds and how they work and, and brokers and financial advisors and all of the participants in the process, by the time that people get to the point where they actually have some assets to invest, they now are educated enough that they can add, uh, that they can invest them wisely. So that's one big piece of it. And then the other piece of it, frankly, goes to the broader topic of DEI, which is when I look around the financial services industry, I see still in 2022 a dearth of black and brown people sitting around the room and women, by the way. I mean, I I, 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 would, I always have this discussion. Many of my clients were on Wall Street. I'd go to New York to have these meetings with the investment bankers, and nine times out of the ten, out of ten, I was the only brown person in the room, and probably seven or eight times out of ten, there were no women in the room. That's a real problem. And I think when you you could talk about financial literacy, but you also have to talk about putting people in places and roles wh where they can contribute. And by the way, actually have some assets to be able to invest. And so, well, I think those two concepts are both equally important. So. You know, you know, our mission is basically inclusion, and many people can't afford to buy homes. Many people uh, are worried about investing. Worried about investing, and so we learned over the last ten years the key is to lower the barriers. And it's not just you know, technological or regulatory. It's um, you know we now have over half a million women investors. In the beginning, we had it was something like twenty percent or eighteen percent women. Now it's almost fifty-fifty, almost parity. Huh. Why? We, we lowered the barriers because often it's a, it's a feeling of confidence. It's a feeling of like, oh, I'm going to make a mistake. I don't want to look, I don't wanna look like I made a mistake. And I think that the challenge with the idea of creating more education done wrong is it actually makes people less secure. And the best way to learn is by doing. So we said you lower the barriers, lower the stakes. So for $10, you can invest in real estate on Fundrise in maybe 30 seconds. And then the process of being an investor is what educates you. It's, it's you, know, you get investor updates, you get information about construction and financing and business plans, and you're invested, literally, so you're basically learning by doing. And, and so we found by lowering the barriers, uh, I, I'm talking about women in particular, but it is, we're, we have a very, very diverse investor base, probably way more diverse and way younger than, than most people in finance. And, and we and we were able to do that by basically making it. I mean, at ten dollars, essentially, it's almost risk-free. I mean, it's so low risk. You can basically get understanding and and make progress in the same way anybody actually does in real life by going out and doing it. That's really interesting. So a lot of the education we talk about is you know kind of in classroom, theoretical. But what you're saying is you're also encouraging that real life, real world, world education with a lower risk um, of of you know of failure. Yeah, I mean you know like we're about to go into a downturn, and, I, and I'm like terrific. It's been too long, right? That people learn by basically making mistakes. People don't learn from success more or less. They only learn from failure. And so the sooner you make the mistakes, the better. Learn at 22. Make all the mistakes possible at age 22, not 62. So, and so that's basically like um, it's a little bit more fintech model, right? Embrace the risk, because by trying to avoid the risk, you actually create more barriers than you realize. You brought up a potential economic downturn. What do others think about you know, if we're going into a harder time for the economy, uh, the importance of financial literacy, and what, what changes about financial literacy? Um, I, I'm not sure anything changes because you, you, you constantly need to learn. You constantly need to learn. Possibly going into a downturn, you need to understand that the dynamics around you are going to change. And so um, what do I do in a downturn? You know, um, do I go into this investment or that investment? I mean, I, I can't imagine the stock market's going to go too much further down, but <laughs> maybe it does, but it's probably a pretty good time to, in, to invest. Uh, probably in a mutual fund if you want to talk about diversification. 
Um, is it a good time to buy a home? Well, rates are up a little bit, but by, you know, as I said, uh, if you can afford it, and you know, that's that's a pretty safe place to put your put your put your money. Um, should you save? Should you spend? Should you not spend? Um, it, the education has to continue, and I think you have to follow any mediums that you that you can to teach you, you know, what what could lie ahead. Yep. May Kier, any thoughts? Yep. Um, I think it's that much more important that the that what's trying to be the financial education that we're trying to convey is contextualized to the organizations and the communities that you would love to be able to take that up. Um, and so that's how a lot of our, a lot of the work that we do is really focused on making sure that the information um, and the skills and the strategies are contextualized to whatever mission of the organization, um, of the practitioners on our platform. And so for example, um, debt can look like um, one thing to um, like a young adult who's transition, who's um, entering the labor market for the first time. It becomes like very, very traditional, very kind of like curricula based know your needs from your wants, um, how to avoid you know, knowing good debt versus bad debt, um, how to avoid bad debt at all costs, how to access um, uh, good debt um, depending on the interest rates and all that kind of stuff. It can be, look very traditional and look very, um, the, that the means by which that's, the strategies are very like financial education based. But for some of the organizations um, in our community of practice, debt can also, like maybe for an organization who is serving um, uh, justice-involved folks. Um, and if they're men um, and they've been imprisoned and they're, they're fathers, they very likely are dealing with um, child uh, support arrears. And so debt can look like a very, very different topic. Um, credit, too. Uh, very traditional when you're talking about home, first-time home buyers, um, but very different if credit is in the context of financial abuse, um, domestic violence survivors, um, young adults transitioning from foster care um, have a high propensity of identity theft. And so credit is going to look really fundamentally different. So the, 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 some of the underlying basics are the same, of course, um, when your score is subprime or when your score is good or the, the three credit reporting agencies, you've got to check in with all of them. Um, those fundamentals are, are pretty th through and through. Um, but how it's offered, when it's offered, how it's contextualized is really important to how it's actually acted upon. It's, a, it's really fascinating thinking about not just different life stages, but what's happening to someone at a point in time and what the different needs of financial literacy and education are. Um, how do you think about that? Is there a baseline and then, and then it's, you know, depending on how, how especially this change we're seeing, think about um, segmenting those different life stages. Mm -hmm. Well, um, primarily just through the part through our partners. So we really start with where they're at, um, and so if they're ser whatever population they're serving, whatever the life cycle of the participant that they're serving, that's the that is absolutely our starting place. Um, but we also offer a pretty wide range of way of thinking about financial security. Um, some people do walk through the credit door, some people do walk through the debt door, and so a, a core to our model is helping the practitioners and the organizations and then the communities that they serve, that it's a pretty multifaceted concept. It's both um, savings um, and helping people really understand that that's, that that's an activity, not so much an amount. Um, it's about um, uh, inclusive banking and how you're using um, financial institutions to obtain, you know, to move your financial goal forward, um, it's credit, it's debt, and then especially for low-income communities in particular, because um, refundable tax credits are a big piece of their yearly budgets, um, tax planning, um, which can sometimes feel counterintuitive for low to moderate income families, but tax planning is a really big part of financial security for low to moderate income home families. And then your financial goal is what really drives that process um, all through outcomes. That's really, really interesting. So, Kira, I'll, I'll go to you on the, the potential financial slowdown and your thoughts on, on how it affects financial literacy as well. well you know, I, I think there's a, a couple pieces to it. The cliche that came to mind, which I'm, I'm sure I'm going to mangle, but, but the idea, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, but when the tide goes out, you see the shipwrecks at the bottom. And so I'm w wondering if we are heading into a recession, what those shipwrecks are going to be. And frankly, I do think disclosure is at the core of all of that because there are going to be companies that thrive and do thrive in the current economic environment and going to be others that don't. 
from a regulatory perspective, I'll just say this is the time when all the cases are made, right? When I, I was at the SEC came in 1999, uh, I was there during the dot-com boom and bust, and I can tell you, in 1999, every company sounded great, all of their disclosures, everybody was making money, was doing fantastic. Two years later, right, you have companies failing, you have law firms going out of business, and so I do worry about that, that, that moment. Um, Focusing on the disclosure piece of that, though, I do think there, there's a role to play, and I also think there's a role to play with technology. You know, one of the things that we've really focused on going to something that I think speaks to Ben at Fundrise, which is focusing on the retail investors, kind of the mom and pops, the people in my family I was referring to earlier, and making sure that what you're providing them from a disclosure uh, perspective meets them where they are both in terms of a comprehension perspective and from a technology perspective. And so one easy example is when you talk to, to companies that put all this time and effort into their annual reports and proxies and things of that nature, a common refrain that you'll hear is like, well, nobody reads this document. Nobody looks at it. Now, companies are partially to blame if you don't do a good job with your disclosure. But the other part of it is, making sure that you meet investors where they are. Are you sending it to them on email? Are you sending it in, in, through an app? We built an app a couple of years ago for the sole purpose of engaging retail investors more in the context of proxy solicitations. By the way, I hope you all download it, proxyvote.com. Anytime you get a proxy, you can go in, you can access the 10K, the proxy, and, and vote for the, for the board of directors. We created that app with the sole purpose of meeting people where they are. And I think that's just one example of that. As we were walking in, I was listening to a commercial from Fanny talking about the website they've created to meet investors where they are so, so they can understand more about the home buying decisions. Similar thing for, I think, every participant in the financial services space. It's not enough to sit back and say, oh, people aren't reading these documents. It's not having the intended effect. Look at yourself. How are you communicating? Are you communicating clearly and transparently? And most importantly, are you making sure you're giving the people the information they need to make informed investment in other, other financial decisions? So Ben, uh, earlier you mentioned um, some people will get incorrect education and maybe the wrong information. I, I, it, it made me really wonder, what, what do you think, how, how do you help people recover from that, right? What, what do you do to help people who say, well, I got this bad advice, so I'm not going to take more advice, or I'm going down the wrong direction, and who can help me? How, how do you help people recover from that? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things we've found is that a lot of people don't make their own decisions. They actually follow other people's decisions. So that you know, in the internet world, they call influencers. But whether you're listening to, you know, somebody on cable news or, or you're actually on like Instagram, um, that's really how most people figure out what's happening in the world. Like it's amazing. Like we're talking about a downturn. Probably most of the country doesn't know that it's like it's like imminent. So um, I think it's really key to make it accessible, and not just accessible in terms of like, oh yes, of course we have apps, we have you know, thousands, tens of thousands of downloads or something, but it's, it's, um, it's really, we found storytelling is critical, and so you have five to 15 seconds these days with most people, and so um, you might be surprised how sophisticated influencers are, how much they want good outcomes. It's actually like, the internet has, democratized distribution of information. Right now, anybody can distribute information to any, everyone, everywhere. And um, that sort of deinstitutionalization of education, ha I think, actually been a huge positive. But I think the institutions that, who are the big financial players don't actually sort of understand and relate to that world. It's so cutting edge. I mean, TikTok is just, I, I'm like, just this, it even blows my mind. So, um, so I think, think there's like a, an important part is not to be too elitist, not to basically condescend and say, well, this is like for kids, or this is like, I mean, you really have to meet people where they are, and that means you have to put aside your bias. It's interesting you mentioned TikTok. My daughter will come, my, my young daughter, 16 years old, will come to me and tell me about the financial literacy or education she's learned on TikTok. Some is right, some is very wrong, but she thinks it's all right. Um, I, I'm curious, others, how do we, how do we change that? What, what do we do? You got to, in my opinion, I think you have you have to go to trusted sources, um, and and you have to you have to rely on who uh, and where you're getting your information from. Uh, to go back to the conversation about debt, 
Uh, I'm not sure about everybody else, but I got my first credit card when I was like a freshman in college. All I had was a summer job, and all I wanted was the mug. <laughs> so you sign up, you get a mug. And so probably three, three of us signed up for a, for a credit card, and I paid mine, $10 a month, and, and some of my other roommates didn't. You know, but uh, so you, you have to know when to use debt, when not to use debt. It was great for me because because it gave me a, a great start. But, you know, for investments, you, you've got to really know who you're relying on. And, and, and while, while your 16 year old is getting a lot of information, she should say, Dad, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Sometimes parents are a great source of information, sometimes not so much. But uh, I think you, anyone, has to, has to vet their financial decisions through other people. Yeah. Movie tickets. I signed up for the credit card for movie tickets. <laughs> for the movie tickets. Yeah, movie tickets, yeah. <laughs> so, the, and I, I think in New York, um, they actually banned a lot of those practices, and hopefully most municipalities. I just want to really build on the um, trusting friends and family, how you vet your information, and removing your own biases. Um, we've learned a lot um, at my organization and the, organ and, the, and, the, and the practitioner network that we're, that we're building um, about really appreciating the communities that we serve as subject matter experts in their own lives. Um, and that I think that, that we, while we've talked a lot about, um, and it's, a, I think, a really laudable theme about really meeting our customers where they're at, I think it's even, I think we really need to actually push ourselves to such an extent of um, trusting that the communities that we serve um, really know so much more than I think we give folks credit for. I mean, so much so that I would really even almost prefer that we talk about this work as like financial education rather than financial literacy, because I don't want to even assume that it comes from like a deficit orientation. Um, a lot of the organizations in our network um, serve black and brown women, and from what we understand about the, their lived experiences, they're earning a, an MBA day in and day out um, about like financial management, financial planning, financial strategy, and that's an asset to be built on rather than an organization like mine or anyone in our network telling them what they don't actually know. Can, can I piggyback on that? So, um, uh, one of the books I uh, recently read is a book called How Minds Change. And it, it's actually a, a book that's focused on kind of the political dialogue and split right now. We're not going we to, we don't have enough time to talk about that. But the key takeaway from this book was that most people are influenced not so much by objective facts, so much as the communities in which they live and operate. And to your point, when we think about this idea of financial education, as opposed to just literacy, financial education, going into communities and working to, to raise the level of financial awareness and understanding within a community, so then that community can then kind of propagate it throughout the members of that, of that community. And it's really fascinating looking at the way that you know, people think, the way that minds change, in that people are much more likely to follow that trusted family member, that community member, that teacher, their pastor, whomever it may be, with whom they have a relationship, regardless of whether that person has an MBA, financial, it doesn't matter, because they trust them and they're a part of that community. And so whenever we're having these conversations around financial education and literacy, I think you need to focus on what are the communities that we want to raise that level of financial education and literacy, and what are we doing to go to the trusted figures within those communities to make them part of that education process. I'm seeing some, some thoughts and questions from the audience about digital and data. Um, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll ask you, May. Um, as banking has become way more complex and really, really digital, um, how much of financial literacy has become a matter of digital literacy? Mm -hmm. um and actually, I thank you because I realized that as I was describing what we consider financial security, it's like it's about assets, it's about banking, credit, debt, taxes, financial goals. I did leave off um, fin fintech, um, so thank you. It's just something that we're wrestling with right now ourselves, um, and the degree to which it can be both a peril. Um, uh, there's just uh, New York, the New York Federal Reserve Bank just did a, um, a presentation the day before yesterday about how uh, like half of all consumer debt are through fintech products now. Um, 
Um, so it definitely can be, it's of enormous concern for us, um, but it is also definitely an opportunity. And helping the, the practitioners who are on our, in our community of practice and the communities that they serve really appreciate the range of products that are out there, um, how to define and how to think about products as whether they're inclusive or not, um, and whether um, they, and so in this recommendation engine that I described before, um, we're uh, evaluating them for inclusivity. We're evaluating them whether we think that they will lead to someone achieving their financial goals. And then what we're also hoping to do is, because we've got that content management system, is to correlate their um, financial security data, how their, in, how their um, savings is increasing, how their debt is being alleviated with various usage of products and services, um, will um, award them a, a seal of uh, equity um, after that. So being able to think about all of the concepts that go into that, torts, that sort of uh, synthesis um, is exactly the pursuit of uh, digital literacy that we're, we're focused on right now. Yeah, it, it is interesting. I'd love to hear from others. You know, we've talked about websites or apps, right? And, and if you're not digitally literate, you're not able to participate in those. How, how do you think about uh, anyone, the intersection of those two things? Wait, well, I'll just start with some data. So one of the things that's really interesting is that we, we get a lot of data through the services that we provide with, uh, for, uh, on behalf of financial services firms. And, and it's fascinating in that you know, I think technology and digital interfaces play a really important role. But I still think they're not nearly as important as some of the other things we've talked about, including uh, uh, raising the level of community uh, education. So just to share a couple of things. First of all, going back to this disclosure point, uh, one of the surveys that we looked at said that basically when it comes to mutual funds and ETFs and those types of assets, more than 70% of investors actually look at those to evaluate whether to buy, sell, hold, et cetera, which is so comforting for me as a disclosure lawyer. When you talk about social media, however, and there's certainly a generational divide here, but less than 10% of people get their financial education and information about investments, savings, et cetera, from social media. And so that's somewhat comforting for me, uh, who also has a, a teenager who go, goes on TikTok and comes back and says, Dad, you should buy this, and I absolutely should not buy that. Uh, fortunately, that, that's not, not super influential. The other thing is, we haven't talked much about today is there is a real generational divide when you think about financial literacy uh, and education where where interestingly you know older americans are investing but we're on, on the verge of one of the most significant transfers of wealth in in history right as you have the boomer and silent generation that at some point over the next three to five years are going to be passing all this wealth down to younger investors younger investors have a completely different approach to how they invest where they invest where they get the information from investing. And for them, technology is a much higher portion of that. They're looking at apps, not just their computers, but all of the other mechanisms, mechanisms that people are, are using. Um, email, a lot, a lot of us you know, have these email inboxes that are flooded with messages. 40% um, of people want summaries of their investments sent to them by email, which I thought was surprising because I don't want anything else over email, but 40%. But um, text messages, less than 15%. Less than 15%. And so as we're talking about technology, I think there's an assumption that you got to build something new and it has to be fancy. But it's actually not those things. It's the traditional mechanisms for communicating on top of the interpersonal piece of it that's the most influential for people as they're making their investment decisions. Well, let me just say this. I think we're starting to assume that everybody has access to the internet. And I think we need to remember that there is a digital divide in the, uh, in the video that we saw before we came on stage. Um, it said to buy a home, all you need is an internet connection. Well, there's plenty more people than I think we realize don't even have a digital connection. Um, so that's, that's, that's one thing. Um, it, we're in the digital age. So, you know, it is going to be an outlet that people use to get out information. But once again, you got to consider the source. You got to get a couple of different opinions. You got to go to a trusted source. I mean, for 95 years, the National Bankers Association has members that have acted as trusted sources. And, you know, we live in these communities. We work in these communities. And we're kind of obligated. You know, we don't sit in our ivory, t ivory tower. And so when we start giving information, it pretty much has to be what we feel is the best information and the best interest to the people that we're giving it to. 
We, we also had a, a couple questions about um, data privacy, right? And as you're, you know, making education more digital, how do we make sure that data is protected and private? Any, any thoughts on that? Huge topic. Huge topic. Obviously, if you're a financial institution, you've got tons of regulations about, about data privacy, but uh, obviously there are people that have been able to access that data uh, illegally. And, and all I can say is you've got to be on your P's and Q's every day uh, about what you open up and, and what you click on. Um, because you know one one click can can uh, expose you to that, and so we're constantly training, constantly training our people. Um, I'm constantly being trained, uh, so yeah, it's it's something that everybody just needs to be aware of all the time. I, I think there's two parts to the the, uh, the role that uh, privacy and data protection and cyber play in in this context. The first is. Uh, from the perspective of financial services firms, whether they be banks, brokers, uh, other institutions, it's the most critical issue. I mean, for us, this is not a conference talking about uh, ESG, environmental social governance, but if it was, what I would tell you is that for companies like us, cybersecurity and data protection are our number one and number two ESG issues. And that's because at the end of the day, to your point, so many people, whether they be financial institutions or their customers, are entrusting us to protect that information. And once that trust is eroded, once you've lost it, it's really hard to get it back, right? And so for us, that's the number one piece of it. But there's also an investor-related education piece around privacy, data security, et cetera. You know, many of the folks in this room, I'm, I'm certain, work for companies that have cybersecurity, data privacy, and related training every day, right? Or yearly, at least, probably. You have to certify that. But does the regular consumer get that kind of education? Does the person who's investing through their bank or broker uh, opening up a bank account have that same kind of sophistication and understanding around protecting themselves, protecting their data, how they're using websites, et cetera. I th think the answer is probably no. My, my assumption is no. Certainly that, that has not been my experience as a consumer, as a customer. And so I do think that organizations in this space, whether they be banks, brokers, financial advisors, whomever, have an obligation not just to work on their own side of the house in terms of cybersecurity and data, but also an obligation to educate the customers and consumers that use their platforms on how they can protect themselves and protect their data. Yes, we're, we're, May, I'll, I'll ask you, we're hearing a lot about how digital can help drive innovation and in financial literacy. Um, you know, how do you push that innovation change curb so that it speaks to the needs of those who need it the most? Mm -hmm. Um, I think there are, I've got two suggestions. Um, one is for um, FinTech, for financial institutions, for banks to um, sometimes what we call be more LMI curious. Um, that there, it, it, obviously this has been such a huge explosion in the FinTech sector with products um, focused on the convenience of um, middle class and upper middle class um, families and household, which makes sense. Um, but low to moderate income um, families spend $127 billion um, on financial services every year. Um, it's really not even a niche when we're talking about 10 million families that are headed by a full-time worker but don't yet have enough money um, to, that constitutes a, a basic family budget. Um, and so for I think there's a huge opportunity really for um, financial services and, and banks to really not think of um, to evolve their uh, feeling of de uh, definition of market to also include low to moderate income families. Um, and then the other, um, the other strategy that I would put forth, to, excuse me, to answer your question, um, there's been also a huge surge of like um, identity banking. Um, and so neo banks and financial institutions, um, I'm thinking of like L Vest for women or Greenwood Bank um, focused on um, Latino and, and black communities and I think there's I think there's an opportunity to leverage um, that work to also um, focus on low to moderate income families um, passionately held um, forward-thinking asset-driven um, 
financial goals. And I know that when we used to do financial coaching before we launched our FinTech product, um, when we did that, when our model really embraced um, all of the assets that, that low to moderate income families were deploying for their futures, that's when we really saw enormous success. And so for families making $27,000 a year, um, we were a part of helping them build um, $1,000, uh, helping them get out of about $1,000 of debt, help them save about $1,700 and increase their credit score by 33 points because we didn't focus so much on like what brought them through the door, you know, what debt or credit problem or banking problem problem brought them through the door, but rather, like, but for what? What did they want to be able to get out of the engagement? And I think the more financial institutions put them in that place of helping um, uh, define a future um, and help people achieve that future, um, I think we'll be pushing on that innovation curve. I'm, I'm interested, Ben, you know, Fundrise has done some great innovation in the investment space. How do you think about, you know, p moving and pushing that innovation in the financial literacy space? So we recently um, launched another another product, which is to democratize investing into private tech. So um, if you look at technology companies, they're basically probably they've been the best performing investment in the world for the last you know 20 years, but they've been staying private longer. So Amazon went public when they had uh, 250 employees and 16 million of revenue. Now that company would never go public. They won't, won't go public to their, you know, worth billions. Uber went public when they were worth 50 billion, and so the unintended consequences of ring fencing that risk was to exclude basically, you know, hundreds of millions of people from that those great outcomes. And so it's it, it, the challenge with innovation is, and I, I, I like to when I go talk to governments, I say like you can't innovate if you know what's going to happen. Right? You, it's uncer un uncertainty or risk is inherent in innovation, and most institutions are, are, are terrified of basically bad outcomes. And so you have to manage, manage innovation by basically, like, ha you have to take the risk and limit the downside. That's why I, I love $10 investors, because basically it's actually, we have, you may have like 100,000 investors, but it ends up as $10 million, right? It's like 0.1% of our total AUM. It's, it's not, and so it's actually, um, there's really there's different ways to innovate. I think that the 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 way we in the last few years, right? You have part of the market that's highly regulated. We're 40 act regulated uh, funds, and we have 33 regulated Corp Fin and IM. We heavily regulated. Then you have crypto, right? You have no regulations, mm -hmm. and so and there's nothing in between. So basically, in order to basically to, to make progress on this, we have to figure out other models that let um, entrepreneurs take risk, but without basically the kind of downsides. I mean, tr crypto now is $3 trillion or something. I mean, it's a, the downside around that is now bigger than subprime in 08 if it, if it goes bad. So you said $10 before, so you really mean $10, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's like the, the, the <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I got that. Okay. Thank you. Note, note to sell. Can I, can I just jump in one thing on, I'm not going to touch the digital assets one, but I will say just the role that regulation plays in all of this, and, and this is a little bit of a PSA, which is I think that there is this um, instinct if you're a regulator, which is absolutely well-intentioned and well-meaning, which is I want to protect people who may have l less money to lose, maybe a little bit less educated, et cetera. But like absolutely you know, great uh, thought process. However, in execution, what happens is it does mean it, it uh, makes it much harder for uh, black and brown, for uh, communities that are that are, ha are have less resources financially to participate in some of these opportunities. And the example that I like to share, thank you. The example I like to share is, you know, so I worked uh, worked at the SEC, then I went to Covington and Burling here in D.C. for years, and I went to Uber. And the thing that I did not anticipate until I had that Uber job was the unbridled wealth creation that's happening at a lot of these startups. And by that I mean, you saw people that work that would come in early, not like the most super educated necessarily, but right place, right time, more importantly, part of the right community that get in part of these startup companies early on, and then they walk away with hundreds of millions of dollars, and people look and say, oh, they're a genius investor. No, <laughs> they were part of this community that was allowed to participate in this wealth creation process. And so to your point, Ben, I do think that 
there's an opportunity for re regulators to look at what kind of barriers are they imposing on these communities that don't allow them to participate fully mm. in the financial mm. uh, process. Like, mm. I think that that is a major, major issue. And it's, it, you know, thank you. Uh, and, and so I just, if for, for, for folks wa watching, I want you to think about that because you, you th think you're doing the right thing. Certainly you have the right intentions, but the implication is just increasing this wealth divide. Well, we've got um, just about five minutes left, and you know, you, you just had a little PSA. You, you have a great audience here, both in in person and online, of the fintech community in DC. Um, what I'd like to do is just, um, you know, Doyle, maybe start with you and and have everybody share. What is you know one thing that you want folks to take away? What is one thing that they can do that can help promote financial literacy? Well, you know, I think uh, before we started, you talked about the relationship between financial literacy and inclusion, and I don't think that there can be inclusion unless there's education and, and, and literacy. Um, that it's important that everybody does not get financial literacy, you know. In this room, we might take it for granted, but, you know, when you walk outside of this room, either in urban areas or even rural areas, um, everyone doesn't get it. And um, you know, the more we all can educate people, obviously we can we can we can ride rise all ships. Uh, I think Citibank did a study that said what 16 trillion dollars in GDP has been foregone over the years because of the lack of inclusion. And so, um, you know, where education and financial matters can start in in the school system, good. Uh, where you can look to trusted sources, good. Um, but I think we have all have a responsibility to, to do it because in the end, it's going to benefit us all. I mean, I, I'll, I'll reiterate, it's, it, it's, you don't want to go in with the idea of like, well, what do I understand that they don't? It's basically, you have to return to what, what don't I understand that they do? Mm. And I think that is like, it's so often that it, this, it comes from a place of, of supposedly knowing and, um, and so that means listening and going out and talking to people without presuming that, like, you know, not to pick on my 2008 financial experience, but a lot of the experts lost a lot of money and were very wrong about what was going to happen to the financial system, right? Like, months before the downturn, right, there was, everyone was saying the economy was fine, the Fed. I mean, so, so like, knowledge isn't always, like, an advantage sometimes to blindness. And, it, and it's, it's a, and so I think it's critical to recognize that people actually, a lot of people have financial literacy. It just doesn't mean what we think it means. If you're talking about, you know, it, it's sort of ivory towers. So, uh, figuring out how you can actually engage with people and learn for, learn from them, and in process, when you're learning from somebody, man, they it really opens them up to learn from you too. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I so agree with that, um, the, the app, removing bias as much as you possibly can um, from those kinds of interactions, so much so that I'll add to that to offer um, a standard by which you might think about that and how you would, how you would assess whether that's actually happening. And that's whether, whether we call it financial literacy or education, um, financial inclusion, financial health, lots of different ways to think about the work that I know we're all pretty passionate about is to um, hold it to the degree of whether um, it's, uh, it's sized to produce an outcome versus an output. So much financial education is about um, rote knowledge. You know, what's the difference between an APR versus an interest rate? And I would be hard pressed to, you know, I, if I, if we did a, a survey monkey right here, I'd be hard pressed to think that there would be many of us that would perhaps get that right. Um, it's also very focused on butts and seats, like just how many people process through an actual workshop or what kind of curricula they read or how many chapters the curricula had. I mean, lots of different ways to sort of measure volume and measure um, inputs and outputs. And I think we would all do um, ourselves and the communities that we care about a world of good if we were to go one better than that and think about the outcomes. What is the actual impact of the, the knowledge that we're trying to impart or the, um, um, or the subject matter expertise that we're trying to value? Man, it's a lot to say. That was great. Uh, so I guess just two points. One is, um, you know, the the mission of our company is enabling better better financial lives, 
And, and, and I think it ties directly to what we've been talking about today, which is there are many ways that we can increase the f inclusion of our financial system and to educate, and again, uh, for, at a community level, at an individual level. But it's not just the right thing to do because it makes you feel good. It's actually critically important for our economy that we do that. And the thing I always think back, and again, it's tied to diversity, which is you know, talent is evenly distributed, but opportunity isn't. And when you think about financial literacy and inclusion, think about all of those people who are not in the system right now that the system would, would be better if they were. And I think financial inclusion and fi financial literacy is absolutely part of making that happen. And I think everyone here, there have been some great ideas on this panel, I think everyone here has a role to play in that. I mentioned the, the app and the website and all that stuff. I'm sure every organization in this room has ways that it can improve financial education and, and include more people at the table when we're talking about financial literacy. And I'm hopeful that people do that. Well, um, we've, we've unfortunately run out of time. This has gone so fast. It's a, what a rich discussion, what an interesting topic. And, and thank all of you for bringing your different perspectives and your different work into it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dear colleagues in DC FinTech Week, for the past few years, we have seen the rise of central bank digital currency or CBDC. And many countries have been exploring and testing the viability of issuing CBDC and learning its political and economic implications. CBDCs introduce various legal and regulatory issues. A grave issue largely missing in the discussion is CBDC's potential to infringe on citizens' privacy which is CBDC's Achilles heel in our view. A CBDC will allow the issuing central bank and its collaborating third-party providers to collect and process citizens' personal and transactional data in a massive manner. We argue that sovereign states might misuse CBDCs to serve their agendas, be it a reason for anti-money laundry, crime investigation, or social controls. Whether a democracy or an authoritarian, such a concern is not remote. Central banks may not be able to say no to their government, especially in an area where political interference with central banks' decision-making is becoming pervasive. Not to mention policymakers undertake central banks with way too many atypical missions, such as tackling climate change and mitigating inequality. More complicated, we argue that the rise and use of CBDC might erode central bank independence and thus turn central banks into subordinates of the government. The abundant value of CBDC data will lead other governmental agencies to force central banks to intervene in issues they do not necessarily have the mandate or capacity to tackle. All of the above mentioned begs the profound questions of who gets to supervise central banks in processing CBDC data and through what approaches. In this paper, we raise several institutional designs or disciplinary mechanisms to address the privacy concerns of CBDC, either domestically and internationally. Before delving into these potential solutions, we wish to caution that any disciplinary mechanism holds the potential to jeopardize central bank independence and thus does not come without a cost. To control privacy concerns, we propose that a central bank may use three methods. First, to undertake privacy protection rules sincerely. Second, to anonymize or de-identify CBDC data. And third, 
to delegate the leisure administration to collaborating institutions and shift the compliance burdens to them. However, all these methods somehow undermine CBDC's utilities because it's more difficult for the issuing central bank to analyze the CBDC flow for good purposes such as anti-money laundry. We therefore argue some disciplinary mechanisms are still required. We propose three possible solutions accordingly. First, ask the legislature to establish a permanent CBDC Privacy Safeguard Committee to supervise the central bank's internal control of the CBDC data. Second, to establish a special independent institution to oversee the central bank. This institution may consist of consumer representatives, banking associations, experts on IT and cybersecurity, and human rights advocates. Third, to adopt a tailor-made regime for CBDC issuing central banks, such as allowing the central bank to collect and analyze CBDC data for specific legitimate purposes subject to periodic exposed empirical review. The other source of discipline, we argue, might come from foreign countries. Modern data privacy laws, such as GDPR, have extraterritorial effects and may apply to foreign central banks if CBDC data is collected from a protected data subject. If a CBDC chains borders, such a Brussels effect may subject CBDC issuing central banks and their collaborating institutions to the purview of the Privacy Protection Agency in a foreign country. Major sovereigns may thus need to explore bilateral or multilateral solutions to harmonize this silo impact. In summary, the misuse of CBDC data will subject citizens' privacy to significant risks. Some disciplinary safeguards must be in place to prevent that from happening. But the unsettled problem is how to design these safeguards while balancing central banks' independence. My name is CY Sum. I look forward to discussing all the issues with you. Thank you. My name is Timothy Nassim. Our paper proposes a way to regulate stablecoins today under existing law without new legislation. Many have called for new legislation and we would welcome it, but it is not clear whether there will be agreement on legislation. We believe financial regulators have the authority they need to act now and that the risks that stablecoins pose, as well as their potential benefits, warrant taking action now. This graph shows how quickly the market capitalization of stablecoins has grown. Our proposal applies to fiat-backed stablecoins. Our framework contemplates that the Comptroller of the Currency, a federal banking agency, would grant a national trust bank charter to a stablecoin issuer. That trust bank would then create a special purpose trust vehicle as the actual issuer of the stablecoins. The trust bank would essentially be the manager of the trust and interface with the markets and consumers. Under our approach, the comptroller would adopt standards requiring full backing of the stablecoins with cash and high quality liquid assets. It would also set standards addressing redemptions, operational resilience, cybersecurity, anti-money laundering, and other issues. Consistent with the President's Working Group report of last November on stablecoins, we have proposed that the trust bank itself be a subsidiary of an FDIC-insured bank known as an IDI. The trust bank would be consolidated with the parent IDI for capital purposes, but importantly, the trust itself would be off balance sheet for capital purposes. Having an apparent IDI would also mean that the Bank Holding Company Act would apply, thus limiting commercial affiliations for stablecoin issuers, as recommended by the President's Working Group. 
We recognize that some will say that this requirement is too burdensome because stablecoin issuers have narrower business models than banks and should be subject to more limited regulation. The IDI requirement may also limit the potential to increase competition in payments. We discuss the possibility of having standalone national trust banks without an IDI parent in our paper, but we have retained this requirement in our proposal as an appropriately conservative first step, especially in the absence of new legislation. The framework we propose would put the stable in stablecoins. It would provide customers with a far higher level of protection than the state level regulatory frameworks that currently govern most stablecoin issuers. Today, customers are not adequately protected if the stablecoin issuer defaults. A stablecoin issuer's bankruptcy would be governed by conventional corporate bankruptcy laws, which means that holders would be subject to an automatic stay that would prevent them from getting their money back quickly. In addition, they would be subject to other bankruptcy rules that could force them to compete with the issuer's other creditors, potentially getting back only pennies on the dollar. Our proposal would provide for resolution similar to a bank. The OCC or FDIC would resolve the stablecoin issuer in a manner that would best protect the stablecoin holders. And importantly, our proposal would not require deposit insurance. While our framework would not be mandatory, we believe our approach would provide substantial benefits to stablecoin sponsors, increasing the likelihood that they would adopt the new framework. They would gain a marketing advantage because consumers and businesses would be more willing to use a stablecoin that is subject to federal law. There would also be benefits that accrue by operation of law, greater regulatory certainty, possible preemption from certain state laws, and a resolution framework that is much better for customers than conventional corporate bankruptcy. Finally, approved stablecoin issuers could be given access to Federal Reserve master accounts, along with the core US payment infrastructure, thus greatly reducing settlement risk and enhancing efficiency. Thank you, Dan and Howell. Although new legislation is not needed, coordination across government agencies would be necessary to implement our recommendations effectively. The federal banking agencies, the Federal Reserve Board, the OCC, and the FDIC would all have to support this stablecoin framework, and we outline the steps they would need to take. Buy-in from both the SEC and the CFTC would also be highly desirable. Our proposal is consistent with many of the ideas in the various legislative proposals. And we believe developing this administrative pathway is not only good in case legislation isn't agreed upon, it will also complement a legislative strategy in two ways. First, developing the framework will identify issues that may need to be addressed in the legislation. And second, it will strengthen the administration's hand in negotiating legislation. Our proposal is self-consciously incremental and cautious, imposing stringent and overlapping safeguards. If successful, our proposal might later be liberalized in a variety of ways that we discuss. In short, what we propose here is simply a sensible but significant first step. Hello, my name is Yulia Guseva, and I'm a professor of law at Radvers Law School, where I also head the FinTech and Blockchain program. And today, I'm going to present our paper on crypto asset regulation, the SEC and the CFTC. So let's start. Crypto assets, digital assets, and FinTech are a yet another series of financial innovations that challenge regulatory paradigms. These challenges force regulators to function under uncertainty. It becomes hard for the regulators to catch up with the private markets, to properly control for the risks of innovative practices, and do so through effective rules and regulations. And yet, theory teaches us that properly designed regulations spur innovation and productivity. Put another way, without effective and clear regulatory systems, growth, productivity, and innovations suffer. In the United States, these needs are affected by a uniquely fragmented regulatory system in finance. And our task in this article is to identify how to mitigate those cyclical regulatory issues under the conditions of regulatory fragmentation. And we suggest looking at the market reaction as an important feedback mechanism. We empirically examine how the major US regulators, specifically the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, regulate crypto. The commissions are fundamentally different in terms of their 
regulatory philosophies and jurisdiction. And yet, when it comes to crypto, they are very similar in their methods. Both regulate crypto asset markets primarily through enforcement of the statutory frameworks which predate crypto innovations. So let's ask the market. We had collected 116 enforcement events in the past four years and examined the market reaction to enforcement. Our cross-sectional analysis and event studies indicate that the global crypto asset market, to a surprising degree, is sensitive to enforcement actions initiated by the commissions. They use a very conservative methodology to provide more robust results. And as you can see from this analysis, the market reaction is negative. This reaction is particularly negative for the SEC. The market reacts differently to who enforces US law. In other words, markets discern differences between the agencies within our fragmented regulatory network. Since SEC enforcement is perceived as a very negative event, this suggests that the CFTC may be more suitable as a crypto asset regulator, at least from the perspective of crypto asset markets. The most negative reactions involve actions in which respondents are exchanges and broker dealers, meaning gatekeepers, as well as crypto asset issuers. In addition, while crypto investors view regulation through enforcement as a costly and negative event, note that this negative effect is offset by a more positive reaction to anti-fraud actions and anti-market manipulation actions, which improve market integrity. So, this may help us defeat the argument that crypto markets are full of fraudsters, uh, that crypto markets fear the strong enforcement division of the SEC. Instead, markets value quality and integrity. Ultimately, we hope that this comparative study will assist Congress and other policymakers in forming a more comprehensive view on crypto asset regulation. We provide empirical evidence supporting the need for a systematic reassessment of the fragmented regulatory system in the United States. Finally, while regulation and enforcement are generally viewed as costly events and generate a negative crypto asset market reaction, some types of regulation may have the potential to improve market quality with positive valuation implications. Thank you for your time. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alexandre. I'm from Brazil and uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Sao Paulo. And I'm here today to talk about uh, digital finance governance and central bank policy experimentation in, in, in Brazil, especially in regard of PIX instant payments, right? So PIX is a fast payment scheme which was developed and is controlled and operated by the Central Bank of Brazil. Uh, and so far, uh, it has been used by uh, a large amount of the population. So we have over 120 million individual users, which account for three quarters of the adult population. And those users have been uh, transacting over uh, one trillion reais uh, per month uh, in, in this through PIX in over uh, two billion transactions. So, uh, meaning that this is the most popular digital means of payment in the country right now. Uh, everyone uses it. So, how, how did this happen? How did, did we get there? Um, first of all, because fast payments matter, um, they make a huge difference when it comes to, to the end users, especially uh, for lower income communities and small businesses. Uh, and because they also uh, matter a lot, they impact a lot the industry organization as a whole. So for payment service providers, for banks, because we're dealing with very strong network effects uh, that arise from instant or fast payments. So PIX uh, has been used by the central bank as an active way of fostering competition Right, but also to steer an ongoing transformation and an ongoing transition towards digital finance that's been going on in the country. Uh, and this is very important, right? So what's going on in Brazil? 
Brazil went through a, a big process of banking, of bank consolidation in the late 90s, early 2000s. And, but more recently, we have been seeing something else happening. So we had uh, an important payment system, a legislative reform, and also uh, fintech regulation. They have, there were turning points uh, in policy making, and that have been, have been paving the way for new entrants and for digital challenges such as fintechs. So this has been very big and has been changing the way that people deal with money and that uh, the industry coordinates and competes in the country. Uh, and so we have been seeing this process. Uh, all, that also means that there is an unbundling of, of financial services going on. And so payments have, been, have become very important. So they have this important role when it comes to, to fostering those alternatives, right? So the central bank has been using payments regulation and the payment system so as to push towards this different topology, less concentrated and less dependent on, on banks. And so how does PIX relate to, to this process? And I, I'd like to highlight four key aspects of regulatory governance that have to do with PIX and this enormous uh, success. First of all, uh, the rules of participation. PIX is mandatory for big banks and big payment service providers, which impacts mo um, the most relevant uh, uh, institutions in the country. So this is important, not only for big banks, but also for big fintechs, for digital challenges, and also for tech platforms. Second of all, uh, there is a central account information directory where people can store and monitor and manage their account identifications so they can use their emails, their cell phones, their social security numbers to control their accounts. This is important for data portability and also for to, to enhance market contestability. Third, there is a special liquidity facility uh, provided by PIX that nearly eliminates liquidity risks and also it reduces the burden for new entrants. And fourth, PIX is considered by the central bank as the backbone of digital finance. So the, pro the project of uh, a central bank digital currency in Brazil uh, is being built, uh, connected with PIX. So this is important for, for future innovations uh, down the road of digital finance in the country. Uh, and this means that PIX has been playing this central role in shaping and steering uh, the governance in the financial system uh, and also to 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 promote uh, to make it easier for those new entrants to to dispute and to compete with big banks, but also to make sure that the central bank is the ultimate gatekeeper of positive network uh, externalities in the payments industry, right? So this matters for everyone. This matters for end users, for big techs, for big banks, and also for fintechs. So this brings us to two major consequences. The first one is that PIX has been a very important tool to promote competition. Uh, and the second one is that PIX has been also a way to coordinate uh, this transition towards a digital financial system and also to ensure that we gatekeep uh, levels of competition that allow for banks and fintechs and big techs to compete. So this has a very big impact industry-wise. I think it's fair to say that PIX uh, is a milestone when it comes to digital governance. Uh, and it is also part of a policy toolkit to regulate the future of payments and financial technology. So thank you very much. Okay, so now for one of the prime time uh, events for the day. It is a great and distinct honor to be able to introduce the Vice Chair of Banking Supervision from the Fed, Michael Barr, to the stage. He is a, uh, uh, someone who truly has thought deep and long uh, thoughts about uh, innovation, about technology, about the financial system. Uh, to even begin to give an introduction to everything he has done uh, would both make him blush and uh, put me to shame. We don't usually do very long introductions for any of our speakers, 
but it is a distinct pleasure to have uh, uh, someone I've always looked up to, uh, to interview uh, for such a great crowd and for the US audience. Our, our goal has always been to democratize information, to allow the American people and for the average people to have access to some of our leading thinkers. And I can't think of anyone better uh, for people to experience uh, than Michael Barr. So I'm going to welcome him to the stage. And he will be delivering some comments from our illustrious podium <laughs> uh, that he will be delivering uh, on the future of the uh, 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 financial system. They're great remarks. And again, we're just privileged to have him here today. OK, Vice Chair Barr. <laughs> Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, really appreciate it. It is great to be here uh, with all of you uh, here in the room and those of you who are watching uh, online. Uh, Chris, it's uh, a real pleasure uh, to speak uh, uh, at this event. And um, for purposes of our discussion today, I'm going to be focusing on the aspect of innovation that uh, we all now call fintech. Uh, in the fall of 2017, uh, I invited Chris to come out to Ann Arbor, Michigan, to the University of Michigan. Uh, to give a talk at our fintech conference. Uh, and I, it is just really a, a great pleasure to be able to reciprocate now and join Chris uh, and you here today. Since then, we've continued to see major changes in technologies and the financial services and products they support. In looking over the materials for that conference from five years ago, I'm struck, however, by the way in which the key themes have remained constant. Um, maybe over not only the last five years, but arguably for centuries. Uh, when you think about uh, financial innovation, financial innovation has always brought uh, promise and risk and the urgent need to get regulation right. Way back in 1610, when Dutch merchants were exploring how to create a global financial system, a series of destabilizing bank runs also moved them to establish a ban on short selling. So many of the issues that we grapple with today are perhaps not as new as we think. First, let's start with the promise. Every day, we all have countless interactions with the financial system, depositing our paychecks, buying groceries, paying rent, borrowing, saving, and insuring against important risks. The promise of fintech is that it can make financial products and services better, faster, cheaper, and more available. Financial innovation supported by new technologies can disrupt traditional providers by spurring competition, creating products that better meet customer needs, and extending the reach of financial services and products to those typically underserved. To realize the benefits of innovation, we need to manage relevant risks. We have seen through history that excitement over innovative financial products can sometimes lead to a pace of adoption that overwhelms our ability to assess and manage underlying vulnerabilities. As we saw in the lead up to the global financial crisis, innovative financial products can mask emerging risks, resulting in significant harms to businesses and households, and ultimately undermining financial stability. These products can leave consumers vulnerable if they are not coupled with meaningful disclosures and basic protections against abusive practices. Innovation can lead to disruption of existing markets, which may be beneficial, but may also generate new systemic risks. Guarding against these risks is one of the jobs of financial regulation and supervision. And I'll talk through a few examples of how we are working to do so now. But I would note, with some humility, that striking the right balance between creating an enabling environment that supports innovation and managing related risks to businesses, households, and the stability of the financial system is no easy task. When regulations are too prescriptive or regulators too cautious, they run the risk of stifling innovation and locking in the market power of dominant participants in ways that can raise costs and limit access. When regulation is lax or behind the curve, it can facilitate risk taking and a race to the bottom that puts consumers, businesses, and the economy in danger, and that also discredits new products and services with consumers and investors. I believe everyone has a stake in getting the regulatory balance right. Let me start uh, by talking about striking the right balance for crypto asset activity broadly. 
Crypto assets have grown rapidly in the last several years, both in market capitalization and in reach. But recent fissures in these markets have shown that some types of crypto assets are rife with risks, including fraud, theft, manipulation, and even exposure to money laundering activities. Crypto asset related activity, both outside and inside supervised banks, requires oversight that includes safeguards to ensure that crypto service providers are subject to similar regulations as other financial services providers. We continue to work on this issue from the overriding principle that the same type of activity and risk should be regulated in the same way. This principle holds even when the activity may look different from the typical activities we regulate or when it involves an exciting new technology or a new way to provide financial services. The board is working right now with our colleagues at the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency and the FDIC to ensure that crypto asset related activities banks may become involved in are well regulated and supervised to protect both consumers and the financial system. Many of these activities pose novel risks and it is important for banks to ensure that any crypto asset related activities they engage in are legally permissible and that banks have appropriate measures in place to manage those risks. In August, the board issued supervisory guidance that outlines the steps Federal Reserve supervised banks should take prior to engaging in crypto related activities. The recent volatility in crypto markets has demonstrated the extent of centralization and interconnectedness among crypto, crypto asset companies, which contribute to amplified stress. While banks were mostly not directly exposed to losses from these events, these episodes have highlighted potential risks for banking organizations. When a bank's deposits are concentrated in deposits from the crypto asset industry or from crypto asset companies that are highly interconnected or share similar risk profiles, banks may experience deposit fluctuations that are correlated and closely linked to broader developments in crypto asset markets. In addition, misrepresentations regarding deposit insurance by crypto asset companies can cause consumer confusion and lead to increased withdrawals at banks providing deposit services to crypto asset firms and their customers during times of stress. The Fed is working with the OCC and the FDIC on these issues and highlighting them to supervise institutions. For example, it is important for banks to understand some of the heightened liquidity risks they may face from certain types of deposits from crypto asset companies. This effort is not intended to discourage banks from providing access to banking products and services to businesses associated with crypto assets. Our work in this area is focused on ensuring risks are appropriately managed. Looking ahead, there are additional types of crypto asset related activities where the Fed may need to provide guidance in the near future. Let me turn now to stable coins in particular. Because crypto assets have provided to be, proved to be so volatile, they are unlikely to grow into money substitutes and become a viable means to pay for transactions. However, stable coins, a subset of that uh, sector, which purport to maintain a stable value, have greater capacity to function as privately issued money. For this reason, they pose specific and well understood risks, similar to other type of money like assets. History has shown that money like assets are subject to runs that can threaten financial stability. Stable coins linked to the dollar are of particular interest to the Federal Reserve. As Chair Powell said the other day, a central bank is and always will be the main source of trust behind money. Stable coins borrow that trust, so we have an abiding interest in a strong federal prudential framework for their use. Over time, stable coins could pose a risk to financial stability and it is important to get the regulatory framework right before they do. Here too, the Fed is working with other regulatory agencies. The President's Working Group report on stable coins that came out about a year ago called upon Congress to take the necessary action to ensure that stable coins, particularly those that serve as a means of payment, are subject to prudential regulation. Congress should take action to provide a strong federal framework for prudential oversight and regulators must also use their existing authorities. Let me turn now to the issue of tokenized uh, banking liabilities. 
We are seeing banks explore a variety of different models to issue dollar-denominated tokens on distributed ledger technologies. The proposals range from issuance of tokens on private controlled networks to facilitate payments within or among banks to proposals that explore issuance of freely circulating tokens on open permissionless networks. As banks explore different options to tap into the potential of the technology, it is important to identify and assess the novel risks inherent in those models and whether those risks are surmountable. For instance, with some models that are being explored, the bank may not be able to track who is holding its tokenized liability or whether its token is being used in risky or illegal activities. While there is work underway on technical solutions for managing these risks, it remains an open question whether banks can engage in such arrangements in a manner consistent with safe and sound banking and in compliance with relevant law. Given these open questions, banks looking to experiment with these new technologies should do so only in a controlled and limited manner. As banks experiment, I invite them to engage with their regulators early and often, discuss the benefits and risks associated with these new use cases, ensuring that they are consistent with banking activities being conducted in a safe, sound, and legally permissible manner. Let me now turn to another part of the innovation space, and that regards uh, consumer autonomy. Let me mention an example where I think regulators could play a more active role in shaping how innovation is changing the financial services landscape. Over the last decade, digitization of financial services had led to the creation of vast amounts of customer data. Advancements in technology now facilitate greater connectivity and secure data sharing between banks and non-banks. This has served as the foundation for open banking and for the development of new types of financial products and services that offer consumers greater customization and an end user experience with less friction compared to some traditional banking models. Jurisdictions around the world have taken different approaches to open banking. Some, such as Australia, Britain, and the European Union, have adopted a regulatory approach to facilitate open banking by implementing specific regulatory frameworks that are built upon the concept of consumer data rights, data privacy, and competition. So far, the United States has taken mostly a market-driven approach to open banking. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is charged with implementing regulations to give consumers access to their financial data, pursuant to Section 1033 of the Dodd-Frank Act. While this is not an open banking rule, it will set the stage for consumers to gain greater control when it comes to sharing their data with prospective providers. The goal of this effort is to advance consumer autonomy, enhance competition for financial services, and to provide easier portability of account information from bank to bank, as well as non-bank providers. I look forward to hearing more on this from the CFPB. So now let me turn to how the Federal Reserve is taking proactive steps to work with the private sector to support innovation. The Federal Reserve has been working on modernizing our payment system for a few years now, and we're in the final stages of creating the FedNav service, a new platform for digital payments that will safely, efficiently, and instantaneously move money. FedNav will improve safeguards on instant payments, making the financial system safer. And it will improve access to the financial system by reducing payment delays and the high costs associated with those delays. As I have discussed extensively in my writings and speeches elsewhere, these costs are particularly borne by those least able to afford them. Banks and service providers will be able to build innovative financial products using FedNow's real-time, low-cost, safe payment rails, benefiting both households and businesses. We plan to launch FedNow between May and July of next year. It will help to lower costs, extend access, and improve security for consumers and safety in the financial system. No conversation about payments innovation is complete without a mention of central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs. The Federal Reserve has not made any decisions about whether to issue a CBDC. And if we believe it makes sense to do so, we would want to know that we have the support of Congress and the administration in doing so. In the meantime, we're doing the work of understanding the technological requirements of such a system, deepening our understanding of potential policy trade-offs, and taking a look at how other countries are thinking about and experimenting with CBDCs. Let me end these short remarks where I began. 
We need to get the guardrails right to successfully support a dynamic marketplace of innovative financial, financial products and services. We have a responsibility to ensure that regulation and supervision foster innovations that improve access to financial services, while at the same time safeguarding consumers, financial institutions, and financial stability. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice Chair Bard, thank you so much uh, for those remarks and, and giving us a sneak peek into your, uh, into your world and into some of the activities that the Fed will be uh, tackling in, in the years ahead. Um, I, I think the first question is just going to be a larger one, even beyond the specific crypto questions. I mean, I, if you're listening to the news, there are questions about financial stability in our markets currently. Uh, there's been a lot of volatility. Uh, not just in crypto markets, but in larger um, equity markets and questions with bond market and the like. Uh, could you maybe speak to what you're seeing and, and whether or not there are any pockets of, of, of risk that are, are, are really raising uh, your spidey sense? Uh, Chris, thanks very much for that question. Again, thank you for uh, inviting me here to this wonderful event. Uh, you know, let me just start with a, a basic um, fact, which is that the U.S. financial system is quite strong and resilient. Uh, that being said, you know, we're, we're always looking out for risks in the financial system. It's sort of our job to be attentive and concerned, maybe even worried always, uh, because that keeps us alert to the potential risks that we might see. So we're kind of poking and prodding on different parts of the financial system. We're looking at uh, what's going on in, uh, in global financial markets seeing whether any of those risks uh, might come back uh, here to the US. Uh, you know, we're looking really broadly across the system, not at one particular channel of, of transmission. Yeah, I mean, that, that work, I, I think, is, is fascinating because it probably contrasts a great deal with the kind of work that you were just laying out for us. Uh, when you think about transmission belts for risk, uh, traditionally you're thinking about large, systemically important um, financial institutions with a footprint across the world, as you mentioned, um, you know, questions of, of overseas uh, instability in foreign markets and whether or not there can be a spillover for the U.S. market. But when you think about sort of financial technology, um, many of the, although not all, but, but many of the companies are almost at the polar opposite. They're, they're small, mm -hmm. uh, they're experimental in, in some instances, uh, you know, they have shorter life histories, but um, very new and novel and interesting technologies. When you compare risk, which is really you know, a foundational element to your job and, and doing it well, and you think about the traditional work of the Fed in this space you know, for the large, systemically important institutions right. and the financial young firms, I mean, you know, when you have to balance both the equities and your very limited time, how do you go about thinking about risk posed by, again, younger, smaller institutions and your traditional sort of ambit of, of players? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Chris. I think, you know, one of the challenges we have in this space, you know, as I was pointing out very briefly in the speech, is thinking about how to get the balance right. Because if you're kind of too aggressive in taking steps in, in uh, innovative spaces, you might really stifle innovation that might be very beneficial. And on the other hand, if you wait too long, you might not be able to wrap your arms around the risk in time. Okay. And let me just take a step back, and I'll return to this question of innovative small firms in just a second. But take a big step back when you think about how I think about the job I have now in terms of looking at these risks. I think the most important thing is to be deeply humble about one's own sense of risk. Uh, you know. A couple weeks ago, if you had asked most people in the financial system, what's an LDI? Uh, do we have exposure to risk, potential risk? What's the potential risk exposure from UK pension funds? Would not have been on most people's uh, radar. I'd guessed that last year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I said most people. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. We you know, exclude the top. Yeah. I know, I know. I know. Uh, or, you know, if you had asked people early in 2019, what's the biggest risk to the financial system, nobody had on their list a global pandemic in early 2019. Even people, there's, there's a whole industry of people who use um, sophisticated modeling 
that is based in epidemiology to study risk in finance, to study how there's correlations across the financial system. And those people were not talking about a global pandemic being the next big financial risk. So I think humility is really quite important. And so, you know, when we're looking out for risks across the system, you can't say, oh, I know what the next channel is. You have to be saying, I don't know what the next channel is. What are the potential risks out there? And how do I mitigate those understanding that I probably am wrong? And the way to do that is to be, you know, again, thinking about uh, these different approaches and having good buffers in the system, you know, capital buffers and liquidity buffers that absorb at least the initial stage of whatever that shock is you weren't anticipating. Uh, so that's how I think broadly about it. Now, within the context of smaller firms, um, you know, the question is, what's the chance that those firms are doing all the same thing? So if you have thousands of firms each of whom are small doing exactly the same thing, they're going to have correlation risk in the economy. And then you also think about what happens um, when these firms scale rapidly. So I mentioned that you know, a lot of these questions are the same questions people were asking in the 1600s. That's true, but uh, one big difference is the rapidity of change is uh, accelerated, even in our short professional lifetimes, right? Absolutely. My short, your short professional lifetime, my long professional lifetime. <laughs> Chris is much, much younger. Oh. Um, so, you know, uh, given the technology we have and the uh, network dynamics um, that we've seen in many industries, so you can go from being a very small firm to being a very large firm very quickly. So there's the, the speed of that. You can get, so velocity, you can get to ubiquity much faster than ever before. So the kinds of um, issues that we see with velocity and ubiquity have changed. Yeah. And, and then there's a lot of activity. This is, not just, this is not at all exclusively in crypto, but throughout the financial sector, there's an increase in automaticity. And that also means uh, you know, decision making has, has scrunched, and, and, and that changed the nature of the conversation, too. Well, th there's, there's uh, uh, an academic, and her name is Yesha Yadav, and, and Yesha and I had, had actually written an article about innovation, sort of how do you regulate innovation. And we, a so very we, good article. Thank you. Oh, okay. So, you, right, okay, so uh, uh, and we, we, we sort of identified a trilemma mm -hmm. of sorts, and we, and we, which we said, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, market integrity, rules clarity, so having clear rules that everyone can follow, market integrity, and uh, financial innovation, mm -hmm. at best over history, regulators have only been able to get two of the three. So you can be highly prescriptive and sort of say no to everything, and you can still have very clear rules. The rules are none, but you have a, the price is paid with, with, financial, with no financial innovation. You can have uh, uh, financial innovation and very clear rules in which you say everything goes, and then your market integrity goes along with it, uh, you know, or you can have uh, market integrity and, 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 and also financial innovation, but that usually involves very detailed rules. Uh, and we're operating in a space, you know, as, as you said, where uh, due to both network externalities and the nature of the technology, problems can arise very quickly. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and as a result, I would imagine that um, the ability to sort of prioritize um, and judgment uh, becomes really critical to, to yeah. your role. Um, and when you look at all the kinds of the, the risks facing the financial system. And when you bear down on any one particular area like crypto, even there, there are some kinds of prior, you know, some kind of prioritization is going to be inherent to your work or at least a process to work through those issues. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what that process looks like or, or what some of those initial yeah. points of priority may be. I, I think. Uh, it, it uh, is important to prioritize, Chris, but also to think broadly about the range of tools that are available. So, you know, sometimes people think in kind of very black and white terms, you have a rule or you don't have a rule. Um, That's true. And the, the range of options available for dealing with emerging um, technologies that pose benefits and risks is more supple than that. And I think the full range of tools need to be thought about. So one of them is just um, uh, risk identification. So we can uh, enunciate to the world that we 
see a set of risks and that they should be looked at carefully. And that has actually an effect on, on behavior. We can enunciate those particular to firms that we supervise mm -hmm. through supervisory guidance and through direct conversation between supervisory staff and, a, and bank staff. And that is an important set of conversations. We can write rules of the game um, that provide clarity to the industry, but don't try and tackle all the rules at the same time. We have things we can do ex post. So we can say, this area is a little gray. Now having seen this area, is less gray. We right. think there should be an enforcement action. So there are different there are different tools you can use across a range of different experiences. And I think particularly in a very fast evolving space, you want to use all those tools because you know, if you just write rules, first of all, you're going to be late. And second of all, you're going to miss things that because the industry is evolving all the time. And if you never write rules, you're not giving clarity to people to, to guide their conduct. So it is very hard. And that's, again, why I come back to the big theme of humility. Um, because it is, it is not an easy challenge to get right. You know, I, I, I really appreciate that, that, that answer, in, in part because it, you know, I don't think that most people uh, know or have the time. Uh, your average, average person doesn't really know exactly how the government works and, and the array of tools and the judgment needed in terms of deploying them for very, very specific contexts uh, and, 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 and the like. Maybe I'll just get to some of the other issue areas that wasn't where you're going to, to sort of fed now and, 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 and the open banking mm -hmm. sort of issues. You know, given the, the fact that you do now have more work being done on FedNow mm -hmm. um, and that it's coming uh, uh, closer on, online, as it were, um, and as you've already started to sort of uh, open up or to rethink those channels that may be available through CFPB guidance and other rules and regulations for increasing competition and portability of data and the like. How does, how do those, um, how does that progress mm -hmm. impact how you think about, say, stable coins or other areas, right? Where you say to yourself, well, you know, we're, if, if the issue is, is faster payments, we're finally coming along now with some advancements here. So, you know, you know maybe we don't uh, have to put as much emphasis on figuring out Stable coins because we haven't done that switch. I mean, like, how do you, yeah. how do you, when you have these different, government is theoretically technology neutral, but right. is there a, you know, a necessity de facto of trying to think through what to prioritize when there are other things coming online? Yeah, Chris, it's a great question. You know, at least as I see the landscape right now, these different kinds of products and services are likely complementary to each other rather than substitutes for each other, and. The second thing I'd say is, which you just said, I think it's quite important, is uh, that we should be technology agnostic when thinking about uh, our regulatory system and open to lots of different technologies being potentially deployed that could achieve aims that help people. You know, when we're thinking about FedNow, we feel a responsibility as the Federal Reserve to have a, a modern payment system with instantaneous payments that are safe. That just sort of a function of modern central banking. Uh, and so we feel that it's important to do that. That is, to me at least, a separate question about how we should regulate stable coins or what we think about the crypto sector more broadly. They're just, they're, they're different aspects of our jobs as, uh, as the central bank. Um, and I, I think you'll continue to see us want to innovate on on payment services to be sure the kind of backbone of the system is there in a way that lets the private sector then innovate on top of it. Uh, so with FedNow, for example, you know, you'll, you'll see FedNow only through the way you access financial services. You're not doing business with the, you're, if you're a, a normal person out in the world, you're not doing business with the Federal Reserve, you're doing business with your bank. And your bank is using FedNow to provide you with a better service. Uh, and I, I think that's really important. Reminds me of uh, one of the most thoughtful European diplomats I ever knew uh, said about seven years ago, well, you know, what are you, what are you going to call fintech a decade from now? And I said, what? Finance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Vice Chair Barr, you are one of the smartest, most decent people I have Thank personally you. come to know. Thank you Feeling so mutual. 
Thank you, Chris. So really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> so we are now uh, gearing up for our next wonderful, great, uh, world-beating, world-deciding, financial market-determining uh, speaker, uh, May Reed McGinnis, who is the EU Commissioner of Financial Services and Financial Stability and Capital Markets Union. Uh, this is, again, one of the most decisive personalities uh, <laughs> in, in, <laughs> in the union and someone uh, who we're just delighted to have and uh, we are delighted to welcome her right now to the stage. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming here. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you again, uh, Commissioner. Uh, you know, we've, we've wanted for years to have uh, just such a great speaker and a great thinker uh, with us. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really, um, an opportunity here, it's been two years, it's the pandemic, so it's been a while since we've been able to meet um, to talk about FinTech policy in person, along with the folks who are sort of wrapped around the room watching from other screens here um, in the building. Um, just taking a step back, um, wow, thanks, yes, service. I, I was like, <laughs> that, is, that is service, that is service. You know, uh, you know, the pandemic really changed the way in which we think about financial markets. It changed the way in which we thought about how we interact with one another. Um, from your perch over at the European Union, you know, how has the pandemic shaped how you go about thinking about financial regulatory policy um, and, and, and fintech more specifically? I mean, did you, do you look at the response, the technological innovation, much of it having been accelerated during the pandemic as being a largely um, productive force. Um, what what have you seen as the opportunities and and and, and the risks that uh, uh, when you look at the post pandemic performance of, of finance and fin finance well, technology? Well, the first thing is it's great to be physically present because I've been wanting to be here for some time. So, uh, and I was eavesdropping on the previous conversation. It was really good. I think that what happened during COVID wasn't planned or organized. It was just we had to change our ways. And it was extraordinary what systems did, health systems, financial systems, educational systems. We mobilized, we used digital, uh, we got connected because we were forced to do it. And I believe that COVID, which had horrific consequences for many people and families, when it comes to the digital side and fintech and services and financial systems, has accelerated the rate of change. Uh, and therefore, I liked your last quote as I was eavesdropping about what will fintech be called shortly? Yeah. Finance. Uh, and I think you're right. It allowed people to continue doing business, uh, both public and private, for businesses to keep um, you know, capital flows. And the banks really worked well. I mean, our banking system held up. But because of that acceleration, I think there's more expectation now of what comes next. Um, so out of necessity, I think we, we were very um, agile, we were inventive, and the system worked. I mean, one of the things that I'm always cautious on around digitalization is when it breaks down or whether there's a, an attack, a cyber attack, and I'm sure we'll talk about those things. Uh, but we advanced things to a, a good place. Uh, and some people who um, you know, hadn't accessed financial services, I think everybody has at least one or two smartphones, uh, now have access in a way that they wouldn't have had. There's always a concern around those that are not digitally connected, uh, and there are many in society who aren't, and that they miss out on these opportunities. And maybe one last thought. It's interesting that we're very happy to be together, that the human contact is important. I'm wondering at some point with fintech and digitalization and not needing to meet or talk or have a physical presence, whether that may be an issue when we call it finance in the future. We will say, what about the human connection, particularly when there's problems? But, but really good things were done during COVID on finance. That was really interesting. In fact, just by, by, by chance, I, I did have the chance yesterday to, to speak uh, briefly with Vice Chair Barr last night. And you know, I, um, we were talking about the kinds of professions in a, in a central bank. And uh, you know there are lots of economists. And I said, you know maybe a couple of sociologists could be a very interesting sort of addition to, to central banking and, and maybe even to, to financial regulation. So when you talk about that, that human element. Yeah, I actually think if you look at the things that we face now, certainly on our agenda, climate change, uh, digital transformation, 
how do you organize change? You do it through sociology. It, yes. I mean, it's not just oh. about paying people to do things. You need to use all the sciences. And I, I'm a real believer in using sociology to allow people change. My background is actually agricultural economics. And when you're trying to change how farmers think and behave, you use sociology and you kind of see who, who are the leaders in groups. I think it's the very same. And I'm sure maybe those in the fintech space don't realize that you are using those techniques, but they're very important. I think you have to uh, hold on to the human dimension to finance. And I think that is the one area that I keep watching because one of the things I said when I took on this role was I wanted to put citizens and, and people at the heart of the financial system. I wanted people to have the confidence, and I, it's really important with uh, digital finance, to ask the right questions online and indeed offline and not to be satisfied with the answers unless you were really satisfied. So how do we make people more digitally and financially aware and have the skills to deal with this new world of finance? Particularly vulnerable communities, yes. uh, whether they're older people or younger people or different uh, groups in society. I think that's hugely important. I think digitalization can be transformational if we use it wisely and include uh, financial literacy. Oh, there's so much there. I mean, for number one, uh, as a kid from Arkansas, one of the most agriculturally uh, dependent states, gotcha. I invite you at any point in time in your visits to go visit my home state. Uh, because, you know, sociology is very important, even with the farmers. And, and we did have a, a discussion earlier about what financial literacy means in a digital economy. And if digital literacy itself needs to be introduced as a concept, you know, when, when, when thinking about financial literacy. But this is just fabulous. Um, you know, uh, there's a certain optimism that you have just sort of coming up and talking about you know, the responses uh, from uh, the European Union, um, particularly when engaging issues like, like, like FinTech. Um, and it's a kind of optimism that uh, maybe you don't always see here in Washington, uh, particularly when trying to tackle some of the more um, sort of challenging areas of, 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 of innovation. But you, know, you, you guys have really sort of outperformed us a bit in certain kinds of key areas in terms of introducing new legislation. One is uh, particularly in the digital asset space uh, with, with Mika. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, we, frankly, in the States, I think we, we ideally would like to pride ourselves on a sort of faster legislative process. But you, you, know, you guys came out very, very, very quickly with, with, with a really robust package. Mm -hmm. Maybe could you just sort of talk to us a little bit about what what Keske say, you know, Mika is and uh, you know what that means for, for for digital assets. I think the first thing I'd say is we're not competing with you. We just <laughs> were there. We needed to do something, so we got working on the proposal. And our system is that we and the Commission propose and then the the ministers in, in council formation and the European Parliament, where I once was a member for a long period of time, they amend. So we think we're great on the idea, and then they tell us, actually, not so. <laughs> we're going to change some of your ideas. Um, and essentially, this was about trying to put some reason and rule around us, uh, an area that had grown organically, um, and people weren't sure where it was going to go to, except we saw the potential, but we worried about the risk. Um, people said, why didn't you ban it? And I thought, no, you can't ban something that's there and that there is um, a potential around the technology. So in a word, what this markets in crypto assets, Mika or Mica, however you like to say it, is trying to put structure so that, for example, we have a union of 27 countries, but if uh, one of our, these um, uh, currencies, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies is registered by a regulator in one member state, it then has access to the single market, which is a great um, facility to have that access. But equally, there will be a requirement on stable coins to have a prospectus or white paper saying exactly what it is, how many um, will be issued, uh, the shape and size and color, basically, of what uh, the plan is, but also that you will not be able to make claims about the value of. And indeed, you may have to state specifically that while you invest, you may not get your money back. Uh, so it's really to, I suppose, open the eyes of those who are investing, to give them clarity about what they are putting their money into, and also given certainty, legal certainty, to the companies that are developing in this area. Now, I would say that um, my reading on this is that those who were in the early stages of crypto didn't want to be in the regulated space. They wanted to be elsewhere. Some still want to be elsewhere, but I think those who want a future understand 
that we needed legislation. And the legislation is now, through our, our process, it, it comes into effect uh, uh, shortly down the road. But we have that certainty. Um, but I'm, I made the point, and I've written about it, and I think it's been read here, is that you know, these are global developments. So the European Union doing its thing is, is good. We needed to do something. But we would hope that there would be a global um, coming together. We may not all do the very same thing. But it is back to the previous conversation about what are the risks, what are the possibilities and, and innovations here that we want to manage and get the best of, and how do we do that? I think there are differences in our approach. So we, we figured that we needed new legislation. Yep. From what I read from colleagues here, maybe you have legislation around securities that could work. Um, and we're going to watch that really closely. And I know that my services are in touch very much with, with the colleagues here. And that's really important that we do that. Because at the moment, this unregulated space, which sometimes is compared to the Wild West, um, the, the warnings are that, OK, at the moment, we're not too concerned around potential financial instability. But we're not sure that we could rule that out uh, in the future. And one of my titles is financial stability. So I think that's a really a key issue as well. And the idea that you do manage the same risks and you, you regulate for these risks. So our legislation will cover many, many uh, things that are now literally without any uh, detail or rule. It gives that legal certainty. Um, it also, um, if very big uh, crypto uh, providers could be regulated centrally by our central regulator, but the rest will be regulated at member state level. One of the observations I would make, uh, and I, I apply this to myself so I can apply it to others, is this is a fast moving space. Regulators need to have the skills and expertise to deal with this. And it's an area that I do have concerns around. How do we keep up with? the evolution of this space and how do regulators do that when we ask them to, to do more and more. But we're very pleased that we got it in place. Another area which did cause some concern is around energy consumption. Uh, I'm not sure if this came up in your conversations. Right, yeah. It was a big issue with my co former colleagues in the European Parliament. Uh, and there were some saying, well, we should really ban certain types of uh, mining. Uh, that wasn't what happened. But I think it will be an issue that will be watched very carefully. And indeed, it's something that when I was coming here, I thought, you know, is anyone asking now about the energy cost uh, and where the energy is being sourced? I think more and more that will happen. And I think some already in this space are changing uh, the technologies that they're using in order to try and consume less energy. As you know, energy is a very big topic, I think, here, but also across the European Union. So, I mean, overall, the process of getting this in place, we had lots of debates, and then in the end, we have a good compromise. Um, and I think it will strengthen uh, the innovators, mm -hmm. those who want to be in this for the long run. It may rule out those who perhaps shouldn't be there at all and need to leave. That may mean that some people get hurt financially. Um, and that has social consequences yeah. as well. And I think that was one area where um, if you look at a generation that may be using apps on phones, you know, just tinkering around with trying to make, because some believe that things go up and up. But if you're as mature as I am, you know that doesn't happen. Uh, and therefore, there is a need. And this is why I bring in financial literacy. There is a need for us now, in particular with the way finance is and less human contact, to make sure that at some point we all learn the basics of money. Uh, and we shouldn't complicate it. And I think sometimes the financial system is really good at complicating what is very simple. I always say to people, if you earn money, you work hard for it. You should make your money work hard for you. If you think you, are, you know, can take a risk of investing in a crypto because you see this as potential, know the risks that you're buying into. And if you're not so uh, sure you can deal with it, don't do it. Uh, that sounds very, very straightforward. But I kind of listen to so sort of the 20 years, that age group downwards. Um, and I know and see what they're up to, because I have four of them in that age group. And therefore, I sort of, um, I don't snoop at the phone, but I, I, I just think it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Promise I don't. I think it's interesting. Uh, and it's, it maybe goes back to the point I make about regulators. The one thing that we should not do is um, judge and rule by our own personal experience, but rather try and see what's new, what's coming up, what's the potential. Uh, and when I took over the, the role here as Commissioner for Financial Services, not here, sorry, I'm back uh, <laughs> uh, uh, in, in Brussels, um, it struck me after I spoke to colleagues in the services that the financial system is going to undergo a revolution. It's already started. So what I understood about the financial system and my interaction with it when I was 17 
it's going to be so different for 17 year olds today and those that come up because they are well they're more tech savvy they have different ideas about what services they want they're not going to use the same cards as we used and let's harness all the good about that but be open and this is why coming here i like contributing but i love eavesdropping because you learn a lot from each other and i would say as well and, and it's a thank you to my own services and, and the, the the people who work in the services here we work well together so we we talk to each other uh, and we try and understand what's happening so we, we if you like harness and harvest the best uh, of the conversations that we have and ultimately the idea is to first of all you need to protect consumers or at least make sure they're informed about what's happening and secondly this is a live event almost we need to harness uh, innovation and we also need to make sure that we allow for innovation already so we have a pilot project on DLT it's already being used by some in the financial system uh, and we changed our, our rules very quickly to allow for that so on the issue of time and, and you know how long it takes to, to make rules we can move as fast as we need to during COVID, for example, we moved rapidly around uh, all sorts of things, including uh, passports for, for travel with COVID vaccinations. So I think all our systems are capable of fast action when we need it. Sometimes in this area, and I've said it moves so fast that you wonder, are you really ever going to catch up with it? <laughs> But I think we have a settled space at the moment. I mean, sometimes I'm asked by, by consumer groups and others like, what's the point of this? Um, and sometimes that arises too when we're talking about digital currencies, so central bank digital currencies, what, what's the purpose here? Um, and I think it's good that we start talking about that. Um, and of course, people in the fintech space know why this is helpful for service provision and many, many other things. Um, and I think we need to talk about it more outside of ourselves so that people can understand that this area can evolve and offer absolutely enormous potential. I suppose the last point I'd make is that traditional banks, um, some of the services that perhaps were earning some profit, some say not an awful lot, but those services may be taken away. So the traditional banks will be called something else, I think, in time. Um, but everybody likes to make a buck. I'm sure that's just a rule you know too. Uh, so we have to see how is that made um, and is it fair where is it being made in the system and who's carrying the cost of it but you know it's great that people are innovating and that we can use technology in this way and again referring to your opening question um, look how digitalization has stood to us during really stressy times yeah yeah it's it, it, uh, because i teach millennials, I also see a very different kind of a conversation, you know, teaching law school students in, 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 in the United States and then, you know, from time to time uh, testifying or something on, on, on the Hill. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly when you see, hear some leaders say, hey, you know, there's no, been no good technology since the ATM and then literally their grandson or granddaughter is using Venmo to like send money. I'm like, yeah. not a good look, not a good look. <laughs> uh, so, you, you know, I, I guess um, uh, because you're a was uh, first, really, as a, as a major market to come up with the rules for um, uh, uh, digital assets and, and, and crypto, at least in, in the form of, of Mika. Do you, do, you know, uh, do you see a kind of Brussels effect, you know, through it? I mean, I mean, to what extent do you, would you expect uh, uh, that legislation to be able to uh, influence other actors? And 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 I guess embedded in that question is the other question of, of you know, where. Uh, do you see with the United States, you know, the, maybe let's call it the, the, the closest areas of, 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 of agreement and, and, and are there any areas where, not necessarily disagreements, but maybe more emphasis uh, in, in one jurisdiction versus the other? I mean, the Brussels effect is that if we legislate, you know, others tend to look and, and follow. Um, but we also look at what others are doing as well. I think anyone in regulation or legislation, yeah. you have to have your eyes wide open. Um, I think on this particular piece of legislation, um, I always believe, why redouble your efforts? If you can learn from others, we're very happy to have engagements with those who want to see the process we went through, what we got right, what was difficult, and where there might be some sensitivities. Um, I'm not sure about the differences um, between us, there'll always be differences between jurisdictions as to how you legislate and maybe some wording. I rather look at what is the objective of what we're trying to do. And the objective is that there was this evolution of fintech, well, crypto in particular, that, that happened without anybody re realizing it had evolved 
until we said, gosh, this is a big area here, we need to know what's going on, particularly when things went wrong. Um, so how are we going to manage that? Do you get rid of it altogether? That's impossible because it would come back in another form uh, and maybe worse. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, if you decide to, that you want to uh, allow it develop, what other tracks you want to put it into? So I think our objectives should be the same around consumer protection, helping innovation, all of those good things, uh, including making sure that this area is not vulnerable to anti-money laundering efforts. And this was a real big concern, uh, including around sanctions, evasion, uh, etc. So it's a very hot topic. Um, we know what happens in the ordinary financial system, so the crypto space can be a particularly vulnerable area. Um, in differences, because I've been picking up pieces today, it seems you might use existing legislation to put put That's this right. into or already it should be part of that. Uh, but look, I, I'm, I'm here really, as I said, to listen and learn and equally to share our experience. Um, and overall, it was a very good experience. It was interesting, the differences. I don't know if energy comes up here as an issue, but in, in Europe it does. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, in, yeah. in, in terms of the, the, the areas of emphasis, yeah. you know, just, yeah. just naturally, uh, in my own mind, energy yeah. came up. Uh, energy, um, consumer protection is big. Um, the issue of money, anti-money laundering is, is really big. We have also a piece of legislation um, tightening our anti-money laundering efforts because, you know, every time we do something, there are clever people out there who find ways so we're, we're actually going to Europeanize it, so we'll have a central authority. Yeah. Uh, we also moved very fast to make sure that this crypto area came under our existing legislation. Um, going back to the point I made, initially those who were involved in this area, it seems to me, wanted not to be noticed. They wanted to evolve but let nobody notice or regulate. Um, and certainly they wanted total privacy. And I think if you're trying to address terrorism financing and, and anti-money laundering, you really do have to find out where, where are things going and who's who in, in the pie. Um, so that would have been an important piece of, of uh, the discussion for us. And then the issue of you know, the issuers and then the service providers and all the different links in the chain and how we manage those. I mean, there, there was a lot to talk about, um, but, but as I said, I think we've already had good contact with your colleagues on it. Yeah, it, it, it has, has to whatever extent, you know, uh, when we talk about blockchains, we talk about things like smart contracts and automation. I mean, that's something that Vice Chair Barr had brought up. And, you know, and trying to figure out, you know, what, you know, liability when you're talking effectively about algorithms and, and but, but also developers behind them. I mean, is this, is this also, when you think about the AML, KYC, like, is this a part of the conversation um, or are you just sort of opening up the, the, the process of thinking through those issues? Well, I think we have to do a lot of thinking about this um, decentralization of finance and this idea that there's nobody there but everybody's there. Uh, and I think that is an issue of how do you eventually, where there is a need to track where do you find the person? I mean, our work on um, the piece of legislation, the markets and crypto assets is complete, uh, but our thinking around this next piece of the financial story is not. Uh, because we, we need to have lots of conversation around what does it mean for the entire financial system? What does it mean for central banks? What does it mean for individual consumers? And what does it mean if you can't find, other than a machine or a, a formula, for liability or for those who might be trying to break the rules. So I was hoping that you might be able to give me some pointers because I, I hear you're good at this sort of thing and I think people in academia can help, um, you know, help ha have this conversation. It's a very new area. It probably has exciting possibilities. Absolutely. I, I mean, one of the things when you talk about the financial system is there's a lot, a lot of layers to it. How many layers will we eventually take out this could be very good in terms of, you know, service at lower cost, but what are the costs of taking out those layers as well? So, I mean, if you ask me now for a clear direction as to how I think this would go, I'd say we're going to keep talking. Yeah. We're going to keep listening. We have to get it uh, right. It's, it's still evolving. Um, and I think it's probably more, I was going to say scary, but certainly more, um, it's, it's quite dynamic compared to crypto, which will seem like, uh, you know, compared to what could come. Yeah, uh, one of, well, as a matter of fact, one of my great, great pleasures and privileges uh, that I had uh, recently was, was to testify in front of the European Parliament and I um, talking about Mika. And one of the things that, that had sort of come up, and I'm seeing this as a remark from, from or a question from the crowd, which is kind of interesting, is as you bear down on the, 
you know, um, AML, KYC, and the sanctions issues and the market integrity issues that are obviously in Europe extremely uh, important. Uh, you know, you're, you're doing all that against that backdrop of also longstanding European principles in, under uh, GDPR, you know, and, 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 and privacy and the like. Mm. Like, how do you, you know, how do you think through that balance, it, particularly in fintech and financial technology writ, writ large? Well, privacy is really important. We have strong rules around what I can do with my data and who gets access to it. Uh, you talked about open finance earlier, so we're going to have some proposals on that quite shortly. Um, and it will be around also making sure that the, the, the person controls who gets access to the information. On the other hand, we know that information is key to the provision of better and more services. So we do have to balance very carefully. Um, and, and the European balance is different, yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah. Uh, than, than might be here. Um, but, but we do that because we have to, because our um, politicians, and I was one in the parliament, would demand uh, that we look after people's information and their data shouldn't be given away or uh, if it is, it has to be used in a certain way and the person has to give that, um, that permission for use. So despite those differences, again, I always look to what's the objective. Mm. Uh, and there's different tolerance around uh, privacy issues perhaps here than there is in the US, and, and, or rather in Europe, and we have to abide by what our legislators have already passed. Yeah, yeah it, it really is, is fascinating. And by the way, I have no idea what the answer is, but when I talk to some of our, our, our leaders here, whether or not it be with, with FinCEN or if I talk to some of our national security people, you know, it, it's fascinating because on the one hand, you do have um, the opportunity for obfuscation, which can lead to abuse of um, blockchain-based systems, but you also have this radical transparency that can also lead to interesting privacy questions, right? You know, um, uh, and and if you push too far in one direction, you know, you end up with with results that 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 can end up endangering people. And it's a fascinating sort of again, I have no idea what the answer is, so I'm not going to bother you or b bother you with that that particular question. But the question of values and the question of how people interact with one another mm -hmm. is something that you brought up earlier, and, and I think it is especially um, uh, uh, important. Um, when you look at sort of the, the, the immediate um, next round of decision making, not just in, in, in terms of uh, crypto, but you had also started to mention some issues relating to um, a, a perhaps more an additional open banking regulations or like, what do you see your time, your focus, sort of in the next 12 to 18 months and in terms of what your objectives um, in the sort of financial technology innovation uh, well, space? One key one is, is to the, the point I raised around retail investment. So we will have a big strategy on retail investment, trying to harness the, the money that's on deposit that up until recently wasn't earning. So how do we get retail investors confident enough? We want to deepen our capital markets. We will need a lot of money for our green and digital transformation. And this is part of that conversation. Uh, that's a key piece of work uh, around the open finance area as well. How do we uh, evolve? Uh, on capital markets, we're doing a lot of things to try and make sure we don't have barriers between member states. There's a good bit of work to do around that, including around insolvency. So some of this is quite technical and, and maybe dull, but really important for us to get strong capital markets. We kind of look here and we think, wow, you have strong capital markets. Uh, we have the potential. We rely very heavily on bank financing for our businesses. It's really the opposite yep. here. Uh, so we need to see what you're doing. Um, and, and we're trying to make sure that we capital flows across uh, our 27 countries. I mean, the country that I know best, the member state I know best, joined 50 years ago, uh, the common market. It has evolved all of those years now to be the European Union. Uh, it's true to say that when it comes to free flow of capital and uh, all that that would involve, it's only a work in progress. Mm. Which you can either say as well, that's taking a long time, or as I do, the potential is huge. And I think digitalization, uh, will help us in that. So, so I do think that now is quite an exciting time, a, a difficult time politically, uh, of course geopolitically, uh, of stressful issues around the financial system and energy. Um, but for us in Europe, and I mean this is a key point now, we realise for example on the energy piece that we need to invest rapidly in more renewables. We already had a plan, it has to be accelerated. To do that you need money. Where do you get money? You get it from some from the banks, some from the public purse, but a lot from the private sector. It, 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 you know, that is 
um, really something, a nuance I never really thought of until j just now, and I think it's, it's, it's useful even for American, um, uh, an American audience to, to, to think about. You know, that you, when you're talking about that retail investor space and, and sort of bolstering that space, you're doing it against the backdrop of what the European capital markets or banking markets look like as compared to the United States. And it, there is this interesting question, particularly in a world of both you know, more volatile markets and newer kinds of products, you know, how do you deepen your retail space? And I think in the United States, there's still some ambiguity about how retail do we want retail markets to be, but you know, you guys are starting off from, you know, a question of liquidity and depth. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, any, 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 you know, we only have a minute, so, you know, this is pop quiz. Uh, you know, in, in, any kinds of initial thoughts when you think about retail investors, the kinds of protections that you wanna, wanna, wanna have as you think about deepening those markets? Without talking about protection, I want people to be aware that there is another way for your money to work for you. Right. And that is investing. But I also want them to be aware that it's not a given that you will get a return. Um, so this is about being savvy around money. Um, I think the, the story of Europe is that during COVID, those who were working, you know, there was a lot of money because people couldn't spend, couldn't do anything. That is actually beginning to flow out. But wouldn't it be fantastic if we could have harnessed all of that towards our, our future around sustainability? Um, and I think this conversation, you know, is going to grow and grow as people become more aware about pension provision, about education provision. So, I mean, it's a very different uh, starting point than where you are. Um, but some of the newer things like um, the retail investor, <coughs> excuse me, on the apps and all of the stories around payment for order flow and these kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, we're watching that very carefully. We, we've actually proposed a ban on that uh, activity. It's been interesting that I thought that would not be, wouldn't get a lot of opposition, but it was striking where the opposition was coming from. And it was coming from younger people feeding it into the political system. Um, but it's been a good debate so that people understand what these things mean. And right. if you're OK with yeah. them, as long as you understand, right. then I think you take the risk, but be aware. Commissioner, uh, uh, it's just been a pleasure. Thank you so, so much. Uh, and for enlightening the audience, and certainly enlightening me, I, I, I really learned a lot. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming down to thank DC for this week. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Welcome back. So uh, next, I am excited to uh, introduce Patrick McHenry and Patrick Collison. Patrick Collison is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Stripe, and Patrick McHenry uh, is the ranking member on the House Financial Services Committee, and, and obviously uh, two world leaders and world beaters in their own right. So I guess I'll welcome them both to the stage, and I'll have a chair. <laughs> Come on up, guys. Yeah. Pretty nifty chair work. Oh, uh, good. That's, that's not in our breaks. All right. Um, as I said, I mean, I am just delighted to have you both here, and as well as the people in TV land and wrapped around the corner. Um, you know, to have you both here for DC FinTech Week, the opportunity to talk to both of you about these issues is it's it's a real treat for all of us here in Washington DC. Um, I guess I will start with um, uh, uh, the lesser Patrick. Is no, it, I, mean, I mean it's kind of interesting. It's a Patrick, yes. you know, it's a Patrick, you know, uh, but but uh, uh, ranking member uh, Patrick McHenry, um, you know. Uh, we've been talking a lot about innovation and technology over the last uh, couple of days, and we've had obviously most of the <laughs> of the administration and, and 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 really vocal voices from throughout the innovation community uh, speak with us. You know, uh, you have a very unique seat uh, in Congress and a unique voice and a lot of experience um, uh, when dealing through and thinking through issues of, of innovation and technology. You know, how though has, in your view, that, that conversation evolved and changed? I mean, certainly when you think about the, the evolution of new kinds of different financial products, new, new ideas have been introduced, do you see a change in the conversation? Are there new kinds of questions asked? 
different kind of tool. Yes, and I think the, the conversation's been unmoored from the reality, which is what are the problem, what, what is the problem we're trying to solve for? Um, what are you trying to enable? Um, and frankly, I mean, what you do at Stripe establishes this you know, front and center in people's minds, but what we have to do in terms of public policy is make sure that we're talking about the results that we're trying to enable. Financial inclusion is the greatest result of uh, FinTech innovation. That's how my father started his business. I'm the youngest of five kids. My dad had a buddy down the street who had five kids, um, and they decided that they were gonna start a business. Uh, so they borrowed a piece of equipment. The second piece of equipment was the truck to put that lawnmower on the back of, and they bought it using the best FinTech of the, its day, which was a Master Charge, nah. right? Yeah. yeah. And that's what it was then called, MasterCard now, obviously. Uh, you do a little bit in this in this work, but <laughs> a bit. but it was my father getting a lawnmower, putting it in the back of a truck that changed two families' lives. It didn't change the world, but it changed our lives and put uh, five kids through college. Not because we wanted to work in the business, but we were obligated to work in the business, right? Yeah. Uh, but it was enabled by a financial product and access to capital my father wouldn't have otherwise gotten. Uh, due to our economic situation, relationships, and everything else. So we're, I'm thinking of my father as the innovator, and using FinTech is the, uh, as the mechanism, and all the technological changes in order to enable folks like my dad in, the, in, in what he was able to do to provide for, for a family. So we need to get back to that conversation about solving problems in the real world in ways that people can understand. And, and just for that, a little bit of clarity, I mean, like, so, so in your view, it's, it's more detached, like, like currently the, the conversation on technology and innovation, it's just more detached, and it's not really thinking about the, the problems of access for capital and, and for- Right, for right. So if you're able to access financial products on an app, it is a, it's a huge game changer for the average small business person who works for themselves. It, uh, it's a huge uh, change when you bring down the cost of payments. It's a huge change when you bring down the cost to access the capital markets and invest and save. Um, it, it is a, it's a game changer when you have uh, what we think of as digital assets and crypto uh, bring innovation and information that is usable to a wider array of people that don't have the relationships to get that information that is opaque and removed today. So we gotta go solve for those problems and think in the terms of the average person and their daily lives. That's what I've, I'm trying you, to you, you, You'd enjoy the comment that I made earlier where I'd, I'd seen literally um, a politician uh, say that there's never been any good uh, technology since the invention of the ATM and they had their grandson using Venmo and I said uh, yeah, that probably wasn't the best look for the for that particular comment. Uh, at any rate, um, uh, 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 I'm trying, you know, too bad, like Patrick Stripe. Uh, other Patrick. <laughs> other, other Patrick, Patrick Stripe, Stripe Patrick. Uh, you know, uh, you know you've, you've, you've already had a remarkable life, a remarkable career, you know, build a remarkable company. Um, but even in that short period of time, I would imagine that, that uh, the conversation on innovation and technology has, has evolved for you, both in-house over at Stripe, but also in the larger uh, conversation, um, uh, certainly here in, in the United States. I mean, from, from your vantage point, you know, what, what, what changes in the tone or in the content or in the prioritization of that conversation have, have, have you been able to see, either from your perch at Stripe or just the outward-facing um, engagement and questions that, that you receive? Yeah, well, um, it's a little bit hard for me to judge uh, because uh, I you know, grew up in Ireland and I only you know, came to the US for college. And so my, my baseline, um, uh, you know, uh, I didn't get to kind of establish it through, uh, through growing up. And uh, I, you know, US politics post-2016, I presume that's how it's always been, right? <laughs> uh, so it's an operating assumption. No, um, so I think, um, I think uh, the, the thing that's very striking to me uh, overall is, uh, and building on uh, what the congressman says, is um, 
there's all, you know, for, for all these problems, you can, kind of, you can approach them top down and you can approach them bottom up, kind of conceptually, right? And so with respect to technology or fintech or financial services or innovation or you know, whatever, there's kind of a top down perspective you know, one can have and you can think about the right ratio of these things and you know, where we want it to go and so forth. But then there's just a very basic bottom up you know, point of view around what is it that's happening, what's not happening, what do we want to enable, what's the consequence at the level of the individual. And the thing that strikes me is, you know, we spend time going on around the world, and you know, Stripe operates now in uh, roughly 50 countries, is the, uh, the US and the European debates tend to be quite top down. And that's not in and of itself necessarily a bad thing. You know, there are lots of phenomena that are only you know, diagnosable and observable in that form. So I'm not saying that it's wrong. But when I spend time in Eastern Europe, uh, or when I spend time in India, or when I spend time in Southeast Asia, you know, et cetera, people are much more indexed on the specifics and the particulars of it, it is you know, ex wildly excessively difficult to start an online business, or it's way too complex to sell in multiple countries uh, in that, you know, I mean, uh, obviously we kind of experience this in Ireland, where, you know, if you're in the US, um, you know, you can kind of ignore the, the, the rest of the world to some extent. You know, the US is a pretty big place. When you're in Ireland, you can't. And so you know, folks in Ireland have to be very indexed on the challenges and the difficulties and the, you know, the, uh, all the different considerations around exports and selling across borders. And we spend time with folks in, um, in uh, again, most other parts of the world. These are the kind of salient questions for them. All, all the silly complexities, you know, sales tax, currency conversion, treasury, uh, how you manage a web of you know, different entities and so on. And so, yeah, to, to your question as to you know, what strikes me about the debate, I think it's uh, we're, we're coming from different kind of ends of the continuum. Um, and I think you know, probably in, in every place, um, uh, you know, the, the, um, the challenge for us is to make sure that both are sufficiently embodied. You know, it, it's, you know there is certainly some, some, some symmetry here, you know, when you're talking about the, the, what you're hearing overseas and what your view is in terms of, you know, what's missing is that overseas, you know, there is a kind of concrete thinking about, you know, what problem are we seeing? So let's work backwards, it sounds like, from what the problem is to come up with a, with a solution. And, and I guess what you're observing elsewhere is that that conversation seems to be a little bit more concrete in terms of how, how the decision making is going on. Maybe looking at the problem at the bottom and working your way up as opposed to sort of thinking from the top about potential issues and then, and then working down to the and, and Stripe is a very concrete company, you know, in a way that almost makes it hard to talk about, right? You know, one of our, one of our products is called Atlas, and it helps businesses incorporate. And like, it's the most unsexy product you could possibly imagine. You know, we're, we're, we're literally helping people file paperwork with the state of Delaware. And, you know, everyone's <laughs> talking about AI and blockchain. My God, I love boring. <laughs> I really love, I'm a law professor. Well, then you found the right company, but, um, so, um, No, so. what's amazing, though, is in the small business world, it is a massive innovation because you've made it super easy and you've made it easy for them to figure out how to do it. That's the striking thing to me. Yeah, no, every, every, like, we're always asking these, again, top-down questions right. as to you know, how do we foster more innovation across society or whatever. You know, when we survey businesses that incorporate with Atlas and we ask them the question of, hey, do you think you'd have started your business if Atlas didn't exist? That is to say, if our little form filing service uh, wasn't there, you know, 20, 30% of them tell us they wouldn't have otherwise incorporated. And so we think we there's a lot of opportunity in boring. So, so you know, I think there's enormous opportunity in boring. I mean, my, my most cited research paper I just wrote, it like blew away everything else was, how do you incorporate a DAO, a, a, a basically a decentralized autonomous organization? Good piece of work. I mean, uh, oh yeah, well thank you very much. I mean like within two days had blown away anything, which made me both happy and sad at the same time about my career, but like, you know, is a very boring and basic question, like how do you incorporate it? Uh, you know, um, I, I guess I'll, 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 you know, I'll go from the boring to the exciting. I'll just ask you that question. Um, you know, obviously you spend so much time in payments and thinking about payments and, and, and really making that payments experience uh, more effective and efficient and safer and everything. You know, are there any developments that you're seeing um, nationally, interna I mean, here in the U.S., internationally, that you find to be particularly interesting and, 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 and exciting? And, you know, like, like it, is, there, is there something that the, the government, wherever that's happening, is, it, is there something that they're doing to help enable it? Yeah, so um, 
So as, as a first order matter, I guess, you know, we think a lot about how, uh, you know, we're in a world of, you know, seven plus you know, billion people. Um, and most of those people do not have access, you know, they're, they're not in developed countries uh, or, you know, fully emerged markets. Uh, and from a financial services standpoint, they don't have access to all the things that, you know, we ourselves uh, get to benefit from. And so we, you know, the, 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 the question that we're preoccupied with is how do we, how do we provide some kind of, you know, global unity and integration so that people, I mean, the promise of the internet is, uh, you know, is the old New Yorker cartoon about, you know, people on the internet don't know you're a dog, you know, and so people on the internet uh, don't know that you're a dog and they don't know, like, the political identity of the specific atoms, you know, you happen to be sitting on top of, you know, that, that, that's what it represents. But of course, once the movement of money gets involved, then national boundaries and borders uh, uh, tend to be, become kind of primary and salient uh, and, uh, and inhibitory to lots of activity. So we're, you know, we're thinking about how do we, uh, how do we surmount some of that. Um, and you know, there are lots of specific technologies that we think are compelling and exciting and for you know, policymakers are doing cool things. PSD2, open banking, you know, uh, faster you know, payments in the UK, uh, Fed now uh, you know, here in the US, uh, hopefully next year. And, and all that's good stuff. Again, it, it doesn't, it's not necessarily focal and central in the limelight, but I think it represents you know, major advancement and opportunity and you know, emerging markets in places like Nigeria and India and, and Brazil and uh, elsewhere, uh, you know, th th there have been kind of new central bank-based real-time payment systems, you know, for consumers uh, that have seen tremendous traction and adoption. And then, you know, we, we think there were cool opportunities in crypto, uh, where uh, you know, I suppose you can kind of look at crypto in two ways, and sometimes I think the former can kind of occlude the latter, where you know, on the one hand, you can look at crypto as this kind of casino, gambling, speculation, you know, all that stuff, and you know, assuredly there is you know, a significant amount of that. But, uh, you know, it also represents um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, harbors the possibility of being a much more participatory and kind of inclusive and open access transport layer and rail for sort of financial inclusion on a global basis. Uh, we launched a thing that we're quite excited about with Twitter back a couple of months ago where they're enabling creator payouts to a much broader watershed of, of people than they would otherwise be able to address. And you know, I think there are, of course, people you know, here, in, uh, here in DC, you know, uh, um, like again, um, the congressman, uh, who I think have been very uh, cogent voices uh, in trying to make sure we don't miss that ladder while addressing the complexities and challenges uh, of uh, the more speculative use cases. You know, it, it's, it's fascinating. You know, I, I, just, just to that theme, you know, I, I find that sometimes it's very easy to to miss that you know, there is a technology stack, whether or not you like it, dislike it, but to really kick the tires and to think about what that can enable. And that was a wonderful hand baton uh, to, uh, to, to you, Congressman. I mean, you've been truly you know, at the heart of many of the most important conversations in crypto world um, and including um, stable coins. And I know that uh, you and Chair Waters have been in a series of conversations on stable coins and, 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 and whether or not or what any particular regulatory regime should look like. Maybe can you, can you give us a little bit of a, a little sneak peek, a little bit of sure, detail I as to, to, as to where those flavor. conversations may be uh, heading? So I think, uh, so just starting in reverse here, we have to, we have to understand there is currently no federal uh, regulation or description of a digital asset or the means of exchange or, their, or any regulation or law around what purports to be a stable coin. Uh, so we have something in the marketplace that, that says it's a US dollar, but there is no form to it. The only regulation there is in existing law around uh, the movement of digital assets is money transmission licenses that are issued through the 50 states. Um, so that doesn't, that doesn't look like a modern regulatory regime. It doesn't it look thoughtful. It doesn't look innovative. It actually looks pretty retrograde. So let's, let's, so let's deconstruct that. You have to have a, a means of exchange and a definition of a digital asset. Uh, a means of exchange and a definition of a digital asset will be the work of the Financial Services Committee next year. In the meantime, Chairwoman Waters and I have been in long discussions and deep discussions around um, how we have a, a federal regulatory structure for stable coins. Uh, we agree on the asset that is a um, nearly defined set of assets, one-to-one -one backing, no leverage. Uh, we agree on uh, all the components of what the asset is. Then we get into more complex conversations. Well, what is uh, the means by which you hold it? Uh, the the, um, uh, the regulation around what is a wallet? Um, because we don't have regulation around either of those two things. 
Um, and then where do you, uh, who's your federal regulator? And that too is, uh, is, a, is, a, is less science and more art. Um, and then we also have to have uh, the administration involved in this, just not just uh, Chairman Waters and I negotiating the House, but we brought in the Treasury Department. And so uh, then there are a number of trade-offs in a bipartisan compromise. And so we've come up with a pretty ugly baby. Um, <laughs> it, is a, it, it is a baby nonetheless. And we're grateful that, and hopeful that this ugly baby can, can grow and prosper into something that is uh, a little more attractive. <laughs> Uh, so there, that's where we are, and I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful along the way. Look, I say this with pride, with a smile on my face. You're acting as if the proud father. It's like, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and so, um, uh, so I'm, th that's what we're trying to do. Felt a lot of my biography there. Um, yes. Un 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 yes. Until you said it got more attractive. Uh, <laughs> I think that's the reason why we're both named Patrick. So, um, but so, so that's what we've done. And we've come up with something in an election year, in a divided Washington, in a divided, broken set of politics that I think is a sign of hope that we can have complex, difficult uh, uh, policymaking in the midst of all this chaos. So I'm hopeful what this means in the coming months. I'm optimistic that we can come to terms. Um, and, and I appreciate uh, the trade-offs that my Democrat counterparts have been willing to make so that we can actually have a bipartisan uh, piece of legislation. I mean, I mean that the, the bipartisanship that I've that I've seen and displayed, you know, it's it's, you know, uh, you know, you know, I'm trying to think of some kind of analogy that could possibly beat ugly baby, but instead I'm just saying, you know, the meat gets done or. But I'm know, hopeful cooking. about this baby, though. You're hopeful about the baby. I am. Okay. Uh, but, um, I, I guess we'll, we'll then shift a little bit to the um, sort of economic. Um, uh, uh, Questions. Um, okay. Well. Uh, okay. I am. Yeah, I like your it. live question. Yeah, I know. You know, it, it's hard. You know, subtweet us. Right, and, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Can we, okay, can we, we like reply? Like, yeah. 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 Elon yeah. style. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is true. This is true. <laughs> it's like let me just tweet my response. Okay. I will. I will. Just because someone had had said this, and I was. I was. Okay. Well. Uh, one interesting question that we're already getting from our audience is, you know, what are what are in, any major uh, uh, differences that that you're seeing between the U.S. and EU uh, or Euro fintech innovation similarities? And by the way, I love it because it's addressed to Stripe Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the EU. Um, maybe two things. Um, so one, uh, the EU has, you know, well. Generally speaking, and you know, by certainly stereotype and archetype, you know, uh, Europe is um, you know somewhat more regulated, you know, somewhat less free market, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get these interesting exceptions. This right. Uh, so you know, uh, when I came to the U.S., um, trying to understand your sports, uh, it's you know, there are these kind of little tightly regulated socialist uh, <laughs> sort of uh, capped and what? <laughs> No, because like, it's you know, so true. There's, yes. there's, the pay, there's the pay caps, and, the, and you're trying oh. to make sure that no team ever, you know, um, like. Is it American the football? League. You're talking about American football or basketball? I mean, all of them. They seem. Oh to my God! Okay, no, okay, okay. I'm not. I'm not. They, they all blur together. I'm just right. the moderator. Um, no. uh, so whereas in soccer, you have, uh, you know, a, a very, you know, there's players can be paid whatever you want, and you know. Oh, 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 oh! I think in terms of the rules, I'm like, are you kidding? Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, like, there's economics brutal. around this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But like soccer in Europe or football, as it is called, it's it's much less kind of. Yep. Uh, economically restricted, yes. yep. and then you know with cellular technology, uh, kind of similarly, and, and, and airlines, you know, um, uh, there was kind of you know significant um, I don't know structures were put in place that enabled a much more competitive market uh, than uh, than existed uh, sort of at the time in the U.S. And the thing that's interesting in um, and even if you look at the EU, like on the one hand, the EU is you know a regulatory administrative edifice. But it's, an, it's a regulatory administrative ed edifice that is in many cases in service of, and certainly was originally in service of, creating broader, larger, more competitive, more open markets. So I think it's kind of a very interesting uh, kind of, you know, uh, um, you, you can kind of look at it in both ways. Um, and so with respect to FinTech in particular, um, the e-money licensing regime yep. in the EU, which is kind of something between the sort of money transmission uh, regime that um, the Congressman just mentioned, um, and kind of full-on banking regulation. You know, on the one hand, that is a like it's a regulatory construct. It's a new way to be regulated, but it's a new way to be regulated that has unleashed 
an enormous amount of consumer financial services innovation in Europe, and so you know, banks like uh, Revolut, N26, Monzo, etc. There's, there's tons of this stuff happening, and there has been for years. And you know, the EU is really a center uh, and a hub for fintech. So, so that's one. And then two, uh, kind of like some of the GSM stuff, um, you know, directives and regulations like PSD2. Uh, like some of the, the, the new rules and kind of standardization around open banking and SEPA and real-time SEPA and so forth. Um, th those are, I think, you know, creating very compelling new opportunities in the, the free market and kind of in this broader fintech landscape. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to, well, A, it's, it's not a kind of a national competition or a regional competition because, you know, these companies generally serve, I mean, Stripe itself is dual headquartered in, in the U.S. and North America. But if you're to, like, really zoom out and, and, and just kind of ask which region has, um, has been a more kind of successful hub for, for, you know, innovation, I think for technology overall, you would have to say the U.S. to date. I mean, just look down the list of companies. But for fintech in particular, uh, I think you know Europe is every bit as strong, and at least arguably has kind of pulled ahead. Um, and uh, and I largely attribute it and credit it to these these kind of underlying structural differences. So how do we improve that in the United States? <laughs> as a policymaker, I'm desperate to ask this question. Uh, please, Sorry, Chris, please. to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. You got me hooked, so I want to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. Um, well, I think. I think I, I think the clarity that you know you're like the, the, the point you're making with respect to crypto, where um, it, it, it is there's such a you know a vast penumbra of uncertainty around where this goes, uh, and I think for for you know rational actors then trying to make you know investment or, or kind of allocative or any kind of decision in the face of that, you know it it, 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 it sort of very understandably gives them meaningful hesitation. And so I think where there is uncertainty bring clarity makes a, makes a great deal of sense. Uh, and then, you know, it, it's an interesting tension where on the one hand, I think the, look, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I just got here. So uh, uh, I don't mean to, you know, um, Regulatory to, to clarity, though, I hear, I hear that. I although, hear that. although it is interesting, and I didn't want to put um, uh, Mary McGinnis on, on the spot here, but, you know, the crypto. Actually, we should can we bring her back. Yeah, we can bring her back. I mean, she was actually really, exactly. really good at this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so. uh, but, but, you know, it, it is fascinating, you know, like, like, the European Union is not always credited as as the speediest uh, institution for for rulemaking, you know, and 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 for years the United States uh, politicians and 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 leaders in government would go to the EU and go to Brussels and they'd make, you know, the question of I'm here, I have a problem, I don't know whom to call, right? And and I do find it fascinating that when you come to the United States now, particularly in some issue areas, so not, but certainly when you get to crypto, you, the Europeans are asking that same question, right? And, and, and then sometimes the answer from the United States is, well, we're not sure, but we'll get back to you in just a second. And I think that that, that, that does create a very interesting process. But we're in a new world in the United States. We, we had, uh, since World War II, this belief that we have a moat. We have no moat. Our capital markets, there's competition for our capital markets um, and uh, in corporate issuances globally. Um, there's a choice set of where you deploy innovation as you're, distri as you're showing around the globe, uh, the things that you can do in other regimes that you can't do here in the United States are quite significant for, for Stripe. Um, and so we have to be, American policymakers, on a bipartisan basis, have to understand that we're in a competitive world and we've got to be better versions of ourselves. Uh, that means we have to have rule of law, speech rights, property rights built in to what we're doing and be able to ensure that people seek the United States and have that de facto what gets exported, which are our values. And I mean, not the values we debate, the values that we don't debate, which is, you, you know, you have a right to your own property without government seizure, right? You have a, a right to free speech. Those things that should be embodied in everything that we're about as a society so that we can argue about everything <laughs> else, right? And the beauty of our system is that with competition, the best solutions come about. The government doesn't bless it. The government doesn't choose it. It's the people that get to choose it in this competitive atmosphere. That if we're really good as government policymakers, we get the best outcome for as many people as possible, which should be a shared goal. Regardless of your ideological view, that should be our shared goal.
This is totally not the conversation I thought we were gonna have, <laughs> but an excellent one, an excellent one, an excellent one. And our time is up, but gentlemen, I, I, I so appreciate this. I've learned so much already, just through the course of the day. Excellent conversation, and, and, and thanks for uh, joining DC Fintech. Good to see you. All right. Thanks for having us. Hey. <laughs> finale before we get to our drinks and networking and the like, um, in which we also have some great leaders uh, from Congress, Rokana, we're having also uh, 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 Sharon Bowen, who is the chair of the board of directors for New York Stock Exchange, and Gene Ludwig, the former acting or sorry, the former comptroller of the currency, and is now uh, the managing partner of Canopy. Uh, 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 and we will be joining you shortly, apparently. Oh, no, 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 they're here. Okay, come on on. Come on on the stage. On stage for all three of you. Wonderful. Thank you. Long day. Please. Thank you. Okay, we are at our, our, our wonderful finale. Um, you know, we've had over the course of the last couple of days, basically all the leaders from um, government, uh, TV land uh, uh, from all the different networks and C-SPAN and the like, uh, broadcasting uh, uh, our series of conversations on innovation and democratizing information for the American public. And when I think about this, I've had versions of this conversation with each of you three. And that's why I had to, starting off with Ro Khanna, uh, Congressman Congre uh, Khanna, to say, please, yeah. please, please, please come. Please, yeah. please, please, please come. <laughs> you got to come. I know you're only in California. And, and thank you so much for, for, for making it down. Um, you know, uh, I want to just have a conversation that I think is really important, again, for all the, the journalists to sort of think through when you have this conversation on you know, trade-offs to innovation and technology. And, and something that um, you and I have talked about is that you know we've 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 had and we've seen plenty of conversations on innovation, but um, you know but innovation isn't necessarily opportunity. Um, you know, how do you go about connecting the dots on those two, both philosophically and and also as a matter of policy? Well, Chris, first of all, thank you for inviting me. An honor to be uh, on this panel. Look, I have a district that. Uh, has produced extraordinary innovation. Apple, Google, Intel, Yahoo, Cisco, LinkedIn, Tesla, all in my district. $10 trillion of market value, probably the most wealth that's been produced anywhere in one region in, in human history. Uh, but the challenge is, uh, is everyone uh, benefiting to be productive in a society that is innovating? And a lot of the opportunities of wealth generation have been concentrated uh, based on place have been exclusive of people in rural communities, in the heartland, in the south, of black and Latino communities. So the access to uh, wealth generation of a modern economy uh, have been limited. And then the second thing is we offshored, in my view, uh, incorrectly, too much of our production and did not factor in the innovation of production uh, that made America uh, an economic power. And that led to the decline of a lot of uh, uh, blue-collar jobs in this country. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it is interesting because um, even over in earlier iterations during the pandemic when we had to have this conference uh, virtually, you know, there's been an observation even internationally that there's been an assumption that there would be, let's call, trickle-down opportunity or innovation, that if you can just generate it, that naturally would flow to the rest of the country. And what you've observed, both in your, in your writing and what others overseas have observed is that a lot of the benefits of that innovation um, that are, are being used and, and made or produced um, either only in Silicon Valley or in other parts of the country and, 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 and sort of making sure that those, that, that, that again, innovation translates to, to opportunity um, is a process. Just to follow up really quickly, do you, do you find that that is um, a, a policy kind of process to, to, to enable that opportunity or is this, a market-driven kind of process um, uh, in which you have to reorient sort of different uh, nooks and crannies of, 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 our, of our markets. I look forward to hearing from the others as well. But look, Thomas Piketty has uh, researched whatever you think of his ideology that shows that the middle class and working class in America since 1980 have lost 25% of wealth. That's factual. This is why most people in America feel that the American dream has been downsized. Those were policy choices we made. We chose unfettered uh, uh, market uh, economies with globalization 
We said, let things go to the cheapest labor. People can go move. People will find the opportunity. We'll just train them. And it didn't work. It didn't work for many factory towns in America. It didn't work for both the white and black working class. Uh, Bill Spriggs has a paper that the biggest uh, victims of deindustrialization were actually the African American community that have lost millions of jobs because of that in places like Dayton and Chicago and Milwaukee. And of course, uh, that it's happened in uh, white working classes. And they didn't go and have new economic opportunities. So I believe that it was a failure of uh, an, an exaggeration of the benefits of globalization. I'm not saying that there weren't positives to globalization. Millions of people came out of poverty. But it has to be, but there was not a focus on place. And we need to reconsider uh, some of those policies. Sharon Bowen, you are a trailblazer in so many different ways. And, and now you're, you're sitting up as, as, as chair of, of the New York Stock Exchange. You know, which is in and of itself. The stock exchange is a very fascinating entity, a very critical component of the financial system. But you know, for, for you, you know, where do stock exchanges sit in this larger question of, of, of innovation? And, and is there even an element uh, uh, is, as to how they touch on questions of opportunity? Well, first, Chris, thank you so much. You've done a great job for this conference. And can't believe it's, we're the last panel. So congratulations <laughs> Thanks. Uh, on, on the success that, you, that you've done. I'm delighted to be here with Gene and Bro as well. So believe it or not, Stock Exchange really sits right at the intersection of innovation and opportunity. Mm. When you think about we raise capital, capital raising is important for job creation and, and for growth in our economy. And more importantly, the Stock Exchange brings transparency technology and data um, for us to have fair and orderly efficient markets. At the New York Stock Exchange, I said I would use my platform especially to help our 2,400 listed companies um, who are at various stages along their ESG journeys, uh, which is really important, uh, not just to shareholders, but to other major stakeholders. So when you talk about innovation and opportunity, I think about one of the services we provide to our companies especially, are like tools that are focused on ESG, forming things like our board advisory council to increase diversity on boards, um, things like our sustainability council, again, to share best practices. So I think our platform is a great one for companies to share best practices. And we know, again, capital is the, is the engine that, that grows the economy. Well, you know, from, from, from the West Coast to the East Coast, you know, and, and now uh, uh, to, to, to Eugene, you know, uh, your background is also extraordinarily interesting um, as a former uh, uh, comptroller and now an investor uh, and someone who's been very um, passionate um, about uh, the wealth divide and, and the, the digital divide, and it's something that you've seen up, up close. Uh, uh, now, as, as you've sort of seen the landscape, as you continue to even advise uh, I, folks informally that I, I know, uh, you, you know, how do you look at you know, what, which technologies seem to be very interesting to you, you know, when it comes to attacking particularly that pain point of um, uh, financial innovation or financial literacy, access to capital? Are there things that kind of interest you more than others and, and after all, we are, you know, here in the belly of Fannie Mae, you know, if, if there's anything that interests you in, in terms of housing. Yeah. Well, let me um, first say, uh, as my fellow panelists have said, this is really a remarkable achievement on your part, Chris. Uh, uh, and uh, it's an honor to be on the panel with, with Ro and, and Sharon, who are icons in terms of what they're doing in life. So, and, and particularly for this panel. Um, I'll give you an example of what excites us. <clears throat> so at Canopy, which is the venture capital fund that we have, um, we, we invested in an outfit called Nova Credit. Now, what does Nova Credit do? They have been able to hook together uh, data from the world such that when an immigrant comes here by way of asylum or whatever, he or she has information that can be used in a credit decision. Because otherwise, you, somebody comes here and, and they don't have a credit history that a lender can uh, you know, access, and they either get way high or they can't get credit at all. This allows them, within a reasonable period of time, to get credit at fair prices so that they can live a decent life here to start out with. Uh, 
it is it is innovative technology. Uh, interesting enough, the fellow who founded it uh, uh, started out with this idea when he was in school, and he's done a great job. That's the kind of thing that uh, really uh, gets us up in the morning. Uh, and, the, and the reason th these investments and the kind of thing we look for uh, are important is that if you can dri drive down uh, the cost of small dollar transactions and or differentiate through the use of data between people that are credit worthy and who, who are not. And by the way, that means expanding the credit box. There are loads of people who by uh, today's standards are viewed as not credit worthy. In fact, that's all wrong. And um, so if you can do that through technology in our huge global society, that really moves the needle. And, and that, that's what gets us up in the morning. Yeah, you know, one, one conversation that we had earlier this morning was with Dir Director Sandra Thompson, who is the FHFA director. And just to your point, you know, here we, we've worked very hard to include rental data as one of the sort of drivers, um, you know, the, some of the data to harvest for determining credit decisions because, you know, there's a chicken and egg problem. Like, you have to own a house in order to get credit, you know, and people generally don't want to lose their home or their dwelling, at least. And we, we should be able to harvest or capture that data for the purposes of, of opening uh, the credit box. And that's been something that we've, we've really been uh, thinking about. And I think data is, is, is really becoming um, very critical. Um, I, I'm going to move right back through the group, but I did want to uh, touch base with you on, on the macro economy, given your experience uh, as, as, as a regulator, and now looking at innovation. Uh, earlier yesterday, we were talking about sort of crypto winter, but we're also talking about really a, a winter for all of our markets, including our, 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 our stock markets. You know, when you think about in, uh, that innovation to opportunity pipeline, right, what does a slowing economy mean, right, for the development and for, you know, enabling that, that particular pipeline? Well, here's what really uh, worries me a lot. <clears throat> and I, I want to associate myself with uh, Roe's work and Roe's concerns, as well as Sharon's. Um, uh, with a slowing economy, uh, and I think we are headed for a recession, uh, one finds that in low and moderate income communities, uh, 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 poor people get fired first and rehired last. And, and the benefits of innovation, they don't get to, to you know, really enjoy because we're just at the beginning stages of innovation in financial technology. But with this profound situation where they get fired first and rehired last, what happens is that um, uh, their house prices drop like a stone because you have in the regulatory mechanism, you have something called mark-to-market accounting. Basically, it values a property at a point in time. Now, if you had to sell any of our properties, or your property, or anybody else's property at a point in time in the worst part of the recession, they would go down. But if you're somebody who's lost their job, it goes down even further. And, and that volatility means that the financial institution, whether it's a CDFI or a minority bank, you, you has to take a loss. And then they get beat up. And so what we destroy is a wealth generation mechanism that is so important in terms of housing. And also the, the, the utilization of these institutions that so desperately need modern technologies because they're on their back foot. And, um, and what we've got to do as a society is put a floor under our communities uh, 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 in low and moderate income areas to, to b b get them through uh, events which are, are typically not in any way caused by them. They, they're bycatch. Um, that was true in 2007, and we, we did a better job in 2020, I've got to say, in terms of helping. But we've, we've got to do that, and uh, it's, it's profoundly important. You know, I, I love that you also you know, brought up you know, the minority banks and what the slowdown means in terms of the creation and, and access to, to, to capital and investments. And again, you're, we'll see spillovers there. And just as a as a quick remark, as, as I talked to the a former commissioner over at the CFTC and something that we've talked about, may have mentioned it to you, I know I've mentioned it to, to Roe, is that when that slowdown happens, you know, what are the tools in the toolbox for the regulatory agencies? And most regulatory agencies, OCC is a little bit different because of the Community Reinvestment Act, most regulatory agencies don't have a financial inclusion mandate. 
So just in terms of that responsiveness, you know, what are the tools that they have and the flexibility that they have to respond if you're not either in FHFA or, or OCC? And you know, for me, I'm, I'm always a little, a little nervous, and, and, and we'll see. Well, this is a really big topic and a really big set of questions because at our uh, LICEP, our Institute for Shared Economic Prosperity, we've been studying the economy generally, and we've been quite worried about these downturn, situ downturn situations. And the regulators have got to realize when they're dealing with vulnerable communities and smaller institutions that the regulatory mechanism has to accommodate to those institutions as opposed to applying to them rigid standards that may work with the huge institutions but, but don't no. work with these smaller institutions. Again, they're bycatch. They didn't cause the problem. And I can go on and on and I won't. Yeah. We want to I, I, you know, I, I, just, I don't usually root for these things, but I do care passionately about these things and, and uh, getting right answers. And I know, uh, Sharon, you've, you and I, and, and, and you've been very, very vocal before, you know, about you know what are the, what's the toolbox right you know to make sure that our rules are really responsive to communities. You know, on the one hand, it's a question of well, are we is there even a mandate within our agencies to think about these communities? Another question is, is there the are there is there personnel in place uh, that is familiar with those uh, communities? Either um, in the private sector or in the regulatory sector, you're now sitting really at the intersection of finance, right? You know, in your role over as, as, as the chair of the NYC. I mean, how are you, now as you've transitioned into, you know, you know the Geppetto of the global markets, <laughs> you know, like, like you know, how, do you, how, how do you think about those kinds of issues? So I take those really seriously, as you know, Chris. Um, first, a couple of things. Um, I won't even talk about the direction of the market because I'm not an economist, so state that up front. But I do know, you know what happens um, during financial crisis, you know, having been as civic as vice chair and acting chair and, and witnessing people lose their jobs, lose their savings accounts, um, that, those devastating effects. And frankly, like everybody else in this room, watching the impact of COVID and the pandemic disproportionately affecting the black and brown and underrepresented um, communities. And so one of the things I'm most excited about, because you know, I'm always an optimistic person. Um, I was just um, at Treasury last week um, at the Freedman's Forum, which you know was the first. Yes, of course. Yes, in BFI. And uh, one of the announcements was about the Economic Opportunity Coalition, which was a partnership you know, with private industries and foundations to bring money into the community financial services institutions that we're talking about. They committed a billion dollars to not just, you know, not just to throw money at it, but also to make sure that deposits are put into these institutions. And more importantly, to, to address some of the barriers that are there, technology being one of them, you know, being up to date and current and sharing platforms with data collection and information. You know, the other, frankly, is a talent shortage. Um, and companies are now committing that we're going to do succumbents. We have our talent, you know, Silicon Valley and others, um, to provide those resources. But we, gotta, we have to jet fuel this. We've got to think big. Oh it's not going to happen incrementally, and you know it. I mean, it's just not, nor will it happen organically. And so, you know, I'm a big believer in uh, public private partnerships um, to work together on this. And I think we all, pretty much align in that respect. Um, but we, we definitely, we need to supercharge it. So uh, Professor Khanna, and I'm intentionally calling him Professor because his book was extremely well written and one day I'll not sucker him into teaching a class with me one day. But you know, when you think about the-, the You're the one who has tenure, I never- Don't worry, we can work this out, we can work this out. Um, you know, when you, when you think about, again, this, this question of, of, of macroeconomic development, where, where you have a slowing economy, you have much higher uh, interest rates than before. You know, your, your, your book was written sort of in the opposite context, right? Where, where Silicon Valley is doing really well, to the technology sector is, is going kind of gangbusters. <coughs> and you're thinking big, you're thinking ambitiously about what can be done in a particular economic um, context. Or, you know, you know what, that's the question. 
when you were writing the book and thinking about democratizing opportunity, you know, it, to what degree does an economic slowdown impact the ability to continue that process or, or to accelerate it? Not necessarily from a GDP standpoint, but from literally that pipeline from innovation to opportunity. Um, what, does, what, what, what do macroeconomics mean? I think it makes it uh, more urgent. Um, if I could just say very briefly, when you were talking about the uh, startup on uh, immigrant uh, credit, it brought back a flashback. When My parents were immigrants from India, and I uh, grew up here, born here in Philadelphia. But when we had uh, a cousin or something come, I used to remember my parents used to take them to Sears or someplace to shop to get the credit card, because they had no credit to build up credit uh, by buying the, getting those cards from uh, uh, from stores, so it'll be a, a big innovation uh, to move forward. You know, I don't think we have to reinvent uh, the wheel. The, 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 the model of what builds a strong economy uh, was Hamilton and FDR, where they basically, when FDR built our modern in industry, and it was through federal financing, it was through government purchasing, it was through working with the private sector, uh, and we had tremendous industry. Now, it was exclusive of uh, largely the Black South, because the New Deal was not an inclusive policy. But what we should, I call it a new economic patriotism. We, we realized in the pandemic, we don't make masks here. We don't make enough baby formula here. We don't make batteries here. We don't make semiconductors here. Why don't we supercharge the production of the modern economy and do it across geographies and have the federal government uh, partner with the private sector and HBCUs and land grant institu institutions? That policy is good in a recession, and it's good, frankly, even in you know, on inflation to produce more uh, goods in the United States. So uh, nothing I'm saying is original. It's sort of the, the, the uh, framework that built the American economy, except I think now it should be more inclusive to have everyone on the playing field uh, where that wasn't the case in the past. I would just add in that respect, uh, you do need to have a different landscape, though. You do need to bring women and minorities to the table. Well, that's... Uh, those guys did a pretty good job, you know, creating yeah. the financial system, but, but to really be inclusive, uh, and we've spoken about yeah. this, if, if you don't have people at the table making policies, um, thinking about what affects their communities, yes. we may wind up with some bad choices. That's just right. because that, we didn't have the right people. Both were. That was women were in the yeah. factories in the World War II. Yeah. Women built the industry of, of yeah. the country. I'm but, not saying you were trying to exclude yeah. women. Yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just, yeah. I'm yeah, what you're saying <laughs> is just very profound. When you, yeah. when you take a tool, we may have to raise interest rates the way we're doing. Uh, but on the other hand, this is chemotherapy. And it's a chemotherapy that falls hardest on right. middle and low income yeah. Americans. It's easy to say, well, you raise interest rates. People can pay higher interest rates, but if you're at the bottom of the thing, this is a profound change in how you budget for yourself. And it, and it falls disproportionately on black Americans, on Hispanic Americans, uh, and in low and moderate income communities, uh, and, and on technology. Because what happens is you see it in, this, in the markets, right? Uh, the technology stocks have dropped the most, so that innovative oomph is, is hit. Hard, and it's not good for the country. Now, we have, may have to do it, but hopefully over time we will develop more creative, you might say, targeted medicines yeah. that yeah. can, can uh, deal with the problem without killing it. Well, one of the reasons why I, I you know, I, I, I uh, every year uh, kind of do this, this event and this, um, um, and this forum is, you know, because, and, and thankfully, you know, we have a lot of press now who, who sort of cover it, is to just sort of introduce new kinds of conversations into the dialogue, because I, I, I think that, um, you know, th there's a way to go in, in media as, as, as well as everywhere else, and, and there are conversations, important conversations, that aren't always being captured. One of, the, one of those conversations that I just find fascinating is, is the conversation on, on even investing and retail investing, you know, the standard sort of line and you know, we had uh, Mary McGinnis here, and she had noted that because of the reliance in Europe on banks, uh, she, one of her goals was to increase the size of the capital market. So she wanted to encourage investing and retail investing in the European Union because she's looking at the other side of the pond, and she's looked at us and said, "Well, look, you know, you guys have." the New York Stock Exchange, you have NASDAQ, you have these, these, these exchanges, and so we want to be more competitive. 
Now, one of the responses intellectually, I wasn't going to, you know, just drag up all our issues for the commissioner, but you know, one of the, one, one of the interesting things that I, I, I thought about was the, the the challenge in terms of how sometimes the conversation on retail investing kind of takes place because t what technology is doing for better and for worse is increasing the participation of of of, of younger people in in the market, and I think it's requiring a kind of a rethinking of sort of fundamental assumptions about about our our, our markets, but. Ultimately, um, if you think that owning a home is the first rung on a ladder to building um, wealth, usually for most Americans, investing, whether or not it be on a, in, in your retirement account or something, is, is how you, 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 you climb up that, 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 that particular ladder. Um, but you know, thinking about how to enable that and how to do it safely in a world where there's a lot of volatility, um, you know, that's kind of hard. You know, um, how, how, Eugene, I'll just start with you and I'll just, just, just go through, you know, how do you think about that challenge? Because if you don't have investment, if you don't have participation, you're going to have, uh, you know, continuing stress. Well, uh, uh, you're so profoundly right, Chris. Having a, owning your own home is, is a cornerstone of people's well-being and, uh, and actual savings over time. Having said that, this is an illiquid investment. And you're not going to want to move out of your home for, until you're quite aged, so you can't get the money out, your, your family may. So you've got to have something else. So investing, saving, very important. For low and moderate income people today, you still, in terms of doing this safely, want to go to a, an insured institution like a bank, because there are a lot of choices you can make. But for people with very little savings, they're not going to get the advice that uh, Bill Gates gets. Uh, a modern technology with a lot of the modern tools that can enable uh, individuals, but also financial institutions like banks, to be able to provide more successful outcomes for them, give them a little bit of spread, and there are, there are a number of them out there, are really changing the marketplace so that one can give better investment outcomes for smaller dollar amounts. That's the profound uh, you know, value of this innovation we're living through. It's, a, it's using technology to be able to deal with smaller units in a cost-effective way, which allows you know, people with less savings, less assets, to be treated better, whether it's in lending or investing, than they otherwise would be treated. Sure. Well. You need to have the money to put into an account in the world. So <laughs> no, getting a job, a good paying job is, is the first step. Um, you know, but we do know though, Chris, that the home ownership rates for African Americans has gone down. Yeah. yeah not up. Uh, we know that the cost of borrowing for people like African Americans is higher than it is for um, white Americans, um, even with the same credit profile. So we have a lot of systemic barriers that have been there to begin with that goes beyond just the data won't solve for some of this. Mm -hmm. um, it will sh shed a light on it, um, you know, which is really great, um, you know, as well. But I, I, again, I just think we have to kind of, I just shine a light on things, but we have to be really intentional and be very specific um, to really move the needle, needle in this. Because I just don't see the policy making, doing it by itself. The private sector can't do it by itself. I think we all have to be kind of in the same boat together, wanting this to happen. Well, we do. We do have one interesting question coming in for Representative Khanna. Uh, you serve one of the most tech-forward U.S. districts. It is also has one of the most expensive housing markets. Is it possible for local startup partnerships to help get more people into homes, or any other kind of partnerships to solve sort of more challenging um, uh, 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 pain points um, given the economy? Sure, but I think the, I, I mean, startups getting more homes uh, is good, but I think we need more fundamental policy uh, reform. I mean, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae's uh, building, so one of the things I'll say, and we're working on a bill, is I, I think Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae need to be banned from providing low interest loans to private equity that is going up and buying homes worth under $500,000 and holding them and letting them sit vacant. I mean, we weren't born in this country to be serfs to Wall Street. And that's really what's happening. Now, it was allowed after 2008 because property value was depressed. But now you're basically enriching these private equities and you're 
uh, creating artificial demand. And at the same time, you have constrained supply because of NIMBYism. Mm. And so we need to make sure that we're building housing so that you know, the aesthetics in my district shouldn't matter as much as having uh, teachers or, or the working class be able to live there. Uh, I can say that being in Congress, it'd be very hard for me to say that running for city council in some of the places yeah. that I represent. So, uh, you know, I, I think that the failure of housing in my district is uh, a failure of policy. Yeah. I, I agree, by the way, about being intentional, and I, and I, I think you're absolutely right on the policy. Uh, one thing, I'll scoop myself, tomorrow I'm going to announce at an activist group event in Atlanta that we're uh, going to give a, uh, a reasonable amount of money to, uh, for an entity to make loans in low and moderate income areas at 3%. 3%, and, and I don't expect any of the money back. If this is an experiment. Okay, can you use the mechanism that we've set up to make safe loans at 3%? Because if you can show that, in fact, that can be done on a, a cost-effective basis, then what can happen is you can basically expand this program nationally. Because I think if you look at the, this is a version uh, of, for the United States, what Muhammad Yunus uh, did so brilliantly yep. in Bangladesh and the rest of the world. But we've got to have that innovation. We've got to dedicate technology to basically give us the tools to help in this area. Because you're absolutely right, Sharon, what you said. You know, black Americans and low and moderate income Americans generally are profoundly disadvantaged by the current system. And as you said, Roe, things have been going down for uh, 20, 30 years. We, at LICEP, we've got all the data to prove that and all the intricacies, because we've got headline statistics that make no sense in terms of the, me measuring the real economy. So this is an important moment in, in history. So Gene, we just need to multiply that hundreds of times. Yeah. Um, but that's the kind of partnership that I'm talking about. And we can definitely, with data and technology, reduce the friction and the cost of borrowing and um, that the other barriers that have been there. Okay, so my last question, just based off of this, like, I mean, uh, because you've just you know, you're scooped yourself, and it's very, very interesting. <laughs> but, but like, I mean, how optimistic? You know, these times they're, they're challenging. People are hurting. There are lots of changes. But you know, when you think about again the technology and the innovation and the question of opportunity, I mean, you know, how how optimistic or or uh, cranky are you uh, when, when, when thinking about you know? Getting to where we, we we need to be, and I'll and I'll start with Eugene, and then. Well, you you couldn't be in the venture capital business or in business generally odd for a former regulator to not be a glasses half full person, right? You've got to right. You wouldn't be a lawyer too. You've got a lawyer too. But you've got to do that. But no, I think we are at a flexion point worldwide as we begin to understand a dramatically different technological. And, and global environment than the one we had 50 years ago, even 50 years ago, let alone 100 years ago. And if we continue to have a, a controlled market economy, and you might say a public-private environment that is you know, really trying to reach out to do good for humanity, I think we get through this period in, a be in better shape than we found it. But we're at a flexion point of difficult people. People are confused. There are people being taken advantage of. And we've got to basically join hands to push forward. And that's what I love about venture capital in this area, because the, the hope for the future is in part in the innovation we're developing. And then it's got to be in part in, in shared outcomes. That's why I created the Shared Economic Prosperity, where we have great outcomes like we're seeing in Silicon Valley, but these benefits are shared more broadly for the entire population. I'm always optimistic, Chris. You, are you know always, that. You about are me. always I'm optimistic. I'm always optimistic, um, and I do see the silver lining. Um, but for many reasons, I mean, we look back over the last couple of years, there's some things about that, Jeannie, you're not going to be putting back in the bottle in terms of disparity. And, and also, I think the earnest um, efforts of corporations who wanted to do, right do good and when to be good corporate citizens. And I think we just have to harness that, again, in a specific kind of way, multiplying the kinds of things that, that Gene's doing. Um, I think it's really important. So I'm, I'm an optimist, for sure. I'm hopeful as well. Um, partly it comes from my story. I mean, I was the son of immigrants born in Philadelphia. And at the age of 40, the country elected me to represent one of the most innovative places in the world. And we're all a product of our, our story. But also, the, what gives me hope is uh, 
uh, a lot of the young folks, I mean, both the folks who are marching for climate are around the nation, the people who are organizing at places like Starbucks and Amazon, uh, the workers' rights movement has never been stronger in my lifetime. And then I was actually in New York meeting with a number of folks in their 30s and 40s, and I, they said, well, you don't have to be sheepish about talking about the union movement here or your work on climate. There are a lot of folks in their 30s and 40s in Wall Street uh, who believe in a lot of these issues, and they're going to be in charge soon. And so I think that uh, there is a moment uh, for this country uh, to correct the excesses of uh, globalization and the exclusions of our past. And uh, what we're trying to do has never been done in the history of the world. There's never been a truly multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that our generation will help move it there. And uh, certainly our challenges are far less than uh, people like Jim Clyburn or my late colleague John Lewis, who had much uh, more daunting challenges than we have. Well, well, this thank you so much to all three of you. I mean, this has been a uh, special afternoon for me because I have so I've had the opportunity to talk to so many of my role models and people who I admire and, and, and aspire uh, to emulate uh, my own behavior. Um, and, and I want to thank you all for, for for joining us. And this also wraps up the marathon known as DC FinTech Week. I will subsequently go and pass out. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone, Video Land, Internets, as well as people here who have supported us. I want to have a special thanks uh, to Camilla, who I, I cannot emphasize enough. Weekends, literally 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, do we have enough lunch boxes? And, you know, I will get a response within three minutes. It is hard to emphasize how much work um, Zainab Ahmed and also Mariana Mariano. Ah, uh, there you are in the corners. You guys are troopers. I mean, the kinds of people, Kristen, others, uh, the Fannie Mae team, um, uh, the Georgetown team, Jack DeJoya. The number of people required to do this and to our sponsors um, throughout the day, um, throughout the, the, the last two days, uh, the number of people who put this on is enormous, and the amount of work has been enormous. And, and, and we really appreciate you, the crew, uh, and everyone who's, who's helped to make this possible. So we shall see you. Oh, one last time. Tomorrow, the city of the District of Columbia is putting DC into DC FinTech Week. And if you look it up online, uh, Karima Woods, the commissioner, has an entire day of programming. Uh, I'll wake up hopefully in time to be on a panel to help moderate on uh, social impact FinTech as well. And later, uh, CBDCs, uh, some, we'll have a, a special project over at Georgetown. But for the first two days uh, are officially over. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys all again. Thank you. Thank you.